<laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like uh, to call this meeting of the Academic and Student Affairs Committee to order. And prior to the roll call, um, I have a few announcements for today. Uh, first of all, please use the uh, microphones uh, when speaking so that we may be able to record today's meeting and ensure that those that are listening through the list are very also here clearly. I also encourage everyone to please silence uh, your uh, cell phones uh, so that we don't have any distractions uh, during the meeting. The meeting is open to the public to attend in person or via the broadcast. A recording of the meeting will be accessible from the board's web page until the next meeting. If there is anyone present in person who wishes to give public comments, please be sure to sign in the signing sheet at the recorder's desk located by Jordan. And I don't... I don't see anyone, so we can proceed with the uh, roll call. So please respond when I call your name. And I call myself, so I'm present. Erin Lair, I don't think she's here. Tamra Mabat, present. Cedric Rio, present. Maurizio Valerio, present. Deidre Schreiber, not here. Brenda Smith. Present. Good morning, Brenda. Good, Thank good you morning. for joining us. <laughs> and George Mendoza. Absent. Okay. I'm going to move on to the announcement. The only formal announcement is that we have not, not received any request for remote or in-person comment by the deadline. Is that correct? Does anybody else have any other announcement at this time before we proceed with our meeting? Okay, hearing none, this concludes the announcement portion of our agenda. So I'm going to move um, on to uh, the first action item. Uh, this is uh, a um, uh, Northwest College and University Policy Regulation and Financial Review Report. This topic will be presented by Interim Provost Peter Geisinger and Karen Clay. And I see that you're already all ready to start. So please go ahead and proceed with your presentation. Thank you very much, Chair Cavanado, and good morning, everyone. I'm here, Peter Geisinger, Interim Provost. I'm here with Karen Clay, who has been working on the report, you know, for the year six report for accreditation with us. Uh, I have talked about accreditation before here, and uh, I mentioned earlier that this year, for the first time, the, the accreditation report is split into two parts based on the two standards that they have. And today is the, the first of those two reports, the year six report based on policies, procedures, and institutional resources. So, and uh, with that, I'd like to hand it over to Karen to talk about uh, her work and how she has been gathering and preparing the report. Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to start just by giving you an overview of the accreditation cycle and uh, the kind of the big picture of the accreditation cycle. But I do understand that um, Peter Geisinger, I think, has briefed you um, at a previous meeting about the accreditation cycle and how it all works. So really, all I'm going to do is reiterate uh, the main points, the basics. And the, the, the three, I think, important things are, um, first of all, that this report is submitted in year six of a seven-year cycle. So what that means is that, well, they call it the year six report, but we do have a year seven report coming up uh, next year too. Um, this year six report focuses on policies and regulations and administrative processes. Um, so that's uh, basically across the whole institution. Um, this report does not involve site visit. Uh, what will happen is that the report will be submitted and it will be read over and evaluated by a group of our peers from other institutions. And they will be the ones along with the accrediting agency who evaluate our compliance based on the report. 
Um, and then when they submit their findings, we will get a chance to correct anything before we submit the year seven report if they, if they find anything that they have any concerns about. Um, so what I want to do is provide a, a short overview of how the report was created. It's a very long, very broad report with a lot of details, and I don't think members of the board can really have to be expected to, to, to read that whole thing and pick out uh, places where we made a mistake or something like that. So what instead, um, after talking with Chris, I think what we want to do is just make sure you understand the process that we went through to create the report, and that you're that um, you're comfortable with how it was done, and um, they're uncomfortable with the outcome. So um, it is, of course, it's a it's a pretty large institu undertaking because it's an institution institution wide report, and um, one thing that made it uh, even a bigger undertaking in this case is that the accreditation standards were overhauled in 2020. So uh, we're dealing with a quite a new set of accreditation standards here. So we can't just um, take our old accreditation report and update it for these times. The standards really did um, get changed quite substantively. In fact, they, they, they never had a year six report before under the old standards. So that, that made things a little more complex, but Starting in uh, May 2023, I was hired by the uh, provost and ALO at the time to uh, on a contract to work with the ALO to create the report. So I started by putting together uh, the report submission spreadsheet that you guys can see linked from the agenda. And it basically lists each of the NWCCU standards, and each standard has um, several subsections and substandards that go along with it. And then for each standard, there's a narrative response that is required. And then there's also for each standard, a, a list of evidence that's required. So we have to provide evidence in the form of uh, documentation, perhaps links to websites or policies or um, you know, agendas from meetings, documentation that we are conforming to the standards, as well as just telling them that we're conforming to the standards. So um, once I had that all in place, um, I looked at, for, for each of these subsections, I looked at um, the accreditation reports produced by other institutions so that we could see what they're doing. And then I identified um, for each standard or substandard, the EOU departments or individuals that would be responsible for ensuring that we're in compliance. And um, this is uh, uh, e in some ways easier to do with a policies, regulations, and financial report because, of course, it's, it's, it's very administrative in nature. So it was a lot of it was identifying the departments responsible. And um, then I worked with each of these people to create a narrative response to the standard. So um, to give you just, uh, and, and I mean, really all that in, in, ensued after that was a lot of uh, managing of lots of different responses and back and forth and checking each response to make sure that it um, complied with the standard and putting the responses together to form a report. So um, I, I also want to give you a, kind of an overview of the type of information that's found in this report so um, so that you can see the scope of the report in general. Um, there's a lot of standards that require or request evidence that students are given information that allows them to make solid choices. So for example, we have to show that we provide students with appropriate information on financial aid and what's available to them and how to pay back, you know, and, 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 and the financial resources out there. We have to make sure that uh, we give our students information on degree prerequisites and admissions requirements and information on how to, you know, how to complete their degrees and what's, what's, what lies ahead for them in terms of their, the, de the degree requirements and the courses required. We have to give them, make sure we give them information on safer professional programs, on whether or not our professional certifications um, are recognized 
you know, whether, whether they will end up with a professional certification once they graduate. So uh, naturally, this, a lot of this is aimed at, um, at, because it's accreditation, is aimed at ensuring that the students who go to the institution will receive the information they need in order to, and the resources they need in terms of student support in order to get a high quality education. And there's quite a bit of, uh, uh, quite a few sections on student support resources as well. Another area where they ask for a lot of, um, where a lot of evidence for compliance is that we have to show that the university faculty have established avenues that give them input into the important administrative processes and decisions that we make. So for example, we have to make sure that our faculty and we have to show that our faculty have input into things like library collections decisions and into things like um, uh, decisions about when and whether to grant credit for prior learning and uh, decision. And we also have to show that we um, give our faculty suitable professional development and support so that they can um, ensure high quality teaching. And in particular, an area of recent um, focus for the NWCCU is, is making sure that we can show that our online teaching shows the same high quality as our on-campus teaching. So that's, that's the type of thing that's covered in the report. And then um, we also have to show that EOU has established and follows um, processes, established processes for important institutional decisions. For example, things like budgeting, things like our human resources decisions, our capital allocation for facilities upgrades. We have to have an emergency plan and security plans. And we have to show that we do important things like keeping student data private. So this is, um, these sections are all in place. And then in addition, there are also sections that cover things like uh, institutional integrity and academic freedom, um, which is important, you know, naturally important for universities. And um, the idea of diversity, equity, and inclusion is infused throughout the report. So the um, NWCCU refers to, uh, has a lot of standards where um, we need to show that we see things through the lens of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So that's that's kind of shows you or gives you hopefully gives you a feeling for the all the different areas that are covered in the report. Although it's this isn't an exhaustive list by any means, um, but it should it should give you a flavor. And the process of, of putting this report together is quite time consuming. It requires some attention to each of the standards to make sure that um, all the requirements are addressed. When I was uh, putting together this report, I did not see any areas where EOU falls short of, like uh, there's no areas right now where EOU falls short of any of the requirements. We're doing very well. Now, of course, when we started the process, there's always things that we don't necessarily have fully in place. And the EOU staff and, 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 and faculty have been working hard to address those areas. Uh, there's, there's a couple of, of things, for example, people are making sure right now that all of our faculty credentials are in our online directory. And that has to include the degrees and credentials for adjunct instructors as well as, as, well as professional you know, faculty. So that's, that's an example of the kind of thing where we have to we have to update. Um, another area, and I mentioned it earlier earlier, is um, NWCC is really focusing on making sure that our online teaching is done to the same level of quality as our in-person teaching. Um, and this last uh, area has really fallen under the responsibility of the the college deans and the discipline heads in the last few years. But recently, very recently, we hired an, uh, in, an instructional designer. And so we will be forging ahead with, with help from that instructional designer and, uh, and producing a, 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 you know, a lot more evidence, I think, in that area in the future. 
So that that's kind of an overview of the report. And really, um, there's, as far as the, the timeline, the next steps, uh, at this point, we have the rough report in place. It needs editing. It needs um, to be published. Uh, our our um, a graphic designer, Carol Kramer, is working on getting that report published. Uh, we need to make sure we have all the links, everything has to be double checked, all that kind of thing. And that should be done well before um, August. And it, in August, it will be submitted. So that's, that's an overview of the process. And um, do let me know if you have any questions or, or concerns or anything. Thank you, Karen. Um, well, first of all, I want to um, thank you for that work because as everybody understands, the accreditation is crucial to the existence of our university. So this is a extremely important work. I also love it that the picture on the front is the chemistry club doing uh, the uh, liquid nitrogen ice cream. Mm -hmm. So. <laughs> So do I get royalties because I, I took that picture? <laughs> anyway, um, so thank you. And any questions? Uh, I have a question. Uh, thank you, Karen. Um, one of the questions is, as you compile this accreditation, seven years of one, is there anything that is missing now? I mean, things are changing fast. Is there anything in, in the process of accreditation that you find that should be included to really to give a picture of this higher education moment and, and emotion forward? That's, <laughs> I can't say that I've seen anything missing. Um, this report, of course, focuses a lot on administrative um, departments and what I was, um, what what I found interesting is just how much administration goes into an uh, how how much administration how much goes on in the background to give students that degree um, in terms of you know everything from student support and a huge variety of student support to um, you know the the usual institutional things that you have to have like facilities and emergency plans and and whatnot but there's a there's a lot of um, I think I think what makes of course education unique is that focus on the students and it seems like it seems to me like there's almost more and more uh, student supports that people are starting to realize help the process through and there's as they get incorporated into more and more institutions they become almost more necessary even from a, an accreditation standpoint thank you i wanted to share um one of the things that has been I mean, just kind of laud Karen Clay, honestly, for a moment. So we've had a lot of transition at the university and accreditation is one of the most important things we do. It's what allows us to, to have federal financial aid and transfer our classes. And, um, you know, she's worked under two provosts in the last year. There's been a new president um, and I've called her a, a few times myself in wonderment. And, and I wanted to acknowledge too, um, although you were generous in your answer, Karen does push a little bit. She says to, you know, like we, we've had conversations about how can we create, you know, collaborative processes around reports? How can we um, make sure that we're actualizing our strategic plan? And so she, I think, has done a great job pointing out, let's make sure we're on top of this with this kind of roller coaster ride in terms of administrative turnover. So it's been very impressive and I'm, I'm very grateful. Any other questions? Uh, oh, a question. Yes, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks for that report. Um, I, I, I'm new to this and um, I appreciate your explanation of the process piece. I guess I'm interested in, uh, you know, it looks like there's a review team that will, you know, sort of bring up concerns, but this is not really a pass fail type thing, is it? Um, 
or is it at year seven, you know, and what happens? Like, you know, I guess like the, the ultimate evaluation for accreditation is my interest. So thank you. Okay, well, this you know, it's a really good question, actually. What what happens is that um, in the year six report, they may they will not bring up what they call formal concerns. Um, they may bring up concerns, um, but they and they they may talk to us about what those concerns are, and then they will provide us a letter once the, once the board, once the accreditation board looks at these concerns, they will provide us a letter. And if there are sections of the report where they felt like we needed to do something more, uh, those will just be cited in the letter, like uh, standard 2G5 or whatever it happens to be, or standard 2H1. Um, it will it will be cited in the letter and it will also it that will be a cue to the people in the year seven report that they should be looking closely at standard 2g5 or 2h1 or whatever it is um, to make sure that that's in compliance so really it's just an early warning signal for the year seven now when the year seven report happens um, a group of our peers do come here on campus and they a visit for usually two, two and a half days, and they walk around and they meet with every many, many departments on campus. They usually uh, meet with the board of directors as well, um, board of trustees, and and um, they will write a detailed report. And usually these reports will contain um, a few, you know, they'll contain commendations and concerns and if if you get concerns then you need to what what the process is that usually you are asked to write a report to respond to those concerns within a certain amount of time so you might have a, a few a couple of years or maybe less and you write a report that responds to the concerns that says i understand you were concerned about blank this is what eou's done to fix it um, if you get a great number of concerns or very, very substantive concerns, then you might get a statement uh, of, of probation from the accrediting agency. And that's scary, <laughs> very scary. <laughs> um, but it, it's, you know, there's a long ways, there's a, there's a long road to get there and there's a lot of chances to show that you're, you're getting better. Great. Thank you so much, Karen. I appreciate that. And there is also a mid-cycle report. Uh, so after you issued your, your accreditation for after year seven, three years later, there is a report also where certain things need to be addressed. So you have that time built in. But yeah, uh, Karen is right. That better be taken seriously. Um. Um, if you don't mind, Karen, I'll just mention my recollection is the last time we did a year seven report, uh, we got pretty good scores, um, which is no something, you know, we're, we were at a pretty high performance level then. Is it your sense looking at the year six report that acknowledging that a lot of the standards have actually changed since then that uh, we're on track pretty well? Yeah, yes, I do. I do think we're on track and I don't see anything. Um, that said, there's always things, um, not so much in year six, but in year seven, when they come onto campus and they talk to people, uh, uh, there's always, you can always find something that you never expected that you didn't uncover writing the report uh, that uh, becomes a concern. So it, it, you can always get surprised by things. Um, I think it's much, it, it, it might happen in year seven. It seems less likely in year six where really they're not coming to campus. They're just, they're just going to be reading our report and looking at our evidence. So the year seven report includes student success data, right? And uh, so, and that's gonna be more closely questioned, but also since the last accreditation report, we had COVID which caused substantial changes in our student body and what their expectations are, what their training is. So we have been monitoring that, of course, and we are starting to, rec to 
react to things that we have been seeing. Nonetheless, uh, the ball game has changed quite a bit in terms of uh, student success. The uh, iPads report about which I'll be talking later later today. There's actually a, a comparison in there about uh, how we spend our money. It shows how much more money we actually spend on academic support to com compare to our peer institution. And that's really stand out again. It's a recognition of the needs of our student body that we have heavily invested in that. So. Okay, so if there is no further discussion, um, we need a motion to approve this uh, uh, preliminary report, this draft report. I'd like I'll make to make a motion. motion. Go ahead. Then second. Okay, so... I'll make the motion uh, that we recommend uh, this draft to the board for approval. Okay, so Trustee Rio has uh, brought forward the motion and the motion has been seconded by, by uh, Trustee Valerio. All in favor, please say aye. 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 In your post. Great. So the motion passes and Karen and Peter, thank you so much for all this work. I cannot say that I read every line of that report, but I did <laughs> scroll through and it's really extensive. So it's... Um, very impressive report. Thank you Thank for you your all. work and leadership. Right. Okay, I think we are going to move on to our um, next action item, and this will be a presentation by President Ryan about an update on the KPIs. So please proceed. Thank you. Uh, you'll recall that over. Um, the time that I've been here, um, I've been taking a look at our KPIs on the strategic plan to update them and to make them more relevant, I think, to today's students, including, of course, calling together some, some action teams to help us focus on four key areas in which the university does need to improve. As part of the review of the strategic plan that was initiated by my predecessors, Laura Moore and Richard Chaves, uh, they sent some the strategic plan back to University Council, seeing it as um, really um, always trying to find the right words when I talk about the strategic plan, um, just a little bit out of alignment with, with the potentials. And so um, the UC came back and, and suggested some alterations to the plan. Um, the larger body of the Board of Trustees has, has seen fit to approve most of those changes until now, but I thought a, 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 a genuine um, discussion about some of these changes today uh, coming through this committee would be important. Uh, the changes that I'm proposing today are on page two of the cover sheet, uh, and they refer to the outcomes of the university. The original outcome was to increase four-year completion rates to 50% for the first year freshman cohort. Um, and I am proposing today that that KPI be changed to increasing the six-year completion rate to 50% for the first year undergraduate cohort. As you can see from the data below, um, that original goal was so overly ambitious as to be nigh impossible. Moreover, the standard by which universities are judged tend to be six-year graduation rates. While, of course, we all aspire to great heights and will continue to aspire to do and be more in these numbers, um, this one was just pretty far off the charts of feasible. Um, I met with a group of stakeholders on campus three to four times. We sent surveys. We, we looked into the data. Um, and as you can see from what I've provided in this cover sheet, universities like EOU have an average six-year graduation rate of 59%. So I'm acknowledging here that there is a lot more work to be done. Um, there's a lot that needs to be done to bring us in line with that. But getting 
getting there in a matter of five years, that's just not feasible. Um, and having goals that are obtainable um, are important to our community. Uh, they need to strive for what's feasible and possible. And, and just being honest with you, this is still very much so a stretch goal for our community, even with a great number of activities that are occurring on campus. The second outcome that I've proposed here um, relates to, in some ways, um, it's more of a wording change, I think, than anything else. Uh, the original completion rate goal for our transfer students cited to increase the transfer rates to 70% for entering transfer students, but it didn't make any statement about their status as either a part-time or a full-time student which is, you know, difficult um, when you think about the fact that part-time students don't actually intend to complete their degrees in, in that amount of time. Uh, we, now in this particular item, I will say, we, we've done so many data sets on this item, it's, it's actually almost dizzying. Um, but what we came to realize that, um, and, and you can see this bear out, as, as I've written here nationally, is that when students from community colleges come in with an associate's degree, their likelihood of increasing, of completing, goes up to about 30%. And so acknowledging that, acknowledging that um, students can't complete within two years if they came with like say six credits that's just not a feasible thing and so we really needed to write this to make it i think more manageable eou has actually um great success with transfer students who have the associate's degree that was one of the rewarding aspects of this is that we're seeing that what we're doing is actually creating results uh, but this again i think is uh a stretch goal that, that's more doable. You can see the data bef before you hear that this is a feasible outcome for us in some regard, um, just simply more possible and just more in alignment with, with national standards. Um, I know these are big changes. Um, I think they're positive ones for the university. The truth is this is the ongoing story and struggle of EOU. These numbers are always going to be things we aspire for. When we hit 50, we're gonna have to have a new goal of 59. And when we get to 59, we're gonna have to move to 65, right? Um, it's like accreditation, it's a story of continuous improvement. But for right now, EOU needs to catch up. Thank you so much, President Ryan. Are there any questions, uh, discussion about changing the KPIs? Because we will have eventually to vote on this. Just as a reminder, do you have the numbers uh, for our other Oregon uh, uh, smaller institutions? So how how do we compare to? I should probably remember, but I yeah, I presented this moment, those this the summer. Western and, and uh, Southern. Yeah, and among our peer institutions, the true institutions, um, we, as I recall from this summer, we had the second lowest. So um, that's an important thing for us to keep in mind uh, because the other trues have students like ours. They're regional institutions and they're a couple percentage points ahead of us. And that means that that means this is an opportunity area for this, that this is something that can and, and should be done. They're attracting first generation students. They're attracting students who maybe didn't have um, all the privilege in their backgrounds. And yet there are a couple of percentage points ahead of us. So it's a good sign that there's a lot of potential for us here to grow. I see that Brenda has a question. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, President Ryan. I, I think my question is, maybe a little bit more about what happens between four and six years. Um, I mean, I guess my expectation is, you know, you're, you've got your degree in four years. Um, and like, what is it that is driving um, that completion rate between four and four and six? You know, there's so, so many things that happen in a student's life and, and each story is, you know, 
truly unique. But, you know, one thing we have to keep in mind about all students is that they change majors. And that's a very, very common thing that, that sets you back as, as you change majors or perhaps even add on another or another minor, that can affect your outcomes. Um, sometimes people do stop out for financial reasons and, and we have a team working on preventing that in the future. Um, each story is, is going to be unique for sure. Um, our student athletes like to play as long as it's possible to play, just being honest. Um, and then I think people also, a lot of our students have part-time jobs, even when they're full-time students. And so um, as, as we've shared with you before, our FTE, the student credit hours that students are taking, even when they're full-time, they're not usually maxing out. And so that's a project that the university needs to undertake in these next five years to encourage students to just really enroll in the most credits that are feasible for them. Um, I'm afraid that when we counsel students to lessen their load, we're also counseling them to ultimately leave the university. Um, commitment um, to your progress requires actual progress. And when students don't take full loads, um, they quickly run to a space of kind of, oh gosh, I'm never going to get there. So why do I keep going, right? Um, this is obviously a national story. Uh, this is this is the story of higher education right now for non-elite institutions. Um, we have to do more to wrap around services and make sure that our students are as successful as others. Yeah, great. And I know we're not, you know, a KPI that goes to six years is not essentially addressing what what's happening, you know, between four and six, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess I would like to, to see that uh, you maybe four year go up as much as the six year go up, right? Like, I, I do think that uh, sort of that progress to uh, your completion is is better than just progress overall. So I don't know. I couldn't agree more. I yeah. couldn't agree more with that statement. And and every time we make progress on a six-year graduation rate, I can assure you that we are simultaneously making progress on the four-year graduation rate. One of the things I'm really proud of that I've seen happen on the campus this year is these these numbers are incredibly hard to move. And I, and I think that was probably one of the difficulties in the original construction of the strategic plan was was probably uh, um, an optimism that wasn't necessarily rooted in reality. I mean, we're talking about systemic issues, <laughs> you know, the, you, you can't really move through these things really quickly. But one thing I've seen happen here that I find very positive is from term to term, we're seeing two to 3% retention rates um, term to term in, in students enrolling. And that's a sign sort of like that 41% that I point out that occurred in fall 18 around those five year graduation rates. Um, that that's a sign that we are moving in the right direction and there is increasingly more of a stickiness. But we also need to take care of making sure that students feel that their education is taking them somewhere in a nation that right now tells them that there is not a value to a college degree. So there's, you know, there's things sort of like, you know, when I first became a leader, I remember learning, you know, there's what's in the size of your palm, which is like, you know, not really in your control, <laughs> but then that dime, that's the part that you control. And then you move out to the quarter where you have the influence, right? So I think working on the influence and in the areas that we have control over to the best of our abilities is really important. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, I thank you. I'm, I'm following up on Brenda's question, and that is, are we intentionally trying to capture data about jobs associated I mean, that's, that you mentioned most likely in the life of the kids, the students that will continue year number four, five, and six? Most likely, although they're still full time, the reality in their lives is they are full-time, maybe with a full-time job, which did not happen in year number two or three. So are we trying to capture that important part that, uh, to paint the picture? We do have, have data on the employment of our students, but I do think, Maurizio, that's that particular statistic is an area of growth for us. Um, when I first came here and, and kind of delivered the convocation speech and, and thought about um, what our student body was like um, in this post-pandemic world, um, getting data sets on students' employment was a difficulty. And so, uh, you know, I think it's, it, 
you, you can get at it in, in by triangulating like three different points, but I do think it would be useful for us as we work on building out our data that we have a, a kind of regularized student survey that hopefully gets us enough. Right now, we don't get enough participation in some of our surveys, too, that gets us enough participation that makes it verifiable. That's a good point. President Ryan, I think for... For me, um, kind of to piggyback on Brenda's uh, concept, and it was running in my head during that time that I do think there are students that um, I, I would just say don't graduate in four years um, because there's probably some systemic scheduling issues. I mean, it's, I'm, it's not the first time, you know, I know for me, even when I was a student, there wasn't, there were times where I couldn't take courses that I wanted to take because they were out of sequence. How much do you guys look at? courses offered, um, course alignment, course schedules, making sure that they can get through in four years. And if they can't take this class, it's offered this way and it's offered that way. And do we have our own kind of systemic ways of shooting ourselves in the foot or shooting students basically in the foot at times? Uh, if I may introduce Peter uh, back up to it, it's funny you asked this. He literally just called for a study of this yesterday. Um, and, and truth be told, I, I may need the support of the deans in answering this question too, Nate, but uh, Peter. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So scheduling has been, is an ongoing issue, how to get it just right, because you have to really attack so many pieces of it, right? From the basic university thing, yeah, the discussion we had yesterday about the scheduling guidelines and how they are enforced and, and what the effect is of scheduling on, on the students and how they typically see. And uh, so we need to, we are revisiting this again. We uh, have to really be mindful of the athletics practice schedule. Right? which is usually in the afternoons between two and five right now, which forces a lot of classes into prime time in the morning. And there are, there are often conflicts. We are trying to run evening laboratory classes and maybe art studios, again, being mindful of the athletes and when students can actually attend them. So that's another thing, another thing we look at. The scheduling guidelines, you know, we, we, the advisors actually have a list of potential overlaps and course conflicts. We studied which courses are most often taken together in which year. Particularly, I know it from the sciences, you know, if you're physics and biology and you do that all at the same time, making sure that those are not offered at the same time so similar with the math classes so but it is a it is always a moving target as student preferences changes we have to move also students want to be hybrid more they want want to take some some classes which will affect how we schedule out of prime time things as well just as we're trying to balance the online offerings with the on-campus offerings so uh yeah these discussions are ongoing and we are very mindful of that. And uh, deans, uh, uh, sorry, deans regularly do make exceptions when cases occur like this as well, correct? Like if someone were unable to, to get a class, y'all have a form that you sign. Yeah. <laughs> right. If, if a, it becomes an issue with the prerequisite structure, which we are also reviewing, are prerequisites actually necessary because they will take away scheduling uh, flexibility from students or how, the, how they built their schedule. So those are also constantly revisited to reduce them to the most, yeah, the most necessary prerequisite. So that's, that's one thing that's also being looked at all the time. So I, I just wanted to make a... I just wanted to make a follow-up comment to what Peter said um, as a faculty member. We really pay very close attention in the scheduling of the courses uh, because some degrees are very uh, prescriptive. So if you miss that first sequence, uh, then automatically you are off of a year. So it, and we have four-year plans where we have a very clear path for the different uh, concentrations and whatnot of our degrees. And I, I'm, I don't know what's going on in the other colleges, but in our college, we really pay very close attention because it's like a puzzle. And the moment you move one piece, everything else falls apart. And I cannot overemphasize the importance of advising because placing the students in the right classes, whether it's a math class or a writing class or whatever it is, is really paramount to their success so that they are not either overwhelmed or 
um, you know, are in a class that is not going to do any good for, to, for their degrees. So all these things, we play very close attention, but it is a lot. <laughs> and it's, you know, one thing moves and, and everything else has to move along. Yeah, the sciences in particular are really very hierarchical in their program offices, uh, offerings, how they are structured. So, yeah, as Anna said, you know, uh, if you miss the fall opening of a sequence, you wait a year. That We just can't offer multiple sequences, uh, three-term sequences that. There are many prereqs from other disciplines, especially specifically math, of course, and others, or a physics requirement, which also has to be taken in a tightly packed, you know, schedule. So... Yeah, that's just the reality. Advising is absolutely crucial, and it also means we have to have advisors be able to advise somebody. So we need our schedule ahead of time for multiple quarters, which we have been starting to build. I mean, and and build want to build that further. So there's actually a, at least a core schedule available on which students can count, so they can develop better that long-range plan also for disciplines that are not as hierarchical where there are more choices. Can I ask a follow-up? Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll keep it fairly short. Um, I was just going to come in from, you know, I was recently a student um, going through everything. Uh, I was taking economics at the same time as business. So when I was going through, uh, one of the issues I remember I ran into is because I had everything planned like three years in advance. I had everything set up. But what I got hit by a couple times was um, if classes got canceled because someone had left the university for whatever reason it was, and then I was able to get the dean ex exceptions um, but, it, you know, I was able to get through, but there it was why, you know, a couple of my terms, I had uh, 23, 24 credit hours, you know, my singular term. And um, I was able to balance that and do that. But students that, you know, are working or having to pay more through school probably wouldn't have been able to do that. And then especially if they're, you know, student athlete, which a lot of our on campus are, um, so, yeah, I just wanted to provide a little bit of that perspective. I, I was able to work through advising was really good. The school worked with me, um, but I was in a nice spot where I was able to juggle that around where others may not. Mike, my follow-up was just going to be the, the study that you do, the fact-finding that you get, uh, and how we can improve that would be something that I would be interesting, you know, interested in hearing probably for our committee. I think... Uh, I mean, we know, I mean, we've known a long time that students go through kind yeah. of the experience that Cedar talked about, and it's probably a, a normal thing. But uh, I just want to know uh, what we can do to yeah. improve that or, you know, just say support that better. Yeah. I also have to, of course, acknowledge that there is the financial picture of it, given our situation. Right? We can't run classes that have one and two students in it, you know, or we do some out of necessity or not to delay students, but we can only do so much in order for the whole structure not to collapse. So this is a consideration in scheduling. Again, puts more emphasis on good advising, solid advising, and having a, having a long-term view. And I appreciate what Cedric said about uh, the dean's allowances. Each program chair can actually make program substitutions if they can decide whether... Students cannot take this one class, they are missing it for graduation. They can find another course that would substitute for that in the program. So this is really uh, at the hand of the program the department chairs to do, which gives us some important flexibility, as long as it's a, it's a meaningful substitution for the program, of course. Hey, the last thing me on that is just like Cedric's special. And I'll just say it that way. I think him as a, um, he's a go-getter. He's assertive. I think he's a planner. He's a, he's a motivated guy. I don't know if every student's like Cedric. So when they're, you know, whether it's the admissions and having a lot of people that kind of push and support and show you the path and give you the way. But um, for those that don't have all of that, you know, how do we make sure that they know that there's resources or there's people out there to support them? Those are the parts where I'd probably be also interested in hearing how um, we don't let people fall through the cracks or how we help them if they're starting yeah. to. 
And just going back to the advising piece, which is always so critical, we are launching an effort now on restructuring our advising. You're looking at it from the ground up to see how we can retool it better so students have that advising continuity and not being transferred all the time, and so they get that information all the time. The president has also called for, for a mentoring program, another incarnation of the mentoring program that again identifies these important relationships that students need to have in order to be successful. So this is really part of all, all the, those broader discussions. Um, and I'd like to share that student affairs plays a critical role a lot of times when <clears throat> students need to withdraw <clears throat> for a particular reason, excuse me. <clears throat> and we do work with the academic advisors at some, uh, sometimes because there are things that could, there are domino effects. And so we talk with the students and help them to understand. And we learn what are the barriers or what are those domino effects and how can we work with uh, the departments um, in making sure that the students can stay on track or pick it up at another time. Um, so there are a lot of things that go on, um, as um, Karen Clay indicated, behind the scenes when these types of things do happen. So um, I would also be interested in understanding the scheduling um, uh, information and that too. But student affairs also gets their fingers in and, and, and looks at what happens financially, what happens with their class, how is this going to affect them? So when we work with students, we do the same. If I may add one more thing, given our financial situation, right? I mean, we really had to cut back in various offices and that has affected processes, you know, that used to be reasonably continuous. Now we're missing people in certain offices. We are also looking at these processes that involve multiple offices in order, number one, not to have any gaps, but also not to have any overlap, which could just confuse students. So. Well, um, through this conversation, um, I think it's evidence that, you know, there's a lot of work going into, um, you know, the sixth year and what we're looking at as far as student uh, completion. So I do think um, President Ryan's proposed changes, um, you know, is a fair assessment of the work we're trying to do and already doing and moving forward. Um, you know, those those can change as, you know, it's always moving. As you said, it's always moving as we move forward. So I'd like to make a motion to approve President Ryan's proposed changes to KPI 331 and 332 of the Ascent 2029 Strategic Planning Framework. Thank you. The motion has been brought forward by uh, um, Trustee Rio. Do I hear your second? I second it. Okay, the motion has been seconded by uh, Maurizio Valeria. All in favor, please say hi. Aye. 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 In your post. Great. The motion passes. Thank you very much, President Ryan and everybody for the discussion. We are a couple of minutes ahead of our schedule. I suggest that we take a very short break and that we reconvene at 10 o'clock. Do I have to do the thing? No. <laughs>
reconvene, give a second for everybody to settle back. Okay, we are gonna move on to the uh, discussion items as part of this agenda. And the first discussion item is an overview of the integrated post-secondary education data system. And we will hear from our interim provost, uh, uh, Guy, uh, Peter Geisinger. So Peter, please proceed with your presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Cavanado. Yeah, Peter Geisinger, Interim Provost. I'm here with Angie Adams, who is helping me manage these uh, presentations and, and the and the IT of, associated with it. So um, we uh, talked about accreditation and, of course, about all the data we have re required to submit, you know, to the accreditor for the evaluation. But we have many, many, many more data reporting requirements from uh, federal government, state governments, and so on. I want to talk today about the federal database, the iPads database, to which uh, all institutions who are receiving and dispersing financial aid have to report. And it does the database is is a terrific resource for policymakers, for uni universities, but also theoretically at least for the individual consumer. Anybody can go on there and uh, compare universities to each other. Uh, using all kinds of metrics. So it is, it is really amazing. It takes a little, a few minutes to get used to it, but it's so much better now than it used to be. So it's a fantastic resource. And uh, I'll be, I attach to the invitation to the, to the cover sheet, the data feedback report. This is sort of a standardized report format that they're offering, but you can get so much more information out of that when you when you spend some time with it. So, uh, and many of you will have used that database, are familiar with it, so I, I beg your indulgence. Yeah, I found it actually very interesting to go through it and to pull out some of the data that uh, then you have all access to and, and beyond. So, and with that, we enter the world of federal acronyms, which is uh, quite a maze. So we're talking about iPads. Uh, it's the Integrated Post-Secondary Education Data System, which is operated by NCES, the National Center for Education Statistics, which is a part for, of the Institute for Education Services of the United States Department of Education. So here we are with all that. And again, as I said, you know, there is a mandatory reporting requirement for all the institutions who receive federal funding in some sort. So it is comprehensive. Uh, what does iPads collect? So in very general terms, it collects uh, institutional characteristics. I mean, starting from locations, cost of attendance, uh, tuition fee cost, and so on. It looks at admissions. I mean, how many students applied, how many were admitted, and so, so data like this. It's interested also in some uh, some other aspects of that. Enrollment. Well, how many actually choose to come here are enrolled. There's retention information in there and student success data. And uh, and also how many degrees are awarded, of course. And institutional resources. That includes uh, information on how we spend our money. You know, how much is allocated to faculty and staff, to uh, to academic support and, and various other categories. Again, this is all visible to the consumer, to parents. They can see uh, how we support various activities on campus. The collection schedule is ongoing. I mean, we have to report data in, in three quarters and uh, they request uh, different, slightly different things, you know, in, in different years as they build the report. So the report that you get pull out may be affected to, uh, by the time when you actually request it in terms of what has been collected. But you can see here institutional characteristics. It's a uh, 12 month enrollment is a combined headcount, for example, uh, non-duplicated. So we're not double counting students in multiple terms, various things in winter, financial aid information, 
the 200% graduation rate, and you'll see that, of course, 100%, 200, 150%, 200% graduation rate, that's always with respect to the standard length of the degree that they're proposing. So for a four-year degree, this would be the four, six, and eight-year graduation rates, but they're also including certificates that may be shorter, so they are the, what, 100, 150, 200% would be different for that. We have... Uh, yeah, enrollments in the spring, fall enrollment, and uh, various other components about information about human resources and so on. So it's quite an extensive reporting. Uh, I talked earlier about the uh, iPads data feedback report. So that's a pre-formatted report, you know, it produces a nice PDF file, that's the one attached. It is, there is a standard format that pulls in certain data. Again, that was used in the report you received, but you can customize it. You can add many, many more uh, graphs of data comparison and so on. You can also pick a, a list of institution you wanna compare one institution to. Uh, the, the standard data feedback report that we receive every year directly However, that has a default set of peer institutions selected, which did not match with the one that we identified. And that was presented to the board uh, last fall, I think, by our institutional research director using methodology from the National Council of Higher Education Management Systems. So uh, I went in and I recreated that report with the peer institutions that were identified in fall. The, their default... Uh, there was no overlap with the default <laughs> cities that they picked. They were much larger. Some were really solidly in and around metropolitan areas, so not really a relevant comparison. So this report now has our set of peer institutions in it. And I have the list here as a reminder. You may recall that it's like Shadron in Nebraska, Wayne State, Nebraska, Black Hills, uh, South Dakota, I think Peru is in Indiana. Two SUNY campuses are in there. And uh, Eastern Connecticut State, Northern State, that is in uh, Aberdeen, South Dakota, for example. So it's a, it's a sprinkling. Cameron is uh, Oklahoma, and there's one in Arkansas as well. So it's a, a set of that really matches our institutional core characteristics. So in terms of inputs, right, so location, you know, and, uh, and things like that. Oops. Okay, so uh, I don't want to run through the entire report that was attached. There's a lot of stuff in there. Uh, I just selected a few data, a uh, few graphs as illustration, and uh, well, that seemed relevant. The first one I started with now with the admissions information that is in there. So the darker colored graph, you know, the bar, I think it's could be red on yours. I have it inverted. So that's EOU, and the other one, the the fainter graph, that is an average of these peer institution, of the data that the peer institutions submitted. So you can tell right away, you know, our applications that we have and the other ones on average had much more, many more applications. It goes down with admit, how many were admitted. The graph on the right that shows uh, how much and how many actually enrolled and how that distribution was, right? Full-time enrollment, 25% for us versus 18% the other ones. So we have more, more full-time students than the average of these other institutions and their various other categories. So that's, that's a great comparison. And again, you can customize it. It also provides this, this uh, demographic disaggregation and comparing the student bodies based on race and ethnicity and also on gender. You can, it's unfortunate that the scale is predefined. So in the, the lower ones, you sort of lose the detail, but there are the numbers in there. It shows we are rough, roughly similar, you know, to these other institutions. Also on the very right, the comparison of uh, gender, female, male, and uh, predominant uh, as female oncologist, that, that's known now widely, you know, that there's an imbalance now that we're, we are missing the males on campus right now, which is a, a larger issue. Next up, I have uh, the, uh, yeah, f relevant for us on the left, the distance education status. And there you can see that we have many, many more undergraduate uh, 
online students than these other universities have. Uh, uh, in spite of them sharing characteristics like location, environment, and uh, state support, in terms of who actually enrolls, we are quite different. It gives also information on uh, students doing a hybrid enrollment, which is fairly low for us, but which is growing. And we mentioned that earlier, that affects our scheduling and how, how we schedule classes. So that, that's a more and more important segment. And the pure on-campus on students, you know, are very low for us and, and comparably low roughly to the other institutions. On the right, the data set on the right is a de degree completion matrix. So if we go down here, that's the 150% rate. Is it, yeah. And yeah, so it, it gives a very, the degrees that were awarded. So master's degree is slightly less than the, the peer institution average, right? Uh, with a bachelor's degree, however, we're exceeding number-wise, you know, what these other institutions provide. Given how many applications and more students that they brought in, I think that's, that's a very encouraging thing. We are getting them to, to completion. Again, we, we always can get and need to get better. Tuition and fee comparison is always interesting, yeah, and that's one that's of course mostly pulled by by probably parents and <laughs> interested students. Uh, we are slightly above, you know, the, the average of those peer institutions in various categories, which is an interesting comparison. We do, however, compare ourselves to institutions uh, where the benefits packages that we're offering, you know, uh, to our employees are not quite as good. They are in states that that oftentimes are not unionized the faculty. So, so we provide much better safety to our faculty and also many more benefits, which ultimately, you know, comes down to to the tuition cost in addition to the state support that we're getting. And we know our state support is is way behind other, at least the ones in our region. So a lot of things play in there, but it's still an interesting comparison. On the right then is the cost of attendance. And again, uh, it is uh, more expensive in various categories and has been throughout the years as it progresses than the other institutions that we are comparing ourselves to. Next, uh, retention and graduation rate, and it's the six years or the 150% rate for, for bachelor's degrees and the certificates are in there as well. So we uh, know we have a slightly lower retention rate than others have, not dramatically lower, but we already pointed out that retention is a multifaceted issue, right? and so many factors are involved that nonetheless, you know, we can always do better and improve in that. The uh, It's a fact, uh, broken up into full-time and part-time, so very different things. On the right, we have the graduation rates. Again, they're typically um, what we have seen before, the 38%, others do slightly better. A uh, point that President Ryan has talked about to the campus community quite a lot, that is the transfer out rate, students. And we are higher than our peer institutions. The difference is, is uh, in numbers quite a bit. It's 8%, you know, but in terms of student numbers, we're losing quite a lot. Of course, it is true that students you know, come in with the intent of transferring sometimes, you know, that's their plan to get their first two years in and then they transfer to a bigger institution or something like this. That will always be there. But even acknowledging that, you know, that it, just hypothetically, if we assume that the average of the other institutions, the peer institutions, is the base. You know, this is the 26% that always transfer, no matter what. Still gives us 8% on which we can have an impact. Those 8%, you know, we can cover. We can do better in retaining those and preventing them from, from transferring out. And I think that is very a very important point because in conversations, I think that I have had, and I think President Ryan can acknowledge that, People sort of throw up their hands and said, well, you know, that's what they want to do anyway, and we should support this because it's a good thing. That's what they want, right? It's not an excuse for us not to do anything, right? 8% difference, if we could make that, that is huge for us. It's absolutely huge. And we focus on that. Yes, except those who want to transfer out, nonetheless, those who are not sure, those we can affect and, and retain. 
Yeah, you can also see uh, the next graph that is uh, the graduation rates broken out by ethnicity. And uh, so uh, there we are fairly comparable to our peer institutions. The next graph uh, is the yeah, 100, 150%, 200% undergraduate graduation rates. It shows, uh, again, a disadvantage of the pre-formatted report, the scale. You can see the scale goes up to 100, but we have all this. Actually, and unfortunately, right next to those bars, there are the numbers in percentage. It is so extremely faint. It took me actually a couple of days to find that they're even there. So, but uh, for if you're interested uh, more, you can pull, of course, the data out of the report specifically. And I think this is my last one. That I think is not in the standard format of the report, but I, I pulled another report that uh, shows you know, the importance of our military members, our, our former military veterans, for us compared to the other institutions and how many uh, military members we serve and who have these various tuition assistance programs. That's what TAP is, a, tuition, a Department of Defense tuition uh, program. So uh, very, very important uh, part that, that we need to serve and we can still serve them better always and show you know, that we are indeed, as we are denoted as a military-friendly institution. I mean, this is a, a source of pride and also a source of opportunity for us. Okay, just a few things. Yeah, again, that the, the report has like 26 figures and all kinds of things. But then uh, last week, actually, it was very timely at Inside Higher Ed, there was a report that there is movement in Congress about a student unit record data system. And uh, that fact that this comes up highlights one of the problems with the current iPads data. It is always first time students, first time full time, first time part time students. There is no tracking of students across institutions as they leave. Or when they arrive in another institution and they're not first time, they are not counted in the iPads data that uh, is being submitted. And that has been recognized quite a while ago. And already in 2005, the Department of Education proposed such a student unit data tracking system that entails submitting individual student information and to allow the Department of Education to do such tracking. And uh, such data is submitted for certain subgroups already at the individual level. I mean, the student, the National Student Loan Data System, of course, has individualized information because they received the money. I think the various uh, GI Bill recipients and Department of Defense program require in, uh, individual student reporting so to prove eligibility. Uh, these databases currently are not connected. And that was one of the attempts in 2005 to connect those databases and complete it with those that are now captioned by those. That ran into a staunch opposition right away because again, social security numbers were expected to be filed. So that there was, there was an uproar, even though the Department of Education said, yeah, they, they have the information, but the, the data they would release, you know, is of course, has all personal identifiers removed. Nonetheless, it puts up a general database that has a lot of individual information in there. And in 2008, Congress actually banned the, the establishment of such a unified system that collects all this information. So then, ever since then, there were attempts made, you know, to do this in some form or another using, for example, a third party vendor to combine all this data. So it's not in the hands of the federal government that didn't go very well. I know Ron Wyden from Oregon was a prominent sponsor for many years. And since 2015, every year apparently there is the College Transparency Act that includes such a provision was never moved on in Congress. So now, just last week, there is a proposal, you know, put forward by the education chair of Virginia Fox, you know, that goes slightly in this direction. I say slightly because that proposal would still miss about 30% of other students. It does certainly provides more information. And it depends on certain, uh, the part of participation rate depends on individual states. And for example, only 20% of uh, California community colleges would be captured because they have so many state uh, tuition reduction programs and so on, or in addition to having already low 
tuition rates for those colleges. They don't, they use less federal assistance students, so they are not still not captured in that. So this is a story to be continued. I found it very interesting, again, when I was looking at this, that just last week I saw this in, in the posted online, and uh, I wanted to, yeah, share that story about where we are, because as I said, it uh, reflects some of the limitations of the current systems reporting system that you have. Uh, that we have and uh, would should impact everyone's interpretation of the data that is actually provided. So with that, I'd like to conclude. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Peter, for your presentation. Are there any questions? Uh, Resti Valerio, go ahead. Thank you, Peter. Quite interesting. I downloaded the report. I looked through it and then I went to the list. I started checking a couple of those places. Are we happy with peers? And it's because this is, this is peer institutions. I only checked a couple of them. Mm -hmm. I didn't go through the whole list, uh, ran out of time. But are we happy with that compilation of list uh, to compare? I think generally, yes, I think we are happy. There was a, quite a process uh, to refine those last fall doing that. The methodology, again, it's a, it's a nationwide methodology that tracks a whole lot of data. And I don't have it here. Areza presented that, you know, a long time ago. I think generally it's a much better list than we used to have because there are various peer institution lists out. For example, in, in the collective bargaining agreement, there's, there's a peer list, you know. So this is an attempt to use a nation, nationwide methodology, you know, to collect the list of peer institutions that are more relevant to us. And it's not perfect, of course, it's, it can't be perfect because things like the environment in which you operate, they might all be rural again, but the state, you know, what the state does, what they provide, how they support education, all of this, you know, it still needs to be considered as well. So. Yeah, thank you. And, and one of the criteria, I'm thinking about Oregon and Idaho, mm -hmm. an old border town, you know, minimal wages, for example, where students may go mm -hmm. and decided to go. And anyway, so there are many, so many criteria there. That, that, the second question is, uh, do you, do we know if this um, iPad uh, information data are used by prospective students? I mean, do they go there and research this just to make a decision or is better in layers of, of... Maybe I could jump in on this one. Yeah, yeah so, so this data source feeds all the other websites that students use. So this federal data feeds all those engines that students search on. So it's the source that gets fed out to all those other tracking systems. Yeah, but the database itself, it takes some getting used to it. You know? <laughs> Definitely, yeah. So, thank you so much. Very interesting. Also, uh, interesting your comparison, right? As as we know, uh, Oregon supports students to the tune of like uh, I think five thousand nine hundred dollars per student a year. Idaho is close to ten thousand dollars. I mean, this is a sh shocking dis discrepancy. I mean, that uh, affects students' choices, you know, and again may affect, you know, who your peer really is. You know, who is the best peer. Okay, we have time. We have time for just one more question. Dr. Geisinger, I think for me, just, you know, looking at some of it, that I could see that there's kind of a, a I'll just call it a Pell Grant problem, mm -hmm. at least in the data with the comparison group, where it seems like we sometimes get more on the award, but less awards in general. And then that also influences um, how many students wind up enrolling based on that. And then the retention rates to, and how, you know, we're, we're I'll just say we're full-time getting less students mm -hmm. to retain, part-time we're getting more kids to be retained, mm -hmm. and then also our, our graduation rates and our transfer out rates are different than the comparators or we're below them. Um, do you do this as like, okay, we got some problems, we're going to do some action and strategies and we're going to start addressing them? Is that is that what you use this data for? And then you have nice big meetings and you talk about who's doing what and here, you know, this person's doing this and we're doing that and now we're improving. Is that how it goes? Yes, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I mentioned earlier, President Ryan has been very vocal about the transfer out rate, you know, and so there have been efforts going on. We slightly improved our retention rate. I mean, from uh, it was a term to term retention rate that we looked at. So, so these efforts are bearing fruit. I mean, the campus vitality, you know, to look at the whole package, not just the academic part, but also the environment to make students comfortable. So ab absolutely. I mean, and we'll talk later a little bit about, I mean, other initiatives, 
that the President Ryan has launched, a smart stop, one stop. I, it's a, I can talk about it a little bit later. And other things, you know, to to look at this holistically. It's, it's yes, academic is a big part. Course offering is a big part to retain them, but also the whole student life part. You know, how the how comfortable they are they on campus? You know, where they have opportunities and are encouraged to stay on campus to interact. So we're absolutely looking looking at, at many of those issues going forward. And, and I, I we know we, more of a comment for me yeah. would just be great. And if we're monitoring growth or we're giving feedback on growth over time, that would be good. Absolutely. And we know and know we are, given how small we are, we make a difference one student at a time. Taney, one student is already, you know, a big win for us. Mm -hmm. Well, Peter, thank you so much for this overview. And we are now going to move on to uh, some presentations uh, uh, pertaining to student uh, engagement experiences here at EOU. So we have Professor Mike Sal uh, from the art program with his students. And we also have Pepper Huxel with the Espilia Native American Student Council. So I invite uh, perhaps first, yeah, let's go ahead and have Professor Mike Sal. And just in the interest of time, you have about eight minutes or so for the presentation. So thank you so much for being here. Yeah, me, yeah. go ahead and press yes. And now so it's make red. Sure ah. Perfect. Uh, yeah, make sure that you always uh, have the mic on. Because we also have a trustee and maybe others online. Online, perfect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank, thank you very you. much. Um, thanks, everybody, for the invitation. Uh, it's so good to um, see everybody. And uh, really briefly, I wanted to uh, bring a student, Av Hughes, who's an art major uh, and who participated in a uh, class with me and a few other students over spring break. Uh, in 2017, I first attended Treefort Music Festival with a pass that I acquired from KEOL, the uh, now defunct, rest in peace, uh, radio station on campus. And uh, in conjunction with uh, Dean Nate Lau, uh, in 2022, put together a special topics class that took uh, 10 students or so down to Boise for the annual Treefort Music Festival. Uh, students, is it not on? Oh, I'm sorry. And Jordan told me to hit share and I forgot. It's we're so far removed from like constant Zoom days that I couldn't <laughs> I just uh, it's yeah. Uh thanks. Thanks, Gib. Um where was I? The uh Students, uh, students in the we were well received at Treefort. Their uh, their staff, their press and media were all really excited about uh, students coming and participating in this sort of active way of engaging with the groups and the other events that were happening in conjunction with the festival. And so these um, early examples are uh, are images. From oh, it's working. From uh, that first class in 2022, and uh, we just got back from the festival a little over a week ago, and those um, and I have some images from those students as well, um, including uh, a couple of years that I didn't tell you about until just now. It's okay. They're, they were the best. They were two of the best ones. But um, in terms of student engagement, uh, the student enthusiasm has been uh, really high with regards to this class. It's a very different kind of practical opportunity for students to be uh, sort of in an environment that uh, requires this kind of application of the skills that they learn in other classes that I teach. Uh, and uh, these last two, these images by uh, both Jan and uh, Karina, uh, they. <clears throat> they both uh, were actually on staff with the rest of the photography team for Treefort um, this year. Uh, and I didn't run into Jan, uh, but I did run into Karina a couple of times uh, while we were down in the, uh, in the city. And for the class itself, students aren't um, required just to photograph the performance, so that is uh, a big part of what they focus on, uh, but all the other events that are happening around town Oh, Luca's images are gone. Oh well, uh, that must be from downloading to uh, to PowerPoint. Uh, and as I uh, I'm as I finish up with the slides, um, I will uh, hand the. Oh, they're not even on here. It's a drive link. 
Why would it do that? Oh, because the images aren't shared. I guess we'll st we'll stick with Delilah or it'll be a Delilah's picture. Is that okay? Okay. Sorry, Ab. How dare you? That's okay. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it was an amazing experience. I was able to go there with a lot of my friends, and so we were able to get like an Airbnb together and just were able to experience the entire event. And we just kind of went our own separate ways here and there. We took different pictures of different people. It was a lot of fun. I was able to learn a lot from the other photographers there as well that were on the actual media team because I was able to like witness them doing certain techniques with like how they move their camera and it makes me want to try doing those type of techniques in the future because yeah when i was at this music festival i really want to go back now and all my friends are planning to go back as well so that we can all get better at what we were doing there but uh yeah uh sorry give me one second <laughs> yeah <laughs> um yeah, and I haven't really done a lot of, with, like, moving photography, and the concerts, they move really fast. So it was quite a learning curve, because I hadn't taken photography in a little bit. So learning how to do all of that was pretty fun, and just exploring all of the little things that is in my camera, like, discovering new things on how to use it. It was a lot of fun. Um, Sorry. <laughs> but yeah, I uh, want to go back. I want to do that some more. And yeah, I'm going to go. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> Hadley, do you want to switch out? Yeah. yeah. Do you mean to formally? Oh, no, we might have a few questions. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, but, yeah, but oh, you have another student. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah please come up. Thank you. This is sounds super cool. Class I'm, I would have loved to have taken when I was in college. Mm -hmm. um, the, the equipment is very expensive. So how is that? Is, does the university provide some of that equipment or? Okay, so. Yeah, university uh, supplies a lot of the equipment. I had my own digital camera that I brought from home, so I was able to do that. But they do offer a lot of like different types of cameras that you can use in these types of events mm -hmm. and just in classes in general. Mm -hmm. It's it's more and more common for students to to arrive on campus with uh, with a higher end digital camera more more than I would have even used in graduate school um, over 15 20 years ago. Uh, but our library has a fully stocked uh, media um, uh, surplus, and and students are able to check out those cameras for the time that they need as well. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um. I am Hadley Marshall. I am the student gallery director um, for Nightingale Gallery on campus. And first off, I want to thank you, the board, for um, this opportunity to discuss the gallery and my experiences as the student gallery director. Um, the gallery is a major reputation booster for EOU as an institution. The gallery is one of the main drivers of creative input and exchange of information on our campus. Um, this is achieved through a fee-free gallery experience, making the art accessible to everyone, from community members to students. Uh, monthly discussions led by these artists broaden the outreach of the arts into the community. Everyone is welcome to attend these events. Um, the gallery allows us to import major players in the art world, giving them a space to show their work as well as interact with our students. This allows an opportunity for students to interact and gain professional advice from those working outside of the academic art world. Um, all visiting artists that attend EOU personally meet with upperclassmen art majors for a one-on-one -on -one session regarding the student's person personal art practice. This time is crucial, allowing the students to glean personal and professional guidance. I myself have experienced many of these uh, professional art meetings with visiting artists, and they have been instrumentally helpful in guiding my own personal art practice as I am an art major. Um, and as the student gallery director and through this community centered art approach, I'm able to build people and communication skills through these interactions with local and national artists, helping them with the installation and direction of their shows from start to finish. 
Um, and finally, I train and direct a team of five employees, helping them foster these same skills as preparation for career in the art world. The gallery is a vital part of EOU as an institution, fostering an environment of professionalism, communication, and student outreach, and has the potential to become a leading force on our campus through the strengthening of these programs. Thank you. And there's an exhibit this Friday that's opening, isn't it? There is. There are two exhibits. Um, we have our senior art exhibition opening on April 5th at 5 p.m. in the Nightingale Gallery, as well as the exhibition that I am in at Art Center East at 6 p.m. And Av is in that exhibition as well. Thank you. Um, how did you get the position that you have and how long have you had it? And do you look forward to a career in, in this kind of a field? Yeah. Um, I got the position uh, last year when, at the end of last year's term, when um, Corey Peak offered it to me um, as, uh, as the previous student gallery director had just graduated. Um, and I, I'm certainly looking forward to exploring a career in gallery direction as well as just our outreach. It really engages me and I think that this position is a huge opportunity to help build those skills and push me forward. Thank you. I'm gonna just, I'm gonna push a little bit in a different way. Mm -hmm. First of all, I'm really pleased that you're doing this, um, but I'm gonna go a little deeper besides kind of the visual experience that people have. What, what do you do that kind of embraces um, kind of the intersectionality of gender or race mm -hmm. and other people's cultural history? Do you have any meaningful activities that take place besides looking visually at things? Do you have things that create bonding moments or communal moments or things where people understand other people's perspectives? What takes place in these settings? Yeah, certainly. So a good example of that was in November of last year, we put on with the um, direction and curation of Spilia, um, we uh, put on a Native American arts exhibition curated with art from local as well as national artists. So this was a really big opportunity for um, students as well as community members to experience art that they might have not seen before. And uh, on our side of uh, the coin, uh, Tree Fort is a really inclusive environment um, in in the urban setting of Boise. And from from the different, uh, they've they've really broadened their offerings of events since it just started as a music festival eleven or twelve years ago. And it includes um, stand up comedy, podcasting, uh, uh, drag shows, uh, food and and beer um, centered sort of events and tastings um and i mean th there was i don't know about your experience with some of the shows like they oozed positivity and and welcoming and for me now going back and seeing shows where 20 year olds are playing music and it was very encouraging that students were at least exposed um to that kind of thing it wasn't a it wasn't technically a focus of the class but it but it was just it's everywhere um with respect to that environment mm -hmm. Just to make my point, love it. Uh, I just think that it could be in an, anything, but art and culture and history has a way of allowing for equity, inclusion, mm -hmm. belonging, you know, all of that. And so as long as sometimes we think about those types of things and how we use it in that way, too, I think that's helpful. But yeah. very pleased. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you so much. Very impressive and good luck with all your future endeavors. I thank you for sharing. Okay, we're gonna now invite Pepper and the Aspilia Native American Student Council. Pepper, so good to see you, familiar face.
Well, good morning, everyone. It's a little bit different being on this end of the board meetings, but uh, my name is Pepper Huxel, and I am the Native American Indigenous and Rural Programs Coordinator. Um, I have been uh, working with this wonderful group since December 1st, and I feel really fortunate to be able to have this moment to introduce um, to my right, Raylan Williams. She is our president of the Spillyai Native American Student Council. I also have to her right is Dr. Jennifer Slinkard, who is the secondary advisor um, along with myself for the council. And then we have over to our left, many of you have met uh, Kate Geckler um, prior to, she's our retention excuse me, coordinator here at EOU, but she also had served prior to me coming on as a secondary advisor to the council. Um, but now she is also a student again, and she is a Spillyai Club member. So um, I'm going to hand it over to Ray Lynn, and she's going to talk about a lot of different things that they have done this past year, as well as what we're, what we're looking at moving forward. But first, she's going to um, talk about our land acknowledgement. We humbly acknowledge the indigenous people, the Cayuse, Umatilla, Walla Walla, and Nez Pierce, who originally inhabited the land of Eastern Oregon University. We pay tribute to their rich traditions, languages, and stories. Their enduring connection to this land, its waterways, and the community in its reckon is recognized. And we extend our sincere respect to these original guardians of Northeast Oregon. Our mission. Our goal is to enhance recognition, educate, and celebrate the tradi traditions of Indigenous American communities by collaborating with various clubs and organizations at EOU to advocate diversity. Spelia strives to aid incoming Native American students in adjusting to college life and fostering a sense of cultural pride, academic achievement, and leadership amongst all participants in Spelia. In partner with our mission, we've been able to host various events on campus, as well as partner with different org club organizations. One that we're very proud of is the Native American Heritage Month. Um, back in November of 2023, uh, we were, as Hadley mentioned, we were able to host uh, Indigenous Art Reception. Uh, the uh, Indian Arts Funds, uh, we were able to um, use those funds to purchase art to go around campus, as well as bring home a piece of art that was made by an EOU alumni, Delissa Redhawk. Her piece is located in Loso Hall. Um, so yeah, the student, the members uh, toured and viewed many different art um, galleries, uh, one over in Pendleton, the Temascula Cultural Institute in Crow Shadow. Um, and we were able to vote you know, we took pictures of art that we thought would be cool around campus for various students, and then we brought it back to campus and had people vote on what pieces we would like to purchase to go around and display on campus. As well as in November, we were able to bring in an artist, Roman Morello, who spoke um, on his experiences and motivations and inspirations. Um, and we were, we had a uh, art reception in Loso Hall that displayed the art, um, partnered with Hadley from the Student Gallery. Um, and we also provided a chapbook creation workshop hosted by Ram Ramon, as well as um, Jolene Reed, a member of the Native American Rehabilitation Association. She provided a dream catcher workshop. So you'll see some workshops there. Uh, hosted by Marone and Jolene. As well as in November, we hosted the MMIW campaign, which is Missing Murdered Indigenous Women. Um, it's famous for the red dress campaign. Um, it's an interactive display of red dresses being hung around campus to bring awareness to the high rates at which Indigenous women go missing or are found murdered in the US or around the world. Um, fast forward to from November to this winter winter term, um, we were able to partner with uh, 
Confederate Tribes of Umatilla Indian Reservation and received a donation from Amanda Lowe in memory of EOU alumni Bob Floyd. And here we are, spring term, second day of spring term. We have some fun things planned for this term. Uh, first, we're cultivating a supportive campus climate for all students. Um, every Tuesday, there will be a gathering of women in a safe space to share, or for women for a safe place to share, connect, and empower each other. So women's talk, women's talking circle. I invite you guys to join students if you feel led. And yeah, then we also have beginners beating class. I'm going to be open to all students twice a month with a lady in our community, Chantel Peacock, who is a member of the Cholette's tribe here in Oregon. Our first project will be small and we'll be making earrings. So beautiful. I can't have too much beadwork. Um, and then, yeah, eventually working our way towards larger projects that a lot of people are talented in. So beginners workshop and uh, Super fun thing that we're uh, talking about with our club members that's open to all students. We want to cultivate a campus climate, a uh, supportive campus climate with a community garden at EOU. Um, we'll be offering students to work together at the community garden to harvest fruit, vegetables, and or flowers of their choice. And this will be an opportunity to learn about traditional foods, ways of growing, and providing a mental health break to be one with nature. And then next year, so looking ahead into fall of 2024, we'll be partnering with the Grand Ronde Symphony. Um, let's see, uh, this will be hosted on campus uh, from and partnered with James Edmund Greeley. He's part of the Warm Springs tribe. In 2022, he won a Grammy for his beautiful flute music. And we are currently looking for a drum group to comply to partner with and work towards that performance in September. And the moment everybody's been waiting for, bringing back EOU's powwow. This is probably the most talk thin or most engaging thing that I've talked about in, commun in our community um, is bringing back EOU's powwow. This, as we want to host this powwow, it's important to us, and it's super cool that it would be the 50th annual powwow on campus. So we really want to bring that back and host one of our own. Um, <clears throat> along with trying to figure out how to put on a powwow, um, a lot of our, a lot of us and students have volunteered at various powwows in Pendleton. Um, one we re recently volunteered at was Two Cultures, One Community in Pendleton, Oregon. It was a phenomenal experience to learn um, the planning and development of the of a well-run powwow. Um, we partnered with the director of the powwow there uh, prior to actually attending the powwow. And it was cool to see the uh, blueprint of how it all is going to go out, go about but then actually just showing up the day of and hearing the beat of the drum and bringing in students who have never been to a powwow, but be able to experience it on the front lines. And really, yeah, it's just super cool experience. We have Justine, um, who is our vice president. She's pictured there in the blue. Uh, and yeah, she was able to experience, we were able to register dancers and just have a great time and yeah, learn what it takes to put on a powwow. Uh, again, there's just some students. We were able to just be so close to the drum. Um, right there in the middle is the Northern Cree. They're uh, nationally known, uh, have several nominees. Uh, and yeah, we volunteered there. Some more volunteer pictures. There's me. <laughs> And um, some more volunteers' pictures. There's Kiki. She was able to join our group for a few days. We were there for all three days. Pepper was a true trooper driving us over there. So, <laughs> um, 
yeah, again, built, we've built some connections uh, with just different students on campus. Um, we have Indian tacos at Pepper's house. Um, yeah, we're just looking for new members who want to be involved and learn about different cultures. I think it's really phenomenal that we found students who are not not uh, only have are they Native American, but they're relearning their culture, and that is brought to you by EOU's atmosphere and um, you know encouragement and again just awesome faculty and staff. So I think that's super cool. Um, another thing is we're re redesigning um, fundraising efforts. We have this partnership going on with Legacy Ford here in Lake Grand. And hosting a powwow, it can be very expensive and it takes months in preparation. Luckily enough, we are able to partner with Legacy Ford and being able to support not only Spelia program, but also any program through EOU. For every person who purchases a vehicle and they mention they would like to have their EOU donation go towards a specific club or program, um, Legacy Ford will generously donate $500. So I encourage you all to uh, help support our fundraising efforts and share this information with all your colleagues and friends. Our plug for the day is to request for your donation to go towards Spelia in preparation for the powwow in spring of 2025. And I'd like, I think that's all. So I'll close off with any questions. Thank you so much. Yeah, go ahead. Ray, Ray Lynn, I just think for there's a lot I want to do, talk to you about. But first, uh, your degree, what you plan to do for a living, I'd like to hear that one more time because you've, you've impressed me with um, the level of volunteerism and the leadership and all that you're doing. Thank you. I started off uh, attending Eastern to pursue optometry. Um, I've recently switched my major to interdisciplinary studies with a minor in psychology and a minor in Native American studies. I want to pursue mental health counseling, so I've got a, I'm kind of in the shift from wanting to be an optometrist to mental health counseling, um, but I, I believe that my attitude and leadership can help people in both directions, and I'll be an optometrist when I grow up. <laughs> I would just say to the student experience and what you guys are doing um, to enhance the student experience, not just for Native Americans, but for everybody else. Um, how does that make you feel to be part of all of those types of things? And are you seeing kind of the outcomes that you were hoping for? Yes, yes and yes. It's It's been super cool to be a part of um, EOU's community um, through Spelia, but just in broader um, circumstances that I've stepped into rooms that have helped me pursue promoting student involvement as I am a student. Um, I uh, really like that Eastern provides that campus atmosphere to engage as we are a small campus. Is that answering your question? Okay. But how, like, the meaning and the purpose and the things that happen for you and then also the, I'll just say, have, how you've been growing in that way and how you've, I don't know if how much you noticed that you've made a big contribution, but you've been making a big contribution. All of you have, but um, how does that, like, what is it like to be you that way? That is a really interesting question. I haven't really thought about that. So, um, yeah, I... For me, it's important that I represent Alaska Natives. That's where I grew up. I grew up in Bethel, Alaska. So to come here and share that with all of you guys, my experiences, my culture, um, the food, like that to me is m more vital and super important. But also to be on campus, to be a leader in this position, it gives leverage and inspiration to my younger siblings, which I deem is really important. So thank you. I would love to highlight Raylan is also a peer mentor. So she's not just making a difference in the Spelia Club. She's actively working with the student body as a whole. She's really incredible and very humble. <laughs> thank you, Chair. Thank you for your presentation. It's a it's a it's a good group. 
Um, I, just a couple of thoughts. How does your um, the SPIA uh, student council interact with the the other student council, the ASEOU that we have on campus? Um, as far as ASEOU, we've been able to partner with them um, and do events on campus, like in the multicultural center. Um, stress less event was a good event that we were able to partner with them. Um, I know a few of our members are um, senates for the new upcoming year for ASEOU government. So we have some students in interested in that leadership position as student body for this EOU student body. That's great. I just have a follow up if I may. Um, I'm wondering how we communicate all this wonderful work you're doing and the inclusiveness um, back to students who might be prospective students. So your siblings is a really great start, but I wonder what sort of outreach, for example, would you do outreach to other um, um, reservations, CTUIR, Loose, Nez Perce, and, and particularly inviting high school students who are might be in our geographic area to the powwow, for example, to say, you know, we have some things here that might make EOU interesting because we're always working to increase our numbers. And if you're paving the way and making it such a positive experience, it'd be really nice to take advantage and use it as in part a recruitment tool. Yes, I know uh, we have a few resource fairs coming up um, over in Walla Walla. And I think the second one is at the Yellow Hawk Tribal um, place there. I think Pepper can add more on to that as well. Yes, we do have a couple of those coming up um, that are near us. So fortunately, I've been able to reach out to the students to see who would able to also partner with us and come to those events if they don't have anything else going on. Of course, it's school first. Um, I think when, when I'm looking at this program coming into it, you know, I needed to get my bearings, I needed to see where we're at, what we're doing and what what was working effectively before and what what needs to change and where we're going moving forward. Um, and first and foremost, it starts with our students who are here. And um, I can't go outreach if I don't have students here who are doing well. And so I've been working with the Spillei program, um, getting to know these wonderful ladies, and it's been phenomenal. They're all wonderful. Um, we have a few gentlemen who um, we would love to bring them more to our meetings. And you know, when when I first came on, we had four we had four members. Now we're up to thirteen. So I mean, in four months, I mean that's that's pretty good. That's pretty good numbers. But we just need to keep moving forward with that. So with that piece and growing our program, as you can see this spring, we're doing a lot more than we've done in a long time. And so with mm -hmm. those pieces, we're going to integrate that with our current students and we're going to be able to promote that and we're going to be able to talk about it. We're going to be mm -hmm. able to tell people about it. And so I think that's what the recruitment piece where that's going to be. We, we are going to be able to show people, not just talk about it. Nice. Um, again, thank you. Just one last uh, comment. I just want to acknowledge a previous board member, Bobby Connor, um, who's the director of Tomasilic, and I think she would be very pleased to see the progress you're making. I also would say, even though she's really busy, she's a fabulous resource if um, you want to tap into CTUIR and um, other resources. Yep, and also um, just to follow up with that, I have been making connections since December 1, um, connections all around Oregon and different uh, tribal higher, higher education leaders, their schools. Um, I'm looking at partnering right now with Madras High School and doing bringing over a group of uh, students for a preview day. Um, so there's there's a lot going on, a lot of wheels moving and turning, um, but so it's just trying to hone in on, hone in on all of those. Um, I have reached out to Bobby Connor. We had a meeting set up, but unfortunately she had um, something come up. So we're rescheduling that meeting. That was definitely one of my, one of my goals is to uh, make that contact, so. So I really wanna thank you, Pepper, and also uh, members of the Spilia Club. It's great to hear. I mean, you went from four to 13 members in just a few months. So continue to grow. 
and continue to collaborate here on campus. So your presence is much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you for having us. All right. So we are going to move on and now ask uh, for Hunter Sparks and his coach, Dustin Azure to come and tell us all about the uh, NAIA national wrestling title. Um, Hunter, congratulations uh, for your accomplishments. So please tell us all about it. Um, yeah, so I'm Hunter Sparks. Uh, this is my coach, Dustin. Uh, thank you guys for having me here. It's pretty sweet. Um, in regards to the tournament, it, uh, it's still kind of settling in. It's pretty surreal. It's, uh, yeah, I was blessed just to have the opportunity to wrestle here. Um, so yeah, I, I won the national championship at 125 pounds for wrestling in the NAI division. And then I was also blessed to receive the NAIA, uh, outstanding wrestler of the year award for the whole conference. So it's, it's, it's pretty sweet. Uh, yeah, so if uh, I didn't really, everybody else definitely came a lot more prepared. Um, but like, if you guys got questions, that that probably helped me roll a lot, uh, a lot Hunter, better. <laughs> Hunter is also a two-time academic All-American as well. And we just got for the National Wrestling Association for NAI. Uh, EOU had the highest team GPA out of any of the wrestling teams in the NAI as well. So we push cool. Hunter, I'll just, I'll ask a few questions. Number one, um, where are you from? What's your degree? What are you going to do? And then uh, after that, tell me, tell us about what it's like to be you as a wrestler and to have that, that, that experience, that moment to be the champion. Uh, so I was born and raised in Oregon, uh, born in Klamath Falls, moved to Roseburg, Oregon. I was about five years old. Um, and I grew up there, graduated from high school there. Um, Roseburg is also uh, kind of a wrestling powerhouse in Oregon. Um, all four years of my high school, uh, we won state championships there at the 6A level. Um, and I think they won seven state championships in a row. So I was at, from, from five years old, four to five years old, I started wrestling once I moved to Roseburg. Uh, this, is, this was my 20th year of doing it. I've wrestled for a while. Um, and then uh, for colleges, I've uh, kind of been all over. So right out of high school, I wanted to go Division One. That was my dream. Uh, I went to Cal Poly down in San Luis Obispo, uh, attended there for a year. Um, cost was a little bit too much. And then uh, just some other things with my grades and whatever. I was young and immature. So I moved back home. I went to Clackamas Community College for two years, got my associates there. Uh, never, so that was my three years of college wrestling, never saw a starting lineup, uh, was always a second guy. Um, I was behind both years, uh, behind national champions. So they were my drill partners every day. Um, after that, I said I was gonna be done wrestling. I didn't wanna wrestle anymore. Um, and then my assistant coach at Clackamas convinced me to keep going with it. And I ended up getting a scholarship out in Atlanta, Georgia. So I went to Life University for a year. The, they've been a consistent top two team in the NAI. Um, they're really good at wrestling. Uh, and once I went out there, kind of straightened myself up and kind of knew what I finally wanted to do with my life. Um, but Georgia was really far away, so I decided to move back home uh, for my last two years since I had a red shirt year in the COVID year. Um, and talked to Coach Azure here and decided to come out to Eastern Oregon. Um, and then this, uh, this term, I'll graduate with my bachelor's in HHP, so Health Human Performance, uh, and a concentration in exercise science. And then in the fall, I'll be moving to Portland to uh, University of Western States to do my doctor of chiropractic and master's in sports medicine. So, yeah, well, it's, yeah, um, it's, it's been, uh, I think the first thing I said 
when we walked back down into the back mat room after I'd won, gave my hugs and everything, uh, first thing I said was finally, like, uh, like I said, I mean, this is, it's a goal. If you're wrestling, that should be your goal is to be the best you can be and be a national champion. And I've always aspired to have that goal. Um, and it wasn't until my first year at EOU last year that I got to see a starting lineup for a full season. Um, and I ended up getting second place last year uh, in the national finals. So I made it to the finals, uh, but I ended up losing. Um, and after that loss, uh, I mean, it, it wasn't fun, but it kind of drove me to continue working to make sure that I can achieve the goals that uh, I want to accomplish. And um, so, yeah, this year I, I was able to do it just by consistently doing the right things. Uh, a thing we've talked about is just consistency overall. Uh, it's not just being a good wrestler. Um, you know, your diet has to be um, absolutely fantastic and really dialed in. The things you're doing at home, you know, drinking, smoking, none of that's going to fly. It's going to hinder your performance overall. As a team, we actually have our contract. We don't know alcohol, no nothing. Basically, the whole year where we sign a contract, and the thing I like about this team is we're all in for it. We're all on the same page. Like everybody's here to work hard. We all aspire to be national champions individually and as a team, um, which I think uh, we're definitely on the way uh, to getting there. Um, the last this year and last year, I think we only had two All Americans, but we were top thirteen. We got thirteen, twelve, top twelve. We're a top twelve team with only two All Americans, which is pretty pretty impressive at that level. So all it takes is two or three more All Americans, and I genuinely believe we can be a top five team uh, and be uh, not only an NAI powerhouse, but a West Coast powerhouse. Uh, West Coast wrestling is we're we're working our way back up. Um, wrestling is very concentrated in the East, uh, Northeast, and uh, kind of like Great Lakes area. Um, and uh, so, I think we're starting to build our name a name for ourselves out here in the on the West Coast, especially in the NAIA. Uh, we had. Um, about double the, um, what are they called? Allocations. Yeah. Allocations for, uh, nationals there. You basically get a certain amount of kids that can qualify per weight for each conference across the, the U S and the cascade collegiate conference had 60 something. And the next highest was 34. So we about doubled the amount of people we could bring because we had more uh, ranked wrestlers, people with uh, basically tougher wrestlers on this side. Um, but yeah, I think we can uh, we can reach that goal. Uh, it's a hard thing in wrestling. Um, one of the things uh, I I chose EOU for was like I said, I'd been everywhere. I'd been to party schools. I'd been to schools that were really strict. Um, I kind of throughout my career dabbled in everything. And I, I finally noticed, you know, when I said you're doing the consistent things, that's when your wrestling will become better too. And this program just, I, I think we have it figured out. Um, it's just tough competing against some other schools that are, uh, you know, they have the capabilities to pull in, you know, six to seven guys a year and offer them full ride scholarships. Uh, and we're kind of fighting them for that. And we don't really have those opportunities yet to be able to pull in those high level recruits. Um, when I came home, I went on a visit to Southern Oregon and Eastern Oregon, Southern Oregon had actually offered me full tuition and full housing. Uh, but coming out here, I just saw the culture, um, I'm a huge follower of Christ and seeing that um, that Christ-based culture that we have here, not only on the wrestling team, but I think just in LeGrand as a whole, uh, really kind of uh, called me to come here um, because, I, I mean, I've said it in many interviews and many other things like wrestling and all this stuff is fun, but, you know, I'm my identity is in Christ and chasing that relationship first really kind of helped grow everything uh, in all aspects of my life as well. Um, and so that was kind of the main reason I actually came out here. 
Um, I wasn't, I didn't get a full ride, but uh, I was willing to pay a little, a little bit of money because I believed that this would be the program that would help me accomplish my goals, not only as a person, but as a wrestler. And, and sure enough, uh, you know, it, it worked out this year. So uh, yeah, just extremely thankful. It's been kind of a crazy ride. Uh, that was my senior year too. So I'm retired from the sport of wrestling competition wise uh, and uh, looking to start coaching here as soon as I can. Uh, I actually got an assistant job at Clackamas Community College already. So uh, yeah, things are moving forward. It's been a crazy, crazy month. So. All right. We have uh, one more question. Thank you. Um, congratulations on achieving this wonderful personal goal. I had the honor of knowing Roland Schimmel way back in the old days. He was actually one of my teachers. And, and I, I guess what I, I want to emphasize is, is achieving uh, this result um, is going to help you in the rest of your life and in your career. Um, you are going to be recognized as a champion and a leader. So it's going to give you a, e even though this is a great personal goal um, and you've um, accomplished to climb this mountain, it's going to follow you the rest of your life. And, and everybody you interact with is, is going to look up to you and respect you for what you've done. So it, it's actually going to be a bit of a burden for you. <laughs> I mean, that's a burden. I'm I'm here for it. It's pretty exciting. So, but thank you. I I appreciate that. And thank you, Coach, for creating that community and bringing this yonder, wonderful young man to our community. So. Thank you. Well, if there are any more comments or questions, thank you again. Congratulations to both of you, and good luck with all your. Uh, future degrees and things that you will be pursuing. That's wonderful. So thank you. Yeah, thank you guys. Thank you. Yeah. All right, our last item is an update from Student and Academic Affairs regarding ongoing initiatives. So I'd like to invite uh, VP Colleen Dan Cassio and Provost Peter Geisinger, along with uh, Kathleen Brown, who is Associate Director for Early College Initiatives. So please go ahead. And we still have about 15 minutes, so we're okay. Because yeah. I don't think we have. Yeah. yeah. The food will not go away. Yeah. <laughs> It'll be okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, good almost afternoon, right? Um, thank you for having us today. Um, we want to talk about uh, the collaboration between academic and student affairs and the initiatives that we're working on at this time. We were going to, uh, as we talked, we thought, well, it's really hard to separate them out because we're working not only with academic and student affairs, but also with finance and administration, and we're working with DEIB. Um, so uh, it's a great opportunity, and we have several initiatives that we do want to share. Um, if you wouldn't mind advancing the slide, maybe. Up and down arrow? No. Hmm. Oh, there we went. Sorry for this technical issue. Here we go. All right. We are working on mentor program, which I'll share a little bit more about. We're working, uh, we're going to share with you transfer council information, smart stop initiative, academic advising. We're going to talk a little bit about what we're doing with uh, Title III. And then Kathleen Brown is going to share the early college initiatives. So I'll start off with the mentor program. Uh, Peter Geisinger, Leanne Case, Beanie Moses, and myself are working on an institutional mentoring program that will uh, support students transitioning to EOU uh, for fall, winter, and spring terms. 
this program will support incoming students beginning fall term of 2024. We are at the initial stages of that and uh, we're working on freshmen this year and our goal and objective will be to develop that program and then um, next year start working about on sophomore and junior senior moving forward um, so that we have every student on campus having a mentor in some capacity. Uh, when we came together, we recognized uh, that there are many pockets of mentoring occurring across campus. And in an effort to synthesize these efforts, we are in the process of an audit across campus, um, asking uh, for asking our colleagues for handbooks, training manuals, whatever they might have with regard to their specific mentor program and asking them to share that information with us. Uh, we will um, then work with, um, with the information that's shared and look at what we can utilize and obviously ask for permission to use their documents to create a cohesive and comprehensive mentor program across campus. So um, waiting on those documents to come in, I'm gonna be sending out a reminder tomorrow um, because I sent it out right before break. So most people probably haven't even gotten to those emails yet. So I'll send out that information. Um, so that's where we are in our mentor program. And um, Peter's gonna talk to you about the transfer council and other items. Uh, thank, thank you, Colleen. Yeah, I'll try to be quick. I, I'll try at least, yeah. <laughs> but uh, so the Transfer Council is an initiative that came out of the EAB Moonshot Project. And uh, what it does is to really look at all issues related to transfer, barriers, processes, articulation agreements, and so on and so on. It's not there to evaluate individual students transferring. This will continue to be done in the registrar's office, who are going to be, of course, an important part of this uh, this transfer council. So they're convening for the first time at the end of the month of, of April. Invitations have gone out of the team with a broad representation to make sure we'll, we'll capture everything, anything where transfer, our current policies, rules, regulation, and so on, are inhibiting transfers. And we also have representations, of course, from student services because uh, transfer is also a thing, you know, in terms of finding a, a home campus, you know, where you can be your best, where you can be productive. So we'll keep you posted on how, how the discussion is going, but I think it's going to be a very exciting initiative. And next thing uh, I mentioned already, the Smart Stop. So it came out. Uh, on student surveys, you know, that they were not happy, you know, having to run from building to building, yada, 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 office to office to get answers and being pushed around. It also came out, you know, and the student success strategy team with their presentation yesterday, that one of the central strategies, you know, for, for improving student success is actually having such a, a resource conveniently available in one stop where they can get the answers that they need. So the president has asked about us uh, thinking about such a one stop called smart stop where students can get get the answers. And we are currently assembling a list of frequently asked questions, you know, from all kinds of offices to see what are those questions that we ask and anybody who is going to be staffing the smart stop and that's a short, small committee is working on it. Uh, we'll have to answer those. We can do training. We train them on those base questions to avoid that that runaround that we have. The plan is now, yes, to have some specialists in there. Again, everybody's broadly trained on these 100 or 150 or 100 <laughs> generally asked questions, but they can provide information on, on finances, student accounts. There's information on registration, of course. Advising is going to be represented all the time there. Then uh, student services, of course, will be represented. You know, it's important. It should be an important catchment point of questions that may get into areas where, where referrals are still needed if it's Title IX related. Nevertheless, we, it's all part of the training we have there. We're also thinking of a representative there about campus life and community life. I mean, to ask those questions, you know, about things that are going on, but also, well, 
oh my goodness, uh, I have my muffler is <laughs> fell fell off. But where do I go? What do I do? You know. So just to provide, really try to capture all aspects of it. We know we have to provide value for students, so they actually go there. They find it a valuable resource. As we heard yesterday from the student success team, it also has to be inviting. It's not just a stale, stale, it's just a mechanical source of, of information, but it's really also uh, about inviting and giving a, a notion or an idea or preference to hang out there and find things there. So BD Moses had great ideas, for example, the food pantry that they're running, that could be part of it. And just things like this to make it welcoming and yeah, not, not threatening for them to go there. Okay, yeah, academic advising, yeah, I mentioned that briefly too. We're launching a, a restructuring of academic advising, again, for more advising continuity for students. That also will hopefully free up faculty from, for more recruitment and mentoring tasks, actually, and, and concentrating advising more on the, the professional advisors so they can play this role from the beginning to the very end uh, of a student's career. So that is launch meeting is, again, uh, working with EAB. They'll come to campus, and they, it's on April 16th, where we have an expanded team that represents all kinds of issues related to advising and concern. Because, again, just like mentoring, advising takes place all over in various forms already, whether it's in student clubs and they peer advise them. Athletics has a great job with the students that they, that they advise, you know, in terms of more student success type things. So everybody will be presented, we'll capture those, and then a small core team will continue to, to work on how to implement this actually in detail. So I think, again, this is uh, like Trustee Mendoza asked, you know, <laughs> really it's part of the comprehensive look that we're just doing now. So many aspects of our operations and processes that we have, but with the singular focus, you know, on student success. So, oh, title three, Colleen? Yeah, yeah, pass it on to Colleen then. Yeah, thank you. Um, just um, a couple of initiatives that we're working on. We have the first year experience program. We are look, working with Nate Lau and some others to identify how do we move forward with that. Um, uh, so we're, we're in conversation about that. Uh, and then we also have the experiential learning program that we, uh, both Peter and I, uh, shared information last board meeting with regard to where we are. Um, and so we're moving forward with getting these um, meetings scheduled to move to see how can we move forward and continue the great work that's um, occurring. And then it's Kathleen. I'm fully aware I'm between you and your lunch, so I'm going to go as fast mm. as I can. Um, so um, uh, you actually have two worksheets or whatever handouts um, at your um, desk. The first one I highlighted because I have ADHD, so I don't want to read that entire thing any more than I have to. So I highlighted the portion that um, that uh, Peter actually asked me to um, uh, highlight. Uh, one of the things that we are as uh, Eastern is a sponsored dual credit school. We're actually going through our HEC realignment and our accreditation right now, just finished, um, and hopefully he's signing really soon um, so, uh, so that I can send that to uh, the HEC. Um, but basically, Basically, um, uh, the sponsored dual credit is a little different than dual credit. So when um, a school is a dual credit school, basically a dual credit fac or dual credit teacher at a high school could be hired by the school by Eastern as a regular faculty member, whether that be an adjunct or somebody else. They have all the all the credibility or all the education and everything that they need for that. A sponsored dual credit teacher has specific information that they need to teach the course that they are going to teach at the collegiate level, but then they have a faculty member that will be over the top of them and making sure that they are teaching collegiate level work. Um, and so we have faculty members um, that in all of the different areas that we actually teach if they are doing sponsored. We are only sponsored dual credit. Um, so even if a teacher comes and is um, extremely educated um, and can do it and really doesn't need us, yes, they do. They get to have a PLC leader. Um, so um, my position uh, supports that teacher via a faculty member, and they might not have as much of the um, need for as much support, but as a general rule, they're going 
going to need that. So um, what I've given you is what higher education has given us. And in the highlighted area, it's specific to sponsored dual credit. So you are aware if you hear um, that um, someone's saying they have to have a master's degree in the specific area, no, they don't. Um, that is if it was a dual credit teacher um, that specifically was not going to have any support from any of our faculty. Um, what we think is a better um, uh, model is the sponsored dual credit because even if you are highly educated, you do not understand uh, what the culture of Eastern is. Um, and we want them to um, be um, showing Eastern to these students because these are future mountaineers. Um, we call them mountaineers in training. And so we take that um, great pride in that at ECI and we want them to be able to recognize that they are a leg of us as Eastern and we want them to guide them to us if this is the right fit for them. So that is what that is. This is, has Anna on it. <laughs> um, yeah, um, so um, this is the requirements to teach all of the different things that can be taught at the high school level. And so these did not go through me, I promise. Um, these go through the faculty that are um, the PLC lead for every single one of those areas. So um, nothing is done from my office that makes any decision whatsoever on collegiate level um, decision making. Everything goes through the faculty member of that specific specific um, uh, task. Uh, we, uh, one example, I have anthropology, which I'm really excited about, um, is wanting to do a dual credit as well. Um, and so I'm able to go, so this is what I need from you. So I am the administrative leg of this. Um, I am not, I make no decisions. I um, support the deans and the provost and the, pro, um, and the faculty to determine what is going to happen so that we can feel confident that the academic rigor that's going on at the schools is going to actually prepare the student because I don't want to handicap them just because they got an easy credit at their um, high school. That is absolutely not the goal of ECI or dual credit. So there now i get to highlight right okay um so i am happy to be the associate director uh we are having a little bit too much fun in our positions um so i don't think there is such a thing but we're having a blast um we have five um institutes summer institutes that are going to go on uh this summer right now we have 55 students already in them um so we are excited about that it is only april and we just sent out 985 um packets um to students so that we can fill those all up uh, we started three of them last year. The goal is to um, uh, to increase the number that came last year and then also to support Cottonwood Crossing and um, Eastern Oregon Teacher Academy. Uh, one of the goals I remember of a previous provost was to have everything under one person um, so that it was organized. And so honestly, our faculty could just enjoy themselves and the administrative part would go under that person. I am that person. Um, so everything, all the little nuances go through my office and then I talk to all of the different areas areas that are on our campus so everything runs smoothly and the faculty don't have to worry about that and they can just really enjoy their expertise um, and it allows them to um, volunteer significantly quicker to me than um, at any other time. We also had three Mountie Connects, and what that is is basically we go out to um, the region. We had Mountie Connect in Hermiston, Prairie City, Chris came to uh, Prairie City, um, and Baker, and we are looking at doing one in also in Nyssa. And what this allows us to do is go to those areas and take our faculty there and bring students to our faculty, but in their region. Um, we uh, have had 17 schools represented in those three Mountie Connects, and 1,060 students actually came to the Mountie Connects. Um, uh, we actually had, uh, a, a, excuse me, had a collaboration with the careers in Baker. And so it was 750 kids just at that one Mountie Connect, which was a little overwhelming, um, but, but highly successful. Um, faculty outreach, um, we have organized that significantly so that um, faculty don't have to plan anything. They basically just go. Again, the goal is for them to really enjoy going to the high schools. We had 710 students have been to, um, interacted uh, directly with the faculty at faculty visits at 12 different schools. Um, so that's been highly successful. Um, basically, we do all of the really annoying administrative work <laughs> so they don't have to. <laughs> um, and we are the ones that interact with the um, high schools so that they don't have to worry about, um, am I in class? Am I doing this? We're doing all of that behind the scenes and who is the person to talk to. So we're doing all of that behind the scenes. Uh, George Mendoza and Kelly and um, President Ryan, sorry, um, uh, uh, 
got together and said they wanted a hub at LeGrand High School. <laughs> and so we made a hub at LeGrand High School. It's our first one. It's our pilot. And basically what we have is a room at LeGrand High School. And um, we have an admissions person that goes on Mondays and I go every Thursday. Um, and we have students and faculty come to that one spot. We had a uh, eight weeks faculty spotlight. So they actually came and they come from 11 o'clock to one o'clock over the kind of the lunch period in two classes. And we had two 200 plus students come to that. Um, I was a little worried when those disappeared that they would not come. I had 35 students in there um, last Thursday and I could not get rid of them quick enough saying um, you have to go to fifth period. Um, so uh, what that allows me to do is have freshmen all the way up to seniors. I have a group that comes and sees me every single Thursday no matter what. Um, and that group is kind of my little group that invites other people. And then there's other students that go, well, shoot, there's like 25 people in there. I should go in there. We have hot chocolate. We have um, games. I'm about to take some board games from my house over there. And one of the students said, it is one of the only places I can just come to relax for a few minutes. Um, we want them to be able to see Eastern in a positive light, but then also be able to ask me questions. So they come to do their applications, they come to do their scholarships, they come to do pretty much anything that they need or have random questions for. Um, one of the parents of one of our students at LeGrand High said, my freshman was previously not even uh, worrying about their schoolwork, and now he is actually thinking about college classes and what might be uh, next to come. Um, so I see that as a success. Um, registration is up. In 2022-23, we had 984 unique students that were taking high school classes from us um, at the ECI level, either on campus, online, or at their high school. We have 1,127, and I have three more weeks to get more registered, and I know I at least have to get 50 more registered. Um, so <laughs> I'm positive it'll go up. So um, at the course level, we had 158 courses created at the high schools, um, and then we, had 70, we have 71 partners right now, school partnerships. 86 schools had students actually coming to us, so I even have growth that I already know is there that I now can reach out to specific schools where they already have um, students that are um, interacting with, with us. We work with homeschool kids, public uh, kids, charter schools, um, uh, and anything private, I don't care. If you're in high school or you remotely want to go to college I will, and you're under 18, I will work with you and figure out a way for you to um, uh, be uh, helped at from Eastern. Um, we will on April 10th, which is next Wednesday, so that's why I'm a little hyper because I have to plan that. Um, it, we're having our first annual dual credit barbecue. We have invited 985 students. Um, they have praised God are not all coming, uh, but we will. Oh, <laughs> But if they did, I would have it planned, so it wouldn't be a problem. But um, uh, we have 985 students were um, uh, asked to come um, so that they can be celebrated, so that we can celebrate all of our dual credit students. Now, if a student did not register for the class because they get that option to protect their GPA, they were still invited to it. Um, and so there's actually um, probably more than 985 that were invited. Um, every single student that was even remotely near a dual credit class was invited to it. Um, we have um, at least least 40 partners from across the campus that will be um, involved in that. Um, they are excited like we are because, again, they're not worried about the administrative part of it. That's what our jobs are. And one of our teachers in our uh, schools, because we have three specialists, not counting myself, and I'm also in Hermiston High School um, and LeGrand High School and anything outside the region that is um, like uh, David Douglas and Gresham. Um, one of the teachers said the specialist positions and personal touch are critical they are the reason schools want to be, to work with EOU. Um, and I don't think I have anything else. I tried. Um, I know you're hungry. So any questions? Just um, probably more on the personal side. I'm um, really pleased, really pleased with all that you're doing, all the outreach. And uh, I would love to hear later on, probably sometime early next school year or next for EOU and for, for schools, um, how much the hubs and how much the outreach paid off into increased matriculation rates and registration enrollment, all of that. Because um, I feel like you're doing a lot and my sense is it's probably going to create uh, significant growth. Yeah, we're looking at fourth week of fall. 
um, to understand what our matriculation rates are. We tag team heavily with our admissions counselors. That has been a huge advantage because ECI's focus is um, eighth grade to 11th grade, and then, it, and then we shift them to admissions, but we're there to support them when an admissions counselor is not there. I know everybody wants to, to have a break, but I just, uh, it was just such a pleasure getting to come in and be a, a get lunch guest at the Mountie Connect in Prairie City. It was a beehive of activity. All of the schools had students there, came from Monument, Long Creek, Dayville, as well as Prairie City and Grant Union. And uh, I think there were at least 10 faculty that were um, presenting. And it was a the energy level was tremendous and the, the feedback, I stood in the hallway and kind of listened to people talking and talked with students and and um, it was probably, I have to say, um, probably the best EOU event that I've ever seen in Grant County. It was fantastic and you, you guys are uh, tremendous representatives doing a phenomenal job of organization, thank so you. thank you. It's very successful. Uh, just a, a note, um, well done, all of you. And I, this is my fourth year on the board. And I think for the first three years, I kept saying, are you actually going to these schools and talking to these kids? And you are. So well done. Thank you. for. <laughs> I'm looking forward to um, to see your numbers, but well done. Thank you. And I just want to uh, bring my perspective as one of the faculty members that participated at least in two of those. And so to have to have you make that connection to the schools and for us to just bring whatever expertise, that makes it so much easier. And so that, that's, that's wonderful. That's a great improvement because it, you will see that people will be, you know, faculty will be encouraged to participate because to reach out to the schools and all the logistics, that's, that's the tough part. <laughs> to show up and work with the students, that's the pleasure you know of doing that so it was wonderful thank you any other comments or any so i did have go, one thing i apologize um i put cords around uh the room uh, please don't take them but um because i need them back but these are actually being given to every single senior that has taken 15 credits or more from eastern um at the barbecue and uh we didn't want to just give them honor cords we wanted them to make sure that they were eastern honor cords and one of the things that is selling um eci and i just got this today because i really like it is Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> is swag. The difference between a school that um, students know about and, the, and um, a uh, school that students uh, don't know about is swag. Mm -hmm. um, so I buy a lot of it and I have a grant that allows me to and we get it out to those students so that they're happy to wear them to all the events that they're at and we have Eastern all over the place. So Very cool. Well, thank you to all the three of you for the updates and all great uh, work going on. So thank you for sharing. And I don't think the, I don't know if there are any other items of discussion. I think we're probably pretty ready for a break. So I just want to, um, first of all, thank everybody for uh, your participation and engagement. I also want to remind that the uh, committee, ASA committee will reconvene on Tuesday, April 30th. And with this, I call this meeting to be adjourned. <laughs>
12, and um, I will call the Governance Committee meeting to order. It's Tuesday, April 2nd. My name is Tamara Mabbitt, and I am the committee chair. Uh, Mr. Secretary, would you call the roll call, please? Certainly. Uh, uh, committee members, please respond when I call your name. Anna Cavanato. Present. Christine Cronin. Present. Gary George. Not present. Tamara Mabbitt. Present. Brad Stevens. Present. Maurizio Valerio. Running back. <laughs> uh, Madam Chair, we have a quorum. Thank you, Chris. Um, if you could, would you like to start us off with some opening announcements? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, I'll start with some housekeeping announcements. I'll have a little few more substantive ones at the end. Uh, we ask everyone to please put your cell phones on Do Not Disturb. Members of the media, if you haven't already done so, please sign the sign-in sheet at the recorder's desk to my left. Likewise, anyone present in person who wishes to give public comment, please be sure to sign the sign-in sheet at the recorder's desk. To provide access to the public, uh, the public have been invited to attend in person and this meeting is being live streamed over the internet. Speakers must use the tabletop microphones, which are the only way the people on the live stream can hear what we say. Uh, they're also important for proper amplification within this room. Uh, please make sure the mic is within approximately four inches of your mouth uh, so it picks up properly. And also, if we have more than four mics on at a time, uh, the whole system cuts out. So if you're not speaking, please turn your mic off. If you brought a laptop or device, please be sure the speakers and microphone are turned off. And if you're joining us remotely, please keep yourself muted uh, unless speaking. Uh, trustees, in, uh, you, in front of you, you should have your meeting agenda and travel reimbursement forms. Please sign the travel form and return it to Susanna Moore. Uh, seated to my left by the end of the meeting. Uh, the board, and if you don't, yeah, if you don't have those, just let us know. Uh, and the board received no written public comments for this meeting. We also did not receive requests to give oral public comment by remote means. Uh, no one signed up in advance to give uh, oral public comment in person. Uh, but uh, if there are those present who wish to, they'll have an opportunity to sign the sign-in sheet and participate in that portion of the, in the public comment portion of the meeting. Um, I have a few uh, more substantive announcements. Uh, with the retirement of Lori Baird at the end of February, Susanna Moore has stepped up to provide assistance to the committee. Uh, Tim Seidel and I are grateful for her thoughtful and energetic help. Uh, now that the board has adopted the video recordings of board meetings as the official record, uh, approval of minutes will no longer be a feature of the meeting consent agenda. Uh, last Wednesday, all trustees received emails from AGB Consulting. Uh, those emails contained links to the evaluation form for this year's comprehensive board evaluation. Uh, it's essential that all trustees click on the link provided and complete the evaluation by at the very latest Friday, uh, April 12th. Uh, and I, I just want to check, just because it's useful feedback. Did you all actually see that email? <laughs> okay. And um, have any of you started filling out the evaluation? Brad's on there, Cedric. Okay. Great. Well, just keep that in mind. <laughs> um, yeah. And I think that's... Yes, that concludes my announcements. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Chris. Um, does anyone else have any other announcements? No? Okay. Um, I do not have any extra remarks. Um, Chris and I spent a little phone time over the last couple of weeks, and I think Chris has a pretty full agenda for us today. Um, so and, and we have no one who signed up for public comments. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct. Okay. So let's see where I go here. Now, yeah, we are. We're going to go to the foundation. 
Uh, okay, so we're going going to the Foundation and Alumni Association update, which is informational only. And I see Tim Seidel coming up. Thank you, Chair Mabbitt. Mm -hmm. uh, for the record, Tim Seidel, Vice President of University Advancement here at Eastern Oregon University. The uh, addition of uh, a brief update um, for this committee from the or about the foundation and alumni association activities is just to keep you all appraised of what is happening um, with those groups It kind of came out of the last full report we did at the, the board meeting. Um, and the intent is just to give you a kind of an update of what's happening so you don't find out about something later and say I didn't know. Um, so just to give you a roundup and it's in the, um, uh, the staff report, um, the uh, in February, the, the board of directors held their quarterly meeting. Uh, we did actually hybrid. We did it in Portland um, as we were down there for some other meetings uh, and had some folks back here. So we, we did it at one of our um, trustees offices in uh, in downtown Portland, which was, which was really gracious of him to host us there. Uh, they talked about uh, goals um, for the foundation and that included an increase in strategic engagement opportunities with alumni. Um, and some more collaboration uh, of efforts between the Alumni Association, uh, the Foundation, and the Mountaineer Athletic Association. So we're, we're starting off on that course already. Um, and then further, uh, you at the last meeting, uh, you several of you asked if we could get um, uh, letters to you all uh, around giving to the foundation. So we executed on that um, and we distributed those to the um, uh, to the boards, all of them, actually, the Alumni Association Board, the Foundation Board, and the Governing Board. Uh, upcoming events for the Foundation include an alumni gathering at the Jackalope Jamboree um, uh, in uh, Umatilla County. That'll be kind of fun. That'll be a new thing. It, it was approached to us, and we thought, well, let's try it and, and see if there's an opportunity to engage with some of our alumni in that region and increase that visibility back to one of the goals uh, that the board has. Uh, and then we're also executing on our spring annual fund appeal. And we're converting that to both a print and a digital um, campaign in conjunction with Mountaineer Athletics to encourage some competitive giving between the sports to try to help um, provide some additional resources for those teams. As you might have heard the wrestling program even talk about, so they're looking for some serious resources. But if we can get started on that with some additional giving from some of our alumni uh, and friends, we will certainly be uh, happy about that. And then we're coordinating our meetings all together for the upcoming Blue and Gold weekend. Um, which will be taking place immediately following your full May board meeting uh, of the Governing Board of Trustees. Um, looking ahead a little bit further, we are doing our annual uh, alumni event at a upcoming Timbers game in Portland at Providence Park. Uh, we're going to do a twofold. We'll do an event kind of prior to that for folks who um, it works better for their schedules to to be there. And then we'll do a, an event at the actual um, soccer game. Um, we usually are down on the, what's called the Widmer deck, which is kind of right down by the um, one of the end zones, one of the goals. Mm -hmm. And uh, we can watch the game right from there. It's a really nice informal kind of get together um, with alumni from that region. And then finally, plans are underway for homecoming, um, scheduled October 10th through the 12th. And this year, we're really working um, on a 50th anniversary reunion for the classes of 1972 to 1976. I don't know if there's anybody in the room here who might be from that era. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so we'll have some folks. Um, uh, we'll be reaching out about that. Um, we're working with some uh, some uh, some longtime alumni and, and members of the Foundation Board of Trustees who wanted to get rolling on this. So we're excited about getting new names and finding folks we haven't really connected with and then um, engaging with those alumni we already have on our lists. Uh, that'll be uh, quite an event that we'll be putting together with them, not only a reception, but then it'll be a full hosted dinner um, that we're looking at doing um, and finding the location for it because if, if, we, if they get everything they want, we're looking at you know a couple hundred, two, three hundred people at that event. So we're trying to figure out a great place to meet them and have them and host them uh, and, and, and uh, really turn this into a really uh, significant event. So we're excited about that and there's fundraising components of, of it as well to create some endowed scholarships. So we're excited about that. Uh, and then finally, just one last piece of information. It was in the, the report too, in case you didn't catch it though, but we're really excited because for the first time in the foundation's history, um, we'll have over $1 million in total scholarship um, funds to award to students. So we're really excited about that. So I can stop there and ask there any questions. Wow, that, it's very exciting. I read that Sunday, I think. Any questions for Tim? 
I, I'd just like to make a comment. I, I actually volunteered this year to review the applications for, for scholarships, which was fun. I ended up having 110, but it was online and it worked well. But it's so impressive how motivated our students are, how much they appreciate Eastern, the small classes, the closest of the professors. It's very rewarding to, to, to uh, read that and to know that. So anyways, foundation's doing a great job. Well, thank dollars. you. And those are probably some of the most significant um, stories you can hear from students. And when stories receive a, when students receive a scholarship, they also give us back a letter that we share with the donors. And those are really, come sometimes are really hard to read. They're moving um, because you realize how, how powerful that scholarship is for that student. It's going to change their life and what it means for them. Um, and that's, what, that's why it's great to have folks like you read it. So thank you for spending your time doing that. I just wanted to clarify, I was a very young student at that point. <laughs> very, very young. I, I called out no names, so no. Yes. <laughs> well, we have your name on the list. Yes, absolutely, Cheryl. Thank you. Uh, Tim, did I read in your report that you're in the process of recruiting a director, executive director for the yes. foundation? Okay, mm -hmm. good. Yep, and new executive director, and hopefully we'll be doing some interviews here shortly. Perfect. Great. Thank you. Any other questions for Tim? He has the next agenda item as well. Are you ready for your next one? Sure. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so this is our political landscape update, um, really follow up from the uh, short legislative session. Um, and we we finished we finished it out. Um, it actually ended a few days early, which was which was nice. There was a lot of variables during the session, even some concerns there might be some walkouts um, and things. But uh, what we saw um, and, and President Ryan and I were down there a number of times meeting with legislators. It was really more of a commitment from legislators to try to get to some of these um, solutions, and they they did. They spent a significant amount of time early part of the session really talking about um, changes to Measure 110 um, and investments in, in housing to try to deal with some of the issues on the statewide level. Uh, and they did finally make get some motion, get some movement on that. And there was really some compromise in there, which was, um, I think, healthy for the, the session itself and the legislature. Um, it did yield, yield mixed results for Oregon's public universities. Um, we didn't see some things get funded um, in the in the end, but uh, we had some other minor successes that um, uh, I can I'll talk about. Um, so the the strong start funding these are resources we have used um, at Eastern to help really with our summer bridge programs and and many of the things you heard Peter um, uh, talking about earlier. That that funding did not come through this session. Um, we're going to make another run at it. It's certainly a priority for the next full session, and we'll be really talking um, to legislators about how important it is. Uh, another another one that we really is a little bit disappointed. We thought it had a lot of momentum going into the session was the um, the student basic needs package. Um, we had our students working on on it as well as students from across the state. We had a lot of good feedback on it, but at the end, it it just didn't make it. It did move um, out of joint ways and means, <clears throat> but it did not uh, get included in in the omnibus package. And that included funds for um, uh, food scarcity issues, for scarcity programs, the hunger hunger programs um, on campuses, and open educational resources. Um, um, and again, we'll, we'll be looking at being added back onto the agenda for the next, for the 2025 session. Uh, in behavioral health, um, that was a collaborative project between um, Eastern, Western, Oregon Tech, and Southern University, Oregon universities, as well as Portland State universities, to try to address the, the real needs for uh, uh, behavioral health workforce. Uh, particularly for us, it was about re Eastern Oregon and how we can help deliver those programs, the programs that we've launched at Eastern and our, our upcoming Masters of Social Work, but are also implemented in full cohort uh, Masters of, of Clinical Mental Health Counseling. Um, we received six hundred and sixty-six thousand um, dollars for those for that program to help invest um, for Eastern, um, and the other schools received as, as much. Um, and Portland State received a double that, so a much larger program. Uh, but that was a good success, um, and and actually brought about more questions for uh, another policy option package we're collaborating on going into the twenty twenty-five session for additional resources. And for Eastern, it's really helpful because mm -hmm. our programs are already being stood up, and we're ready to you know, bring more students into those programs. And that's um, helping us drive some visibility at a real statewide level of how we're delivering to the region. 
Um, and then there were some strategic investments in semiconductors, um, semiconductor talent and workforce. Uh, Eastern doesn't see a whole lot of this. Um, we, we're like the Silicon Desert, uh, I call it, out here, as opposed to the Silicon Forest in the Portland area. Um, there was some talk at one point about relocating a, a semiconductor chip plant maybe out in the Hermiston area. We were real excited about that, but we didn't get any traction on it. Um, but that did receive some funding um, that's being distributed to those schools with a real focus on um, semiconductor chip manufacturing. Um, and there may be some funds that we'll get, I think, access to um, for like some things like cybersecurity. Uh, some some continuing continuing on, some of the um, policy bill updates that I think we were particularly interested here was one we called the governance bill. Um, that bill did not pass out of uh, the full Ways and Means Committee. It went out of the Higher Education Committee, but it went to join Ways and Means and then because that had some fiscal impacts on it. Um, but it did not uh, receive any further action, and so it, uh, it therefore died in committee. Uh, the House uh, Bill 4154, that was the semiconductor one. That was that was a larger bill. It was packaged down um, and reduced um, where we're seeing some um, line item allocations for the four, four universities and two community colleges to invest in that. But some additional fixes to some technical bills. Uh, and the, 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 a bigger one is the uh, education omnibus bill that was Senate, Senate Bill 1552. That includes funding for a direct admissions um, program for community colleges and public universities. So we need to adopt rules to make that happen. So we're involved in that process of what that would look like. Um, it transferred responsibility um, for implementation on the Oregon Opportunity Grant um, to the HEC. Um, requiring HEC rulemaking um, for calculation of state rates. And that was coming out of some changes it had made and st the calculations had changed and some folks didn't like it. So we had kind of come to a compromise there. Um, we did some technical fixes to the Oregon op Oregon's Open Educational Resources Program. Um, and then we also looked at um, applied baccalaureate programs and whether or not they can be funded. Originally, when they were set up for community colleges, they had to be funded outside of the of state resources and looking at now how we can include some of those. Um, a lot of it's coming down to workforce issues in particular in, in, in regions where they, they're trying to find teachers or nurses um, and others to really help bolster their, their current workforce and how can we fast track that through maybe an applied baccalaureate program through a community college. And um, there's challenges with that as well because then there's, we're, there's more competition um, as well between the universities and the community colleges. Um, I don't think that they would probably want us to start offering a lot of associate's degrees, um, for example. Uh, and so we're kind of trying to balance uh, trying to balance that out. Uh, and then there was some clarification on our, on our faculty and part-time healthcare benefits um, uh, guidance that we were able to put together. But that was one one of the classic uh, omnibus packages where a lot of things get added into. And that's what we saw at the end of this session, just a lot of big projects. Uh, in my staff report, there's also a list of other projects that were funded in there. Um, in, in essence, um, we, were, we were we came out, I think, in a fairly level area level um, from the from the session. We didn't receive a lot of funding, but we also didn't get cuts. Um, and we didn't see a lot of bad policy packages that really negatively, in fact, impacting the university come through. We also didn't see a lot of good policy. Um, so it was really kind of a flat session, I think, um, in regards for, for higher education in Oregon. Uh, what are our next steps? That is, that is definitely um, planning for the 2025 session. We have a lot of work to do in between now um, and the uh, and the start of the session because there's deadlines coming up as early as July for when we have to have materials to submit. And then there's bills that have to be, uh, bill drafts have to be submitted um, if we're gonna move any specific legislation forward. Um, we're working a lot, like I said, with the other universities um, on on uh, consortiums and, and making sure that we're all going in this together. So we really try not to get off on one thing. You know, somebody, Eastern's doing something over here, it's completely in opposition to maybe what they're doing at Western or Portland State. And we're just trying to make sure to collaborate. And the presidents have really set that, that course for us. They want us to work together and um, make sure that we're not just doing our own things. Um, and I can stop with there and see if there's any questions. I Tim, I'm, I'm just curious about the transfer of responsibility for the Oregon Opportunity Grant to the HEC. Um, is, first of all, is that going to positively or negatively or at all affect EOU since we, we work really closely with two, you know, community colleges? And then um, just what was the thinking on that? I don't, I don't quite understand it. Sure. 
Um, it goes to some calculations that were updated um, in terms of how you're calculating the Oregon Opportunity Grant for students uh, based on the cost of attendance um, versus the cost of, of tuition. And so one of the, actually the last change was made to actually I guess you could look at it as in terms of favoring students attending the universities because it it, it made um, it provided them more resources, which meant there were fewer resources um, available for students attending community colleges. Um, the calculation was actually it's more fair in a lot of ways when we looked at it because it meant that that we were taking a look at the total cost for students attending a university, which is different than students cost uh, attending a community college. Um, we could go back and we went, you know, back and forth on it. We talked uh, with folks uh, about it. Ultimately, elected to you know, probably through the rulemaking process. That seemed to be one of the underlying issues that it seemed feel folks were feeling that it was a little arbitrary. Um, I think you could argue that point, but if it moves into the heck and it has to go through a rulemaking process and it's very public and, and a very public process and a very open process and there's opportunities for people to provide um, their their opinions on it. So it's almost like a legislative process, but then the rule goes into place and it's not just being made by one group or one board. And, and the impact would be, um, we'll, we were watching that very carefully what the impact may be. Now the good news is we're continuing to get more money and push more money into the Oregon Opportunity Grant overall. I, I, I'm sorry, I have a question um, about these uh, funding allocations like the behavioral health workforce investment and, and others. Are those like a one-time allocations or do you anticipate that they would be recurring uh, so that they can sustain uh, those programs? These are primarily one-time fundings. One-time. Mm -hmm. Unless otherwise indicated, they're really one-time fundings. Um, now, again, we may go back and talk about what we need to continue on um, you know, providing resources for a specific program. Okay, thank you. Uh, just a, a question, the elections in November, are they gonna have any impact to what happens um, in the state legislature? Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, on the and on the state level, um, we have two you know the two Senate positions that are in Eastern Oregon um, that were formerly or currently held by Senator Hansel and Senator Finley. They're both retiring and won't be running again. So their replacements um, will be impactful for Eastern Oregon University. And then overall, the the larger elections across the state will be impactful. But we'll be looking at um, who's moving into held seats, um, not only from legislative leadership. Um, for example, uh, there's a new Speaker of the House, um, Julie Fahey. Um, she's from uh, obviously from the west side, from, from the Portland area. Um, we expect uh, Rob Wagner to stay as the Senate president, probably not see a lot of changes there. But the makeup of the House and the Senate will, will really be watched. We don't see a lot of tipping um, one way or the other, but the new folks that we'll be working with, Mm -hmm. Yeah, that'll be that'll be impactful, and we have a you know list of folks we'll be visiting with um, who may be you know coming into those seats, so they're aware of what Eastern's priorities are and what higher education is. But yes, and then uh, that's just on the state level, let alone what might happen on the national level. Right, there'll be a lot more discussion that. I have a quick question about the omnibus. I see that there is $10 million for student scholarships to OSU. Is that a normal thing to see scholarships out of that? No, uh, it, it is, it is not. It was a, essentially a trade of some resources that they didn't, that they did, that weren't used in another area. Um, but this came out of the, um, Oregon state, uh, appeal to the legislature to help offset funding for the PAC 12 changes. Um, they originally were asking for a lot more than that, um, and that's what they ended up with at the end of the, at the end of the session. So, yeah, that's one of the reasons that the presidents are really stressing that we work together um, moving forward amongst all the universities. Um, so we're not in competition. That doesn't help even from a legislative standpoint of saying, okay, who's who's on first? What are your priorities as institutions? Is it really about you know Oregon Opportunity Grant, or do you need fund just for your program? And that's um, where we got to be careful that we, you know, really try to work in collaboration and not compete against each other, because that's one of the things that legislators will point to and have over the years, at least if I've, as I've been doing this, um, point to the issue that uh, the universities all seem to be in it for their own things. And then it becomes, well, I'm, who's voting for what? And, and it really then ends up being, it doesn't really help, all right? It you know, ends up being, well, they're not going to, what we see is a lot of times they say, well, we're not going to fund anything then. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Tim. Anyone else with questions? It's a congrats on um, 
the funding, even if it is one time. It, um, I know we heard a lot of concerns when we adopted those two new academic programs. So that funding will a definitely quick help. quick comment. I really appreciate, Tim, how you can link all that we do to the legislative reality there. So it's much appreciated. Thank you for following. Thank you for reporting. And, and, and happy to do so. Great. OK, I think we're on schedule, maybe a minute or two ahead. So our next item will take a little thinking and possibly wordsmithing. <laughs> this one's for you, Chuck. Um, <laughs> His favorite thing, brain surgery or governance committee. So, um, yeah, governance committee is what I could handle. So, well, yeah, you passed, Chuck. So, um, that's right. Our next item is a proposed amendment to the university's bylaws section regarding conflict of interest. And general counsel and board secretary Chris Buford will introduce the topic. Thanks. Thank you. Yes. Um, so I think you probably familiar from every single staff cover sheet that you see with the 10 uh, essential responsibilities of governing boards and with the nine principles of trusteeship. We just, that appears it's something all staff are re required to at least consider as they're filling out this. Um, this is a third piece that really makes up the the foundation of what of what trustees do, and that's the fiduciary responsibility. You're not a board of directors; you're a board of trustees. And as some of you have been through the orientation uh, and recently, or remember from orientation, that really means something. Uh, in a sense, it's a it's a metaphor, but it's more than a metaphor. Uh, just like with an estate or resources for uh, a person who, who needs someone to manage their finances for them, there's a valuable asset, the university, that's entrusted to a trustee, you guys, to manage on uh, for the benefit of the beneficiary, which in this case is the, the people of Oregon and our past, present, and future students. And, um, that's the, that is the foundation of your role here. And we, as I mentioned, we discussed this during orientation. There's a material about this in the online orientation that you do with uh, AGB. And also, um, if you, I'm just going to very briefly share my screen here. You, I should have brought a hard copy of this, uh, but you should all have copies of this book uh, that was given to you when uh, when uh, when you became trustees. In this book, uh, you may be familiar, you know, may remember. remember um, it. Uh, I'll blow that up a lot. Uh, this is where we get the uh, the uh, essential responsibilities, but it's also where there's a, a, a somewhat lengthy discussion about these fiduciary roles. That's still pretty small. Anyway, it's page 31 through 37 of the book. Um, so if you're just looking for additional information about it, you can find it there. Um, and of course, you can find it, as I mentioned in the cover sheet, you can find it in board statement number six, which is our board statement on ethics and conflicts of interest. So there are three key subsets of the fiduciary responsibility. Uh, and the one we're gonna focus on discussing today is the duty of loyalty. Uh, the other is the duty of care and, uh, and the duty of obedience. Uh, but the duty of loyalty really says that um, in your role as trustee, you, you have to be functioning in that trustee role and your decision-making can't be colored by loyalty obligations to uh, other roles that also affect what you're doing here. And uh, so, and, it's, and, and there are a number of examples we could cite for that. Um, 
But the one that's come up for today uh, is uh, really about the role of folks who are leaders in shared governance. And that's faculty senate, that's university council, and that's uh, student government, ASEOU. Uh, at least some of those people, their roles are really to advocate on behalf of the members of those organizations. That's, that's a representative role. And that's a very important role. It's an essential role within the university. We have people doing that. But that is a different perspective from that of a person who's a trustee. Um, and we cover this during orientation as well uh, for the and particularly for the staff and faculty and student trustees, we, we talk about if you're a trustee, you're looking from the trustee lens. You're looking at that big picture, keeping in mind who the beneficiaries are and then the, with the long term and uh, not functioning in a representative capacity. We emphasize that student, staff, and faculty trustees uh, are important contributors to the makeup of the board. And of course, we're going to be talking about the makeup of the board in, a, in another agenda item coming up. Uh, for the same reason that other kinds of at-large trustees are, their experience in those roles give them a particular sense of knowledge and perspective that would not be present on the board otherwise. And so we need people with those roles on the board, but they're trustees just like every other trustee is a trustee rather than perhaps being representatives of a subset of the university community. So that's all background for this topic. Um, uh, the, uh, so the particular, so in our university bylaws, which is the senior most document of all the documents that govern the university, we have a section on conflicts of interest uh, and uh, currently it talks about um, faculty and staff and student trustees who uh, are actually barred by state law from participating in conversations about collective bargaining uh, because uh, they're all affected by the outcome of that is, is the presumption under state law. And we've incorporated that into that section. So in thinking about this particular type of conflict uh, where a person is in a legitimate role representing a, a constituency within the university, uh, either as uh, in leadership of faculty senate or, or uh, university council or student government, uh, we thought the time had come for, to add some language uh, to that section on this issue. It's been an issue that people in administration have been aware of for a while, and we have used existing language in uh, board statement number six, and you, it's there in the, in the, it's quoted in the cover sheet uh, as, our, as our basis for this. Uh, and it actually has actually come up once before where we, I, I actually was actively recruiting a person to be student trustee who was also then ran for um, ASCOU president. And when she became president, then we said, okay, that's a different role. You can't also be student trustee. Anyway, it's come up again. Uh, and uh, ASCOU pointed out that we don't have anything that specifically addresses this. And so we said, okay, we can do that. And that's the origin of the language that you see here proposed as amendment to Article 8 of the bylaws. I'll say uh, the specifics of the language has been a bit of a moving target, and we may very well have some discussion of whether it's there yet. Uh, uh, and when I first posted this, um, the uh, what was being recommended was that officers of the University Council, Faculty Senate, and the executive officers of ASEOU would not be able to serve as student, as, as trustees. Uh, since then, I had a, a very helpful conversation with Andy Hugh, who's the director of political affairs for ASEOU. And we went over the constitution and bylaws of ASEOU in some detail. Those are attached to the cover sheet. Uh, and. Uh, 
narrowed that down to uh, three positions within ASU you know, that are that are really executive representatives of ASU: the president, the chief of staff, and the director of finance. Um, and that's what's before you today. However, I'm going to suggest a further change to this uh, on further discussion with the president. Uh, 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 we now actually want to narrow this even more so that the only folks who would not be able to serve as trustees would be the uh, chair of the university council, the president of the faculty senate, and the president of ASEOU. Uh, so then the, the vice chair uh, of, of those organizations or the secretary, they could still be a trustee. And of the 16 officers of ASEOU, only one would not be able to serve as a trustee. I think that's our that's where we're at right now. And I'm happy to hand that over to you if you've got additional comments. But. Yeah, I would. Um, I, I would share that uh, when we had these discussions with with ASEOU, um, one of the things that they suggested was that the president to them felt less. Um, less of a conflict of interest than their chair of, and I apologize because I do not know all their officers' names, their um, director of finance, their director of finance. And so when I, when I met with them, they suggested, Hey, let us have a conversation and bring you three names. And so, you know, another option is to take the input from the executive committee of ASEOU that it would be these three officers, but then just the faculty Senate president and the UC chair. Um, and then I would share one other item here to make it so it's more complicated. Um, because the language, you know, ASEOU felt that the language wasn't, even though it's been a practice, the language wasn't explicit saying you cannot be a president and a trustee. And so we had a situation where I'm assuming um, the individual won the election now wants to do both positions and the language wasn't explicitly stated now the practice has always been there um so so i did share with this student that i would bring it to y'all to suggest that should we pass this measure we could have a grandfather clause that allows this student to serve because we are doing this language um, kind of late and it's good. I'm glad we're fixing this so that future generations of students aren't kind of stuck in a spot. Um, but I know that's your decision, not mine, but I did, I did share that, that that to me seems a good idea. Um, and then if I may, I'd just like to say, you know, for me, I think the reasons why we want to put this forward is obviously we want to clear it up. We won't, we don't want to mislead anybody, but shared governance is really the heart and soul of an institution. And you heard that from Karen Clay earlier, some of you who were, who were here for the academic affairs meeting. And it is important to our governing body, um, to NWCCU and y'all that we, we have these inherent best practices in place. And as I've shared with ASEOU and I've talked with University Council and the Faculty Senate President, uh, you know, it's actually a lot of work to do all these jobs at once. And your primary job as a student is to actually, you know, be a student. And so I'm, I'm hopeful that in the future we can, you know, preserve, preserve just one role at a time. Um, I also believe it is the board's job to hear from a diverse array of individuals to represent the university. Uh, and when you have one person who's presenting as a student and who comes up in shared governance, you're not hearing as many perspectives as I think you could be. Um, I think also we're reducing leadership positions on campus. I think everyone in this room knows I love student development. It's why I'm in this work. When we have one person do two of the most important jobs, we've limited the experience and exposure of another individual to develop fully. And then finally, shared governance does actually require uh, multiple voices, collaboration and input, and it really, it just should not be dominated by one voice. And so, so those are my reasons. But again, I am asking, um, if you're willing, obviously it's your choice, we can debate it as long as you like today. Um, but I did share with that student that I would, I would share with y'all, um, because it isn't explicit in this writing, that that person be allowed perhaps to serve next year with your approval. Yes, and I just want to say that that was part of the instructions 
I understood from the outset was that it would not affect this particular person. Uh, and I apologize for not making that explicit in the uh, cover sheet. Um, uh, my thought is that it would, because this language in the bylaws uh, will be there presumably for a long period of time, uh, we could make that as part of the motion that adopts it uh, or something along those lines so that it's explicit that it's not affecting uh, the person who would be coming in uh, the, for this next term. Well, um, thank you um, to Dr. Ryan and to Chris for the work you put into it and the students who made it a better, we see you in the gallery and anyone listening and thank you for being here. I think it made it a better process and um, I was really surprised that we didn't have the clarification and um, uh, personally, I agree that it's um, better to have some clarification because um, if you think about worst case scenario, an appeal of a decision or an ethics complaint, uh, if we can avoid those with clear um, guidance at the local level, um, I think that's much better. Maybe as chair, I shouldn't have expressed my support, but I just did. Anyway, does anyone have thoughts or questions for Dr. Ryan or for Chris? Well, I, um, I really appreciate and acknowledge the input from the ASEOU. Um, I think that's really critical and important. And Dr. Ryan, thank you for working with the students. I, I, I'm just, I'm supportive. Um, I'm really interested though, and I think this group would be interested in hearing um, how you, why are you recommending those three positions as being appropriate to be excluded? So I'll just say that um, committee meetings, as opposed to board meetings, which are more formal, mm -hmm. uh, are more accommodating to a little bit more of a workshop approach. Uh, so uh, to the degree that either of you guys from ASU are comfortable talking to the committee about this, you're welcome to come up to the presenter's table uh, and provide that that perspective. I like that. Thank you. While they're moving up there, can I just make a comment? Yes. Um, so that the committee knows this would be a recommendation that would go to the full board. Is that correct? So uh, when this all came about, I, I was in strong support that we get something written down in our policy so that we don't have this conflict anymore. Be and like uh, Tamara said, it's so important to be able to go back to a document if there's ever questions, say, here it is, black and white, and then we don't have this um, conflict that, that has arisen because of this. So I encourage the committee to um, take that into consideration for sure. Thank you, Chair Martin. Would you gentlemen like to introduce yourself and feel free to respond to Trustee Cronin's request. Of course, uh, for those of you guys who don't know, my name is Calvin Bent. I am the current ASEOU president, and I'm here with Andy Huey, who is the Director of Political Affairs. Um, I just wanted to start by saying thank you guys for allowing us to come up here and speak. was not expecting this, I'll be honest. But um, uh, uh, y yeah, um, I think I'm going to hand it over to Andy for the first part of this. All right. Thank you, Chair Malbet. Thank you, um, Trustee Cronin and members of the committee. ASEOU had quite a long conversation among the executive branch of who should be able to serve or not as a student trustee. And to note, this is we developed this policy off of our amended constitution and bylaws, which is the one that's now presented in front of you. When we originally wrote this policy, those bylaws were still in the air. So for example, we have the title of chief of staff. That is a brand new title that just passed as of spring break for our new office assistant. In the conversations that ASEOU had, we personally still don't feel like the president is a conflict, but we trust the boards and the administration's um, belief that that position is a position that is a conflict, which is why we suggested that position. With that being tied in, we suggested the chief of staff to be also, if the president is a conflict, the chief of staff definitely will be because they work directly under the president and are solely appointed by the president to the student body government. They're responsible for a ton of different job duties, 
um, none of those job duties inherently are a conflict, but their express direct relationship with the president is where that concern came out to why we developed them into that list of three. Now, the, the conversation around the Director of Financial Affairs. The Director of Financial Affairs handles a student fee a committee as their chair and also presents in front of the board of trustees fairly frequently compared to um, my position as director of political affairs or our director of diversity and equity or even our director of campus affairs those three positions don't ever present to the board so there is no way that you can have somebody present something and then turn around and sit on the board and vote on it so those were the basic um, ideas that came out of those conversations on why those positions were chosen. Oh. Go ahead if you have something to add, please. I had nothing. I was essentially just going to summarize it all up in like one sentence, but yeah. Great. Christine. I, I just wanted to, I'm sorry to put you on the spot and thank you, uh, Chair Mabbitt, for allowing the, the uh, representatives to speak. That's really helpful. Um, and I, I commend you for the, the thoughtful discussion that you had and, and uh, your recommendations. So thank you very much. That's helpful, I think, to this board. Uh, thank you so much for having us up here. And I uh, just wanted to also give another thank you to President Ryan. And is it is a proper title secretary for this instance? Sure. <laughs> okay. Pick your pick. <laughs> right. I was, I was thinking it's, it's a small place. You got to wear a lot of hats. Um, and Secretary Buford for having this discussion with us and and keeping us involved because we really appreciate that so thank you so much i i appreciate your diplomacy and i'm impressed with the uh, political acumen that you both have to participate in a sophisticated dialogue about this type of policy matter um to be abundantly obvious um you are in support of the proposed language that is in our packet just to be clear, the proposed language is uh, barring the president, the chief of staff, and the uh, director of financial affairs would be? Yes, that's okay. correct. Perfect. Uh, with those three, uh, I am personally for. Yeah. The uh, To comment on that, this, this policy um, was just developed by the executive committee. So the six positions that are on the executive board were the ones who made that decision um, for for future reference because it's because Chris mentioned five we did um, merge positions so we got rid of my position next year director of political affairs now has been merged with the director of diversity and equity um, to try to save money for the student fee budget so we don't have to continue doing um, drastic cuts to other units with that we made a bylaws amendment that will be being presented to the rest of the constitutional review committee to hear it as well as being brought back to the senate to have a conversation about if they accept those three items that we had presented which was the chief of staff director of political not director of political affairs director of financial affairs and the president um, as the executive board currently sits that was the decision that we have made but that is not directly the decision that has been made by the Senate. Thank you. Um, I asked Chris to put the full language of the amendment up on the screen in case anybody is watching online or listening. Any other thoughts or questions for our student? Yes, Gary. So what happens if the uh, Senate uh, doesn't agree with the decision that you made? Uh, so what process do you go through at that point? Thank you, Trustee George. Um, if the Senate does not agree and the board has already adopted uh, this proposal, it is considered a housekeeping item in the ASEAU Constitution bylaws. So we have to listen to what you guys have passed. You got Your guys' Constitution bylaw supersedes anything that ASEOU chooses to do. Um, so if the Senate does not agree, if you guys have passed it, we have to follow it. If the Senate chooses not to agree, um, they'll ha they'll make a different proposal back to the Constitutional Review Committee to make their final determination. Essentially what we've received from the executive uh, 
officers of ASAU is advice. It's not an official action of ASEOU. Did you have another question? I do. Um, and, you know, not knowing all the discussions that have happened with this, uh, I've served on a lot of different committees and even in our relationship uh, as a tribe with other organizations, you know, we just let the organization decide who they want to appoint to serve on the board, regardless of let, well, letting them decide if the president or the uh, any other officer wants to sit on uh, this committee. And I'm just kind of curious as to if you had those kind of discussions with uh, the university council or with the ASU student body and uh, whether just having them identify a person to serve as a trustee and nominate them because they're in the best position to identify whether they're too busy or not and not us. So. Sure, the the process for appointing a student trustee is is really pretty complicated. It's gotten more complicated in the last year because the legislature uh, uh, enacted Senate Bill 273, which created an, an additional layer to the process. So formerly, and it's and it's still true, um, the governor decides who who to uh, nominate to the Senate for approval, and that's typically goes through very smoothly once it leaves the governor's office. And also, it's still true that any person can apply, uh, whether for an at-large position or any student, or could apply for a student trustee position. However, a new uh, layer has been added that um, does solicit the views explicitly of the student government and also uh, for the faculty trustee, the faculty senate, or for the staff trustee, the university council, so that those bodies are now are engaged in um, a pro processes of the term in the statute is nominate, but essentially the governor is doing the nominate, but nominating to the governor people. So you've actually done that this year. Uh, do you want to talk about your experience? Because this is the first time you've had to do it. Yeah, so I wanted to also include the the process that ASEOU chose to do, as I think that is reflective of our final choices of trustee that, that we, we, we submitted this year and nominated to the governor and including bringing the conversation that, that has now been presented before you guys. The... As we had mentioned, SB 273, it, it did change as from a one position to two positions for student trustees. So ASEOU this year was tasked with nominating two student trustees. The first one is a single year term, which is a non-voting, well, sorry, which is a voting member that will serve for one term, one year. Um, that is the one that has been presented that was brought the conversation of the conflict of interest. Then we have a junior trustee, which serves a two-year term. The first year, they are the junior and are non-voting. And the second year, they become the senior trustee and are a voting member. So moving forward, this year was our one exception year, where we will be nominating one person to the governor to be have ASEOU's endorsement. How we handled this process is we opened it up to the entire university to nominate a student. This nomination what allowed students to self-nominate themselves, but it also allowed um, the general body to nominate somebody. So if they, so we could kind of crowdsource who who might be interested and so we can get names as historically that has been a problem um, for getting student trustees is finding somebody who's willing to serve and trying to get those different voices to be heard which is why they've historically also been tied to aseou with that we got three different nominations of three different people um, with that, we sent each out an application to fill out from those nominations. Each member filled out their application and resubmitted it to us, and we scheduled an interview with them. How those, we will take the self-nomination as a willingness to serve, but if somebody else nominates somebody else, 
I can't count that as a willingness to serve on this body. So that's why we have that additional step of sending out an application before we schedule interviews. With that, this year, we believe the process went fairly smooth, even though the deadlines were up in the air a little bit for us trying to figure out when things were specifically going to be happening with the governor. Um, especially with it being a short session, it, it did throw us a little off to when those nominations would be made. Um, moving forward, we have made a, a bylaws amendment that is going to be following the same process we did this year, except with stricter dates on when items should be able to occur. Those nominations will be opening uh, with my current amendment that has not been approved. <laughs> Those current bylaws will have the nominations open up at the first day of school and will be lasting five to seven weeks. For, to get adequate time from the campus community to source who they would want. At the end of those nominations, we will be sending out applications and those will be open for a same amount of time. And then after that, we have to do interviews and make our official nomination. To this, we had three students who were good candidates. Unfortunately, we only had two spots to give, which is why we made the ultimate decision of the two we gave. We believe that they were the best suited to be able to present and work with you guys in this body and provide future support. Thank you for that. Any other questions of, uh... yeah, Cedric. Yeah, um, so I don't, I don't formally sit on this committee, uh, but I thought that I should offer a little of my perspective seeing as I was director of finance and the student trustee at the same time when I was here. Um, you know, going into this, um, I would say, obviously, you know, I'm not voting on this within this committee. Um, I'm, I personally would feel that I'd have to oppose the language as it currently is. Um, my thoughts with it are, Again, um, you know, in my capacity, when I was when I was director of finance, you know, I wouldn't be sitting on this board most likely today under this current language. Which maybe that's fine. That's how it would turn out. That's how things would be. Um, but I held that role, or was going into those roles about the same time as I went in to the board. So I would have had to make a decision, and that's what I see us potentially putting on future students you know, trying to go into these different roles. And uh, to the point, I think it might have been President Ryan mentioned um, multiple perspectives. You know, I think that's definitely important to consider. But to me, in looking at the proposed bylaws or the changed bylaws and what I've seen is that there is a process for finding the new trustees. There's a process for how we're looking at our executive branches um, at the student government level. Um, there's a process. It doesn't mean that it's going to be the same person. But my understanding, at least of our conversations today, has been, um, you know, that there could be issues or possible conflicts of interest. When I served in both capacities, uh, we voted on tuition increase that was coming after our tuition freeze. Um, and that went against, you know, my, the greater student body um, and what they were wanting. So I definitely had to balance roles there. And I did have conversations around the university with how those roles should be balanced. But this conversation, to my knowledge, to my memory, never came up at this at that time. There wasn't a conversation about my ability to serve in both roles. And because of that, you know, this is I would have thought, you know, there might be some kind of a conversation at that point. I'm not saying anyone did anything wrong or whatever. It just wasn't really talked about. So now this is coming up. Um, is it, is, you know, if the student government is believing that um, other roles, more so than the president, including my old role, were more of a conflict, um, and initially we were just saying the president, I'm just kind of wondering, you know, or trying to f figure out what the perceived issues are or, you know, what the board, what this committee would see as those issues, issues that we would talk about if this were elevated to the board. Because um, in my role, again, I had to balance. I had to balance those two things. And it was difficult, but no one's told me 
so far that I did a bad job of that. I was given the opportunity to, and I don't think that we should be taking that opportunity from students that are willing to serve in both capacities. When I put in for the board of trustee position, I was, at that time, I was the only name that was in the pot. And, you know, that's not great. There's movement in a good direction, but if I get locked out because of that, then there's a longer search there, and then the board doesn't have that student perspective at all. So that's a couple of my words. Just wanted to bring that up. And um, thank you for that, um, Trustee Rio, and thank you for your um, volunteer effort when you were a student and as now. Um, I have no doubt that this is... Um, any reflection on your role and I think you lucked out and we lucked out and from my perspective and I work in the public sector it's always better to keep roles clear and abundantly separate for your benefit and the organization's benefit because it can take a tiny little complaint to an ethics commission to turn your whole organization into a tailspin so right now um, whispering to my left and to my right um, do do the committee members think you have something you want to vote on today or do you want to think about it and we carry it over to our meeting later this month? Uh, before we go to a vote, may I say, what would be the clear language of this amendment today? Because what we have listed there earlier, no, is that the clear language as it stands today? I don't think so. Uh, no, I uh, I was recommending that we didn't um, use the executive committee of the faculty senate. Um, it would be just the president of the faculty senate, just the um, chair of the university council, and then we would take ASEOU's recommendation, which was three positions, the president, chief of staff, and oh my gosh, I still cannot remember, mm -hmm. director of financial affairs. Ah. <laughs> so and we will read almost like that with the with the difference that we only have three positions that will be prohibited from serving which are listed above the president director of finance the chief of staff correct that's right that sentence this highlighted sentence here uh would say the the chair of the university council the president of the faculty senate and then the rest would be the same. Okay. Did you want to make a motion or? Um, Could I just uh, add something? I, I it just to muddy the waters even more. Um, I'm wondering if if there is an avenue. Let's say that a, a student would like to be um, an executive officer, and they also are willing to put their name in for a trusteeship. The time, the timeliness is of, of uh, importance. If the student who um, is running is in an executive position would like to serve as both, what happens if they don't get elected into that executive position, but they were not able to put their name into the role of a trustee um, because because now the wording says that they're not able to serve both ways, but you see what I'm saying? The timeliness of this creates an issue. So I just wondered if we maybe can clarify that or there can be discussion on how we may um, resolve that issue. And maybe that's more operations in the background is what maybe we could talk about um, just to, to make sure those conflicts of interest aren't there. Um, this is also, I mean, these are deadlines with the state, so we don't, you know, we have to work within the guidelines given to us as well. Well, I think anybody can put their name in as a possible trustee, and at, at any point then that that um, the governor's group can put that name forward to the Senate for recommendations. So uh, I guess just my question is, when it's already an issue that there are not usually this humongous amount of people that want to do either one of those, let alone both, um, I, I, I would hate to, for, let's just take Cedric, if, he's, if this were in place at that point in time, 
he may not have ever put his name in as a trusteeship because he wanted to be an executive position on on the on the council, the, the students. Um, so are we eliminating somebody from maybe having that opportunity if they weren't successful in one venue that then they were never put in for the, the yeah. I might, uh, oh. oh. Anna, um, oh, I, I was just gonna, I was thinking that perhaps the, the solution to that would be to allow to put the name in, but then if that person were to be appointed, that they would have to resign. It's either one or the other, because and then it would create a conflict. So perhaps the language, I don't know whether that there is a way to reflect that in the language or it's an operational thing that can be implemented later on. So I, I agree with you that, you know, preventing from from putting that name in when you don't know it should not be the case. But when it comes to the time of serving, then absolutely there it's, it should be one or the other because of all, for all the reasons that we have discussed. Exactly, and, and that was kind of my thoughts too. Allowing the names to be put forward and then if that situation comes up, like I don't think it probably happens that would happen that frequently, but if it did, then they would have to make a choice. But I would hate to eliminate. So I see Andy looking like he'd like to say something. I'll say something as well. Maybe we'll say the same thing. Uh, part of it is uh, the timing of the ACAU elections is set. It happens at a particular time. However, the timing of what happens with the governor and the Senate and these appointments tends to vary. So um, this year, we were, I was given clear instructions from the executive appointments office that uh, names were gonna have to be in very early so that they could go up for consideration during the short section. And I gave advice to shared governance and ASEOU that they actually needed to get their process done by the end of January because I just, you know, I, they couldn't, they weren't making any promises of the governor's office after that. Well, then it turned out that legislature didn't actually do confirmations during the short session. And so there wasn't a big rush uh, and it's now going to be in May, uh, which had we known that from the outset would have made a difference. At the same time, we'd, we don't want to have these positions be vacant, uh, you know, if we can avoid it. So just saying, well, we'll wait till May, sometimes that doesn't happen. <laughs> I don't know if you've got some more. So I believe that uh, it would be beneficial to the Board of Trustees to also clarify how ASEOU has its officers chosen. We have two distinct processes that occurs. One occurs for the entire legislative branch, so that chooses all eight senators as well as the president. That is our general election that happens in, during winter term, and it is required to have those announcements occur during or after spring break. So that happens at the end of winter term to make those choices for that position. For the chief of staff and the director of financial affairs, which are executive appointed positions, as well as our justices, they are required to have an application that they have to fill out. And then they are heard by that newly elected Senate and president known as the interim Senate. They then choose who is going to represent them in that role. ASEOU's modified bylaws says that that application is to close first week or second week of spring term, whichever one is sooner. I can't, it, it was specific dates. I can't remember them off the top of my head. I apologize. <laughs> With that, um, then it is up to the interim Senate to choose whenever those appointments are made. The chief of staff can be appointed at any time by the interim president, but the director of financial affairs has to be approved by the eight members of the Senate. So that gets a little bit complicated because now we have with these three, we also have three different times of when these people can come into office. With that, in my personal opinion, as the one who headed up these appoint our nominations to the governor, I personally do not see any harm in letting them submit their name to us for our endorsement as long as we have an alternate slate if we know that's what they're doing. 
Um, so that way we don't have any issues with those conflicts. But that needs to be clarified within our process of how we would like to handle that. With that also being a conversation, one of the sub items within the bylaws for that amendment for this process is also telling ASEU they need to choose a preference for outside of their body. That is common with the other student governments, um, but I will note with this, and I believe this is of importance for us to be able to do this, you, this board will be the first one to set language like this, prohibiting anybody in the state of Oregon from student government from serving on the board as their student trustee. Um, one reflection. Uh, number one, I think we're talking about conflict as a general. And in many times when we serve on different boards, we have a kind of a sometimes conflict arise. And in that case, that individual steps aside and say, I don't think I should be voting on this particular item because this could be in conflict what I do. So it's kind of a line item conflict versus a blanketed conflict of a presence. I'm going back to what Cedric would say. The contribution of any students to this board would be critical, is critical. The more, the merrier, right? The more voices, the more, the larger we leave the entry door open, the better off in the long term we will be served. Going back to the example, if a potential conflict would have been present for Cedric, he would not be sitting here today. So then maybe sometimes in a discussion, we will have a particular item that needs to be voted upon and voted on, which will raise a, an individual conflict, and that could be very easily solved. So I think in general, that we need to leave it broad. And uh, one more one more point. Uh, I don't think anybody is responsible for somebody else makes a decision. Ultimately, none of us makes a decision who's going to be sitting here. It's the, the governor and the Senate. It would be for them to spot any conflict of interest. I don't, I don't know. Maybe, I mean, anyway, so large door to enter and lighten item conflict, in my opinion. Oh, Christy. Uh, just just a little bit. Um, I, I think I, I, I appreciate that. I, I also think that it's manageable to uh, allow students to put their name in as a potential student trustee. And if, if they become an officer, they would have to make a choice at that point. Um, I do think, though, we need to remember that this conflict of interest issue is very much a protection of the individual. And so it's really not, you know, necessarily, I, I've been on boards where board members have had to state a potential conflict and that can happen. In this day and age, though, this is really uh, a protection of the individual as well as the entire board. So I think it is important for us to have an establishment of, as a board, our expectation of certain individuals that might not uh, be the, the ideal uh, people to represent the the um, entity in our at our university, and and at the same time, recognizing that any staff member who serves as a staff member or a faculty could potentially have a conflict of interest that they would need to state. Um, but we can't lim we can't limit we don't want to limit students or staff from being on the board. But if we have the expectation stated in our uh, board. Uh, operating agreements that we will uh, uh, do our best to eliminate that potential conflict. I think that's a really strong statement that we need to make. Okay, where are we? We are past time on this particular item. Um, do you want to think about it some more? Uh, I asked Chris to clarify the language. So what you see on the screen would be um, the amendment if someone's inclined to make that motion. And again, this would be a recommendation to the full Board of Trustees. Chris. Uh, Chair Mabbitt, I would like to make a motion to uh, submit the language as uh, visible on the screen as the uh, statement of the conflicts with the fiduciary role of trusteeship um, as a recommendation from this committee to the Board. 
Second. Thank you. So the motion's been made by Trustee Cronin and seconded by Trustee Cabanato to adopt, um, or recommend the full Board of Trustees adopt an amendment to Article 8 with a new uh, Section 2. Should we do a roll call? All those in favor say aye. Aye. And all those opposed? Uh, I, nay would be for me. Nay. Thank you. Okay. So noted, the motion passes um, with one nay vote. Thank you for that. It's been a good discussion. So, um, yeah, very much so. So our next item is, um, the topic is ideal characteristics sought in filling board vacancies. So um, Trustee Stevens, this is because, you know, you're, I know you're going to be tough, tough shoes to fill, but um, so we will uh, make our first attempt uh, at a new procedure, Senate Bill 273 and new board statement 13 require the board to publicly identify the ideal characteristics to be sought when filling a vacancy on the board. Uh, board Secretary Buford and Vice President Seidel will introduce this topic and uh, lead us through the process. Please proceed. Thank you. I did just want to could we talk about the agenda briefly? Yes. Uh, because we did take 25 minutes longer on that one than we thought. Uh, we have, uh, this is an important topic and we had res uh, ident identified uh, 30 minutes for it with the thought that the conversation would continue probably at the next meeting. But we also, on this, our final agenda item, we actually really need to come to a decision on that now because um, the time for making reservations and reserving space and that kind of thing is is running low. So I, I don't know. Tim, do you think we could take a few minutes to talk about that topic, the retreat location, uh, or I would agree. And are you suggesting we skip the ideal characteristics discussion? Well, I'm hoping the number six will be short, but oh. that we could get to a conclusion on it. Yes, because yes, of course. Please, um, is that your topic also, Tim? The board retreat. I'm part of it with Chris. Yeah. Okay, with, yeah. Yeah. that's okay with me. Um, okay with everybody else. Okay, let's move forward, please. On I'll the board retreat. I'll I'll introduce this. I'll be quick. I apologize. We didn't have a cover sheet on this, but I saved you a page and a half of reading. Uh, <laughs> We've, cons we've actually batted around a lot of options for this. Uh, initially, we, uh, but, but the key characteristics I want to say for picking a, lo a retreat location are, um, uh, it, it has to meet certain basic standards. We have to have enough for hotel rooms uh, and it needs to have good enough Wi-Fi because we're now committed to broadcasting these. Um, it's, um, uh, Cost factor matters in terms of distance uh, because you have to put more staff in hotel rooms who are providing support if you're some distance away. Um, and so these are all sort of things, but then there's also the goals of the retreat. You always want to retreat. Uh, typically the way we approach retreats is we want to have a fewer agenda items and have deeper conversation around them. And it's an opportunity, even though every board meeting the trustees are, the goal is to be intended, uh, uh, engaged at that sort of middle range, long range, uh, elevated perspective. Uh, the retreat's an opportunity to go even deeper with that. Um, and then we've looked at uh, locations where we can kind of uh, make it clear to uh, parts of our, our service area, so to speak, the, our main counties we we draw from that we're engaged and we're interested in what we're doing it's an they've some of these have been opportunities for trustee education uh, uh, about what we're already doing in these areas what their needs are and we try to we kind of blend all of these so this last time around we uh we did start with talking about um some attractive locales fairly distant from here along the deschutes river unfortunately there just wasn't the infrastructure to support us there uh, and then we started thinking also about cost and that it would be good if we, in a, in a cost cutting year, if we didn't travel very far. Um, we 
Uh, and we've talked about, in just among staff and, and with the chair, we've talked uh, about Hermiston, and we've talked about going to Wild Horse, we talked, and we've, we've also talked about Baker City. Um, and I think we've, we're coming around, at least in those conversations, to a sense that uh, maybe the sweet spot this year is Baker City. Um, uh, in the case of Wild Horse, it's not available uh, as a golf tournament. So not this year. Um, and uh, Baker City was the first place we went outside of Union County. We held our second retreat there. Uh, we learned a lot from that experience, as we do from them all. We would do it differently this time. It's been eight years, I think. Yes, eight years. So it's not like, like oh, it's them again from Eastern, all right? It's been almost a decade. Uh, so that's uh, just to set up the conversation. That's I think that's where we're going. I think in future years, some of these other places we've talked about uh, would be would merit further consideration. Uh, Hermiston, because it's our uh, largest growing area in our uh, growth area and population, it's new industry, um, and we have important relationships there. But we did go to Boardman a couple years ago, and we met with some of those folks then. So not so urgent maybe this time around. Um, I'll stop talking. Tim, do you want to add anything? <laughs> uh, just to, uh, for, for some of our newer trustees, as we structure these uh, board retreats, we, we try to provide some you know, engagement opportunities um, with local leadership, focusing on specific issues to those areas. We would continue to do that. Um, try to find, you know, we've, we've worked on receptions or functions where we can invite the general public to come and meet with, with trustees and, and have some dialogues there. And then sometimes we do outings to try to get them to, you know, some places that people maybe haven't, you know, maybe haven't been or haven't experienced. Um, and Baker certainly still has, Baker City certainly still has that. Um, and then we have some trustees who have some experience in Baker City. You know, Chuck, do you have any experience in Baker City? Uh, you know, and Cheryl uh, and Aaron. So we have, yeah, a few people um and so uh, that gives us an opportunity to also look at what what we could do down there um to you know broaden broaden the horizons of the board of trustees and and doing a retreat in a location that works for everyone it sounds lovely to me anyone else have comment do you need a formal so i i don't think we were really looking for a motion but we typically do talk to the committee about this mm -hmm. Often we're more or less saying this is the plan we've come up with. Uh, it's taken us a little longer to come up with the plan this time. So we, you know, in case there was more conversation the committee wanted to have about it, we're here for it. Otherwise, I suspect we'll move forward with the Baker City idea. I, I have a question. Um, I would like, uh, before we propose or we move forward, the, the phrase that is precious to me is in a year of deep cutting, of deep cut for the university. So. It will be responsible for us to save every penny we can. I know it's advisable to engage with local community, whether it's in Baker, Hermiston, or whatnot. But if I were on the other hand of receiving a pink slip in, on this institution, I would say we have done all we can to make those contributions. So for me, the leading, um, um, how do you say, decision-making will be, if we go to Baker, it's going to cost us X. If we stay in La Grande, the EOU, it's going to cost us X minus something or whatever. It will be a good message, a good signal from this board to save pennies in a year in which we have to. I think that's good enough. Thank you for that. Do you think we still have time to um, touch on our final topic? I think we can kick it off, uh, realizing that we we were hoping to begin a conversation that would conclude at the next meeting. Uh, we do hope the committee will be able to actually make a motion on this topic at the next meeting so that we can get something to the board for the May meeting because we can't start recruiting to fill the position until we've made this decision. Um, all right. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, you've got the cover sheet. You're familiar with the background. Tim has some very interesting uh, exhibits to share with you. I'm just going to stop. I'm going to hand it over to you, Tim, if you're ready to take that up.
Uh, sure, I can. I can definitely um, walk through some of the materials um, that we've produced here. I'm going to uh, work on sharing my screen, if that is possible. Um, I'll, while you're doing that, I'll yep. just uh, thank Susanna, uh, who uh, made a big contribution to putting these together. Uh, and I think <laughs> we were all kind of scrambling, and it was like, oh, look, somebody's done a bunch of work. Thank you. <laughs> Yes, it was very helpful. Um, had some things to, to look at and not enough time to put it all together. And Susanna put together a, a great a great um, package for us to review. Now, this is going to be hard to see because it's complex, but I'll try to zoom in as well and see if we can show us off a little bit. But essentially, folks ask you about what are, what are we looking at when we're talking about adding um, uh, you know trustees and how does that process how does that process work well as you know we we have names that are submitted to us I just actually received a, another name um, uh, from a, a, a colleague here on at EOU um, just a little while ago saying here's somebody else that, that you might want to consider so they come in in different formats we see them from other trustees we have nominations from folks that we work with at the state level or at other organizations and we usually try to track all that information and have them as as, as then as seats come up. Then then the question is what what are we looking for in a in a trustee? What are we looking for in this new uh, in this new position? Um, and seeing that the board is not truly representative, right? It's not like we have to have somebody from Wallowa County and we must have one position from Harney County. Um, it doesn't work that way. It's it's um, it's large by and large pieces, and we just we're talking about um, just anybody can actually apply if they want, and that can throw things in into the mix. But if we have a general approach and a general understanding of what we're looking for, um, that helps guide guide the process and make Maybe make sure that we don't end up, you know, with a uh, a board full of one specific professional type um, uh, at the university, and that 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 difference again, as we were talking about, that difference of opinions and difference of backgrounds really helps create a board that um, can can move forward. So, when we have um, uh, trustee names that come in. We usually start looking at things like uh, what is their area of expertise or their primary primary professional um, area. Is it something like agriculture? And we have a list here of agriculture down to you know healthcare and and medicine. We have two doctors on the board right now, which is kind of cool. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not to advantage. We're certainly not getting any any advice from it. Um, but uh, we also have folks, uh, you know, connected to the. <laughs> I got a little inch, you know, uh, sciatica. Um, we also have a, a, just a, a list here, and this isn't meant to be exhaustive. It's really meant to just track, you know, who's who's around and who who do we have, or maybe identify. Gosh, we are we, you know, we missed Chris's point out. We don't have any other lawyers on the board. Well, do we really need more lawyers on the board? And I don't mean that in a pejorative sense at all. It just, <laughs> but we may say, you know, we that's not really something. Maybe we really need on the board, but boy, we'd really like to have somebody from, um, you know, another area um, that maybe we don't know, uh, maybe we don't know about. Um, we also, you know, look at specific attributes, um, you know, just demographic information, but we do look at things like county, for example, and try to put in there and, and I'll show you on another sheet, um, uh, another tab here that, you know, we have a lot of folks from Union County whose primary um, address is in a place like Union County. Um, that's, you know, not, it's not good or bad, but it may be something that we look at and say, well, we have a lot of folks from Union County. Maybe we should try to find uh, a trustee who can also fulfill some of the other goals of the board, but maybe coming from another area. Um, earlier on uh, in, in past with past boards, you know, had folks say, why don't we have some more folks from Harney County? We're missing somebody from Central Oregon. What about somebody from the coast? Uh, and, and we often ask, do we have alumni and people who are connected? Yes, we have alumni over the world. So we could pull the people in from just about anywhere. Uh, but at the same time, can they make all the meetings? Can they be here in person? Can they, would they have to zoom in? How would they, how would they make that work? Does it, does it fit for everyone? Um, we ask also, you know, about things like uh, some of the other diversity issues. Uh, if they're a veteran, um, you know, what's their age range? Again, this isn't meant to do anything else except classify or kind of tag who we, who we have. Uh, and then we really will will look down um, as uh, you know uh, for core competencies: um, administration, do they have back backgrounds in finance and film philanthropy, um, communications? Are they really visionary? Are they strategist? Are they a connector? 
uh, and that can help um, as certainly help the university as, as well. And then we look at what are the connections to EOU? Are they an alum? Um, did they go here? Do they have parents or do they have children attend here? Uh, or do they not have one at all? And that may, we may get a, a, somebody with a, an experience level in one area, but we need to bring them kind of up to speed with what's happening, you know, at Eastern. And do they have additional board experience? Have they worked at a board at this level? Um, it's a lot different than being, you know, maybe on a smaller community board, and then you come to a governing board. So, wow, we have a lot of rules and processes and um, things that that happen here. That may be something we'd want to make sure they get some additional training. Um, and I think for for many of you, you get on the board and find out that even though you think, oh, Eastern's a you know small regional university, it's, like, it's fairly complex. There's a lot of things happening at this institution. A lot of pieces go into all of our work, from everything from collective bargaining units to you know, student issues uh, to how we run the board to our finances and capital construction. It's quite a list. Uh, and then we try to tag things like board service um, the year they join, you know, would they be eligible for um, uh, for reappointment? So these are the some of the general um, pieces that we that we look at and again it's not a it's not intended to ever be like a check the box and oh okay this person Anna has this and she's this and she's a faculty member and she's a scientist and okay we're done we that's what we needed because it's that doesn't it's just tracking that information um to help inform what we're uh what we're looking for in a in a in a trustee um the other you can see in this one i've, I've filled out some of the um uh, some of our board uh attributes in here and um you can kind of see We've got, we've got pretty good, you know, pretty good spread across some of the areas of expertise and and professional um, experience. Again, the the um, it's not intended to be exhausted. Um, and uh, the well, wait, what I put in these boxes, for example, is uh, the dark blue is the areas that person's primary um, primary expertise area. So for like a, a George Mendoza, obviously, you know, K through 12 education, um, right? That's he's a superintendent of schools. That's his primary area, but he has other experience, um, in terms of board, uh, board management and human resources and things that we might flag, um, as well. And again, it's not intended to be a, a something you fill out and then, then we're done with it. So, uh, really the, this is to familiarize you all with, um, just some of the things we look to, we can share this out, um, and, and really have a discussion around the board of what are we, if we were looking at new positions right now, what would be some of the, what are some of the key attributes we'd be looking for um, to help narrow down, um, you know, maybe narrow down some folks that we were talking to. There's a lot, we could talk to a lot of different people. Um, we also know that once we start talking to them, they realize that oh, this, again, this is a commitment. This is a lot. Um, and it's not, uh, it's not something you can take very easily. We've had trustees in the past join and say, wow, this is more than I was expecting. Uh, and therefore, and rotate off the board. They just, I, this is, wow, I thought this was going to be easier. Um, uh, and uh, also to understand the level of complexity of the board it, uh, itself. So um, that's, uh, I can stop there and see one more, trying to watch time too and see if we have questions, but we're, we're, we're hoping that um, we might have some dialogue around those, those pieces of um, the puzzle. Thank you, Tim. Any comments? Yes. A couple of thoughts. Um, Education changed uh, in the last 10, 15 years drastically. A lot of the people who sit on these boards may or may not have taken for their profession online classes. They may do it now for hobby or whatever or taught. It would be interesting to have a perspective because it's such a large component of what EOU does is online. It would be interesting to have a perspective of an online person that either has received online instructions for their career and or has given them and possibly both. So that's one thought. The second one for me is many times when we try to paint the fabric of a community, community the spiritual contribution to that are left last. And yet faith-based uh, organizations, spiritual leaders are very important. So that is part of the fabric of our community. We heard it from one of our students today that what he brought them to this community it was that. And I don't know what that particular person saw, but I may not have seen the same thing in that way. So I think that, that could be another component that could add, add to the diversity of this board. Good, good points. I, I just would I would be remiss if I didn't point out that we have two trustees with extensive online experience. Um, Chris Cronin, who um, 
ran our John Day Center and, and was instrumental in our Division of Distance Education from its almost from its start. I think maybe from its start, it was first center, right? Or Ontario was first year second. Uh, Ontario and Hamilton were the first two centers, and Grant County was a couple of years behind, 1988, I think. So been around for. Yes, and um, Carrie Thompson is an active active um, online um, works with our rural sorry, ROI <laughs> regional outreach and innovation um, team as well. But yes, it's also important to to, to consider the different types of uh, folks and different audiences we have out there. Uh, Maurizio, if I understood what you're you, uh, I think you're sort of suggesting that these are additional criteria that we might measure, like like digital native could be a category or something like that and and then clergy or as a profession or something like around that that line we, we could give that some thought so what would a um an action item look like for um april would it be um a, your spreadsheet here would it be um yeah yeah what would it look like well i think uh and i I think this is addressed in the cover sheet. We would want um, some specific, uh, so the statute that, that motivates all this requires us to identify ideal characteristics. So we would be basically saying, when we go to fill this position, we are looking for people who have these characteristics. I would not overdo that. I mean, I, I think you might have multiple characteristics that aren't necessarily all going to be in one person, but they're, you're identifying gaps that you'd like to fill uh, so that you get a variety of people applying. I think that's still within the bounds of the statute. But I think it's that, yeah, we're looking for, we would like to have these kinds of people with these kinds of characteristics uh, represented in the applicant pool. May I, one, one more reflection. It's also important to understand how we communicate these criteria when we submit the name to the governor. I mean, do we list uh, check, check, check the check marks? Uh, yeah. Are we trying to paint it? And so, because that is part of the process. Do we take light blue, dark blue, mm -hmm. and we share this? You know, is that proper? way of doing it or well i think what the statute requires is that we report to the governor what the ideal characteristics were that we were trying to Correct. recruit also the governor can do her own analysis of how well the various candidates yeah. meet those thank you yep we could, we could do all the work and the governor could say that's great thank you i'm going to appoint this person mm -hmm. i was just reminded by um finance chair trustee stevens that we are about ready to um, move into your agenda item. So um, if we could just wrap this up, and it does sound like we're not ready for uh, anything formal today, but do you think, um, Chris and Tim, you have enough feedback? Oh, yes, thank you. Nice. Good discussion. Okay. Thank you. Um, any final comments before we adjourn? <laughs> All right, well, um, it is 1.49 and we will adjourn the governance committee of the Eastern Oregon University. Geez, I guess, yeah.
time, and we get started with our finance committee report. So this is the uh, April 2nd, 2024 Finance Administrative Committee meeting. Board of Trustees is called to order. Roll call. Christine Cronin. Present. Cedric Real. Present. George Mendoza. Here. Kelly Ryan. Yep. Chuck Hoffman. Deidre Schreiber. Carrie Thompson. Here. And I, Brad Seaman, is present. So we do have a quorum. Uh, okay. Uh, I have a few uh, housekeeping announcements, uh, which uh, Chris usually does. But anyway, <laughs> we ask everyone to please put your cell phones on do not disturb. Members of the media, if you haven't already done so, please sign in at the uh, sign in sheet at the recorder's desk in the back of the room. Likewise, anyone present in person who wishes to give public comment, please be sure to sign in at the sign-in sheet at the recorder's desk. To provide access to the public. The public have been invited to attend in person, and this meeting is being live streamed over the internet. Speakers must use the tabletop microphones, which are the only way that people on live stream can hear what we say. Also, make sure the mic is within four inches of your mouth as using the mic is also necessary for proper amplification within the room. If more than four mics are on at a time, however, they stop working. Therefore, please turn your mic off when you aren't using it. If you brought a laptop, a laptop or device, please be sure the speakers and the microphone are turned off. If you are joining us remotely, please keep yourself muted unless speaking. Trustees, in front of you, you will find the meeting agenda, travel reimbursement forms, please, and travel reimbursement forms. Reimbursement forms. Please sign the travel form and turn it into Angie by the end of the meeting. The committee did receive written public did did receive public comments for this meeting. Those comments were sent to the trustees in advance of the meeting. We did not receive a request for give all public comment or remote means. That concludes the announcements. Are there any other announcements? So at the beginning of these meetings, I've always asked uh, different members to speak about their experience or what they thought of. And I just thought I personally would, as I'm getting closer to the realm of my, my appointment here, uh, just talk about some of the things I think are important. I think, uh, and engagement with the students is really critical. And so for me, it's been very, very moving. And our last meeting, I was going to say that at the last meeting, but I didn't do that. But we had a, a wonderful time to get together with students afterwards. And I think only a few uh, board members made that. But I just want to tell you, I just had a wonderful time. I, I sat down with three different groups. The first group were uh, some young women. They were on the wrestling team. And they were some from Washington, Oregon. And they were just so motivated and so positive about Eastern. It was just wonderful to see. I then got to a table where some of the young folks are in agriculture, and they talked about the importance of the agricultural pro uh, programs that we have here and how important it was that they had such a good exposure to the to uh, our faculty and how close the faculty is. And that's really, to me, one of the wonderful things. But uh, and they were also positive. And one of them said, "I hear that I hear that the university is really in financial trouble. Don't let it close, please. Don't let it close." And I'm thinking, "Gosh, and Marty, we don't like to have that as an image." But they're they're, they're very concerned. Then the final group was a, a group of students that were in theater and music, and they were they were they were just wonderful. And they were uh, later on, they're getting ready to graduate and go on to uh, uh, graduate programs, and talked about how the connections between school here and the graduate programs where they are. So in any event, I just would say it's so so positive and rewarding to me to, to be able to spend time with students. So I just encourage you as much as you can, get a shot, because that's why we're really here. So uh, that's it. So thank you. I'm not rambling on there. So uh, um, the only other thing I was going to say at the beginning of the meeting, I just wanted to thank the community of Eastern and what a wonderful community to come together because our, our, we've been working so hard and, and Leanne will get to, into this later about getting to a balanced budget and we're lucky to have full fortune to have President Ryan to grasp this and to Leanne to lead it but as you read through the thing you can see how the community is getting together on this and people are putting in it and, and we're, we're engaging this as a community and so I think that's wonderful and one of the wonderful things is that they haven't 
and you'll see this, they have not decided they're going to rely on increasing enrollment or increased tuition. So they don't put this on the backs of the students and then we are going to do it. So I'm just very proud of the university for, for doing that. Okay, so first uh, item is a public university investment fund, PUF update. Uh, um, the second item on our, our this is a second an update of the Public University Investment Fund. The discussion will be led by Penny Burgess, the Executive Director, University Shared Services Enterprises. So, Penny, please proceed if she's there. Yes, I am. Thank right. you very much, and good afternoon, Trustees. Can everyone hear me? Yes, yes Penny. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to join you this afternoon to provide an update about the university's operating assets as well as some quasi-endowment assets invested in the public university fund. So included in your materials is an investment report for the second quarter of fiscal year 24. It's outlining the performance of the university's operating and quasi-endowment assets invested in the public university fund. You'll also hear me refer to it as the PUF. Um, additionally, there is market commentary that provides general discussion about the economy and the market performance during the quarter. So the university's operating assets are invested in the PUF, and as defined by its investment policy, the PUF provides university participants exposure to short and intermediate term fixed income markets. Five of the seven Oregon public universities invest and participate in the PUF. The underlying investment pools, as noted here on slide two, are the Oregon Short-Term Fund and the Core Bond Fund, both of these are managed by the Oregon State Treasury's investment team. The Oregon Short-Term Fund is, um, is managed similarly to a money market fund, so it provides daily liquidity, and they invest in um, short-term, high-quality, and very liquid fixed income instruments. And as you can see, the weighted average maturity of the securities within the portfolio says 0.35 years. So this is three and a half months. And what that means is the securities are maturing or turning over every three and a half months, which is um, very beneficial in a rising interest rate environment. Uh, the core bond fund invests in quality intermediate term fixed income securities with general maturities between three and seven years. Here you can see the weighted average maturity of the securities in the portfolio, just under four and a half years. Investment decisions are guided by the investment policy and the portfolio rules that define permitted holdings, any investment restrictions, and sector diversification requirements. The Oregon State University serves as the current administrator of the POF, and OSU outsources the majority of those administrator duties to my treasury management team at USSE. Next slide, please. Fixed income markets performed well for the one-year period ended December 31st of 2023, and this is primarily due to the attractive yields on shorter dated maturities, yielding somewhere between four and a half to five and a half percent for many high quality fixed income securities. And here on slide three, this represents a graph of U.S. Treasury rates across the entire spectrum of maturities between three months and 30 years, this is also known as the U.S. Treasury yield curve. Now that solid blue line represents rates as of December 31st of 2023, and that dotted blue line uh, is rates one year prior, December 31st of 2022. So as you can see, there's been very little change with the exception of um, the very short end of the yield curve around that three month area. Now, interestingly enough, during the calendar year, there was a quite a bit of volatility uh, around these interest rates, but obviously on a December 31 to December 31 period, very little change. Now, the current environment 
um, is really quite favorable for the fixed income investments held in the public university fund. So for both the Oregon short-term fund and the core bond fund, um, both funds today are yielding in excess of 5% yields. Uh, price volatility, we anticipate to be a, a little bit more muted. The Federal Reserve has hinted at their December meeting, as well as more recently at their March meeting, that uh, interest rates, at least Fed funds rates on the short end um, of the curve here, have likely peaked at five and a quarter percent, and they are now beginning to evaluate uh, potential rate cuts again on the short end of the curve um, sometime in, later in calendar 2024. Next slide, please. And this slide provides a summary of performance returns across a variety of sectors within the fixed income marketplace. Um, and our both of our funds invest in U.S. Treasuries, in U.S. mortgage-backed securities, as well as U.S. corporate bonds. Um, we do not invest in U.S. high-yield securities. And this is identifying performance returns um, for the, the quarter, the year to date, as well as the one-year period. So you can see very nice returns um, across these sectors. It's also uh, providing performance for the Bloomberg Barclays Aggregate Bond Index. Um, now, this is a very popular um, widely used fixed income index by many portfolio managers. Um, it's not the index that we use, um, particularly for our core bond fund, but just wanted to, to really highlight for you some of the strong performance, much of it coming um, during the, the fourth quarter, fourth calendar quarter of 2023. And, and uh, we're seeing, again, some nice returns in the uh, first quarter of 2020, calendar 2024. Next slide, please. So this slide represents a summary of the university's operating and endowment assets on deposit in the public university fund. And a copy of this material is also available in your docket. Uh, and we do provide this report to the university and available to this committee on a quarterly basis. So for the quarter ending December 31st of 2023, the PUF returned 2.3% um, for the quarter, 3.5% um, for the fiscal year to date. Now, there's two components to total return, the investment yield or the interest income, and the second component is price return. So the investment yield for the quarter was a positive 1.3%. Uh, and that's equivalent to an annualized rate of 5.3%. Price return for the quarter was a positive 1%. Um, so the two together equal the total return of 2.3%. Eastern Oregon had $32.6 million on deposit in the public university fund as of December 31st. Also, during fiscal year 23, Eastern Oregon received a $1 million grant from the state, and this is to be used for visual and performing arts scholarships. The assets are currently invested in the Public University Fund and were valued at $1,052,000 on December 31st. And because the corpus of these assets is intended to be held into perpetuity, I do recommend the assets be invested in longer term um, strategies such as equities or longer term fixed income. Uh, this would really help align the investments with the longer term objective of these assets and supporting growth of that corpus over the long term. So I'd be happy to discuss investment options uh, with university staff and this committee uh, when, when that's ready to be reviewed. Next slide, please. Here, this gives you a snapshot of just year-over-year -year comparisons. Um, so here we're looking at 
the operating assets again, um, as I talked about, for December 31st of 2023, ended with 32.6 million. Uh, one year prior, that was 32.3 million. So a slight increase of 285,000, but pretty flat year over year. From a total return perspective, um, that nice pickup in the interest rates and the yield over the last um, two and a half years uh, really helped support that positive 5.6% return for the calendar year. This is versus the prior year. That was a decline of 3.4%. And then again, seeing the, the benefits of the higher yields, uh, really supporting higher interest earnings for the university net investment earnings to short of 1.4 million for the calendar year of 23. That's a $922,000 increase on a year over year basis. And again, we see those earnings continuing um, to grow as we move here into calendar 24. Next slide, please. And then this is just a snapshot of the quasi-endowment assets. Not a lot of informational value here since the endowment um, was initiated, um, certainly during fiscal year 23. But um, you can see, again, ending market value of $1,052,000, a beneficiary of that uh, interest earnings already beginning to grow uh, for those scholarships into the future. This concludes my remarks, and I would be happy to field any of your questions. Very good. Some questions, folks? Chuck, did you have something? Yeah, I just have a question on the um, returns for the liquidity versus the core. Uh, I'm a little surprised that a um, three-month investment strategy results in a similar yield to a four-and-a-half-year strategy is that because interest rates rose and the 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 short term um did did so well or uh, that's what i'm kind of assuming it is um because otherwise it it brings to me um the idea is there an opportunity to move more than just the the one million into a longer investment strategy uh, i don't know how much we have to dip into this on a regular but how much you know you, we, we take out of this all the time but anyway so my question is uh, was it a really good year for interest rates i assume that's what's going on why the the 5.5 and the 5.7 are so close and number two is there an opportunity to move more than one million into a higher yield uh, long-term strategy or would that be unwise because we need the money in our pocket fantastic questions yeah and leanne did you want to start even a blind squirrel finds an acorn sometimes. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, and thank you for the questions. Leanne, are you able to share um, slide three again? Yes, I can. Uh, and, and you're definitely right. Um, here we have an inverted yield curve, and what that means is interest rates on the short end of the yield curve are currently higher than they are on the longer end of the yield curve. Um, we've had this inverted yield curve now for um, several, several months. Perfect, yes, thank you. Um, and so your shorter term strategies, such as the Oregon Short Term Fund, are um, yielding slightly higher interest earnings um, than your intermediate and your longer term. And so just to, to point this out, if you look at the three month, um, you'll see that's at five and a quarter percent versus all the way out to a 30 year at four, just over 4%. So um, within the core bond fund, we have been able to take advantage of other um, fixed income securities outside of U.S. Treasuries within the corporate bond range, the mortgage-backed securities, other asset-backed securities that do offer a yield pickup or a higher yield uh, than U.S. Treasury securities that come with slightly higher risk. Um, but yeah, definitely for the last 18 months, um, the shorter Dated securities and, and things like the Oregon Short Term Fund have offered um, slightly better yields and slightly better total returns. 
but we're now if, assuming that the Federal Reserve has a very clear crystal ball and that they aren't anticipating that uh, short-term rates have likely peaked at this area and assuming that inflation continues to, to come back towards their target of that two to two and a half percent longer term inflation, we really are beginning to enter more of a sweet spot for intermediate term fixed income products like the core bond fund, where we're able to lock in those yields on average for about four and a half years, but in be, kind of in between that three to seven year time period. So we really do anticipate um, over the next 12, 18, 24 months, um, the core bond fund likely is, is to outperform the Oregon short-term fund just due to um, the potential for shorter term rates to decline. Um, again, out longer end of the curve, it's so flat between a three-year maturity and a 30-year maturity today that it really doesn't benefit to go out any longer on the yield curve. Um, the sweet spot really is in that intermediate term range between that two to five to seven year period. So at this time, we don't see an opportunity set to really extend it out into longer term fixed income. So to, to answer your second question, um, we still think that the best opportunity set is with the, the core bond fund, as well as uh, retaining exposure to the Oregon short-term fund for the liquidity purposes. Thank you. Yes. Other questions, yeah, George? These are probably gonna be a little less on the, uh, just say on the fund growth, but more on just the, the operations of it. So just in case the endowment fund that we have is about a million dollars, at least that's what I got out of the presentation. Um, at least that's what I think I saw. And then that means that the operating assets is around $31 million. And I think my major question is, or at least wanting to understand it all is, the endowment is not a part of the EOU um, foundation funds, right? That's a separate bucket. Okay. That's correct. Because I think that has around 20 million, if I remember right, using my memory, somewhere in there. So the endowment is a separate bucket that we've somehow procured, and it's a really good thing for scholarships and other things that people want. And then the other part is the operating assets. Is that like the state fund giving you, hey, here's your state fund for operating this year, and here you can put it in this account, and then you can draw down as you pay people? Is that how it works? So it's less about, again, it's less about how we're it, growing interests or growing, but more about how it operates. Penny, do you want me to answer? I, it, the second part about the state funds, um, no, not exactly. Um, what Penny's dealing with is our cash assets. Um, so it's it's everything. It, it's all of our, our cash that's available um, to her to be able to invest. A very simplified answer that Penny can elaborate on, but it's not quite the same as the school districts that just draw down those funds. We get our funds from HEC comes into our bank account essentially, and then um, Penny and her team are able to invest that, those funds. Yeah, and so just to expand on Leanne's answer, it, it is, it, it does include the state appropriations received on a quarterly basis. It also includes the university's tuition revenues uh, and any other uh, grants that it may receive um, or research dollars that it may receive during the quarter. <clears throat> the majority of the really liquid assets, so if it's tuition dollars and state appropriations, other um, assets that are typically expended during uh, uh, the quarter um, or during the academic term, those assets remain on deposit in the Oregon Short-Term Fund. So because that is our liquidity fund, um, they come into the Oregon Short-Term Fund and, and then they'll remain invested in the Oregon Short-Term Fund. We really only look to invest um, assets in excess of cash flow needs into the core bond fund. So expectations is dollars invested in the core bond fund would be invested you know, at a minimum um, four to five years, preferably a little longer um, through a full economic cycle.
All right, other questions? Thank you. Uh, well, Penny, thank you very much for that presentation. We really appreciate it and uh, very important to us. So thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you all. Have a great afternoon. Okay. okay, our next item on the agenda is to review and discuss board statement number 11, which pertains to the E&G fund balance for the institution. This topic will be led by Interim Vice President Leanne Case. So Leanne, please proceed. Thank you, Chair Stevens. Um, this um, board statement number 11 materials are in your packet, some for review. I include a fairly short, um, simple cover letter as well as memo regarding the fund balance policy. And this policy is to be reviewed biennially by the committee. Um, I missed last year bringing it forward, so we're kind of in the middle of the cycle. Um, You'll see in the suggestions that I make um, biennially may be a little bit too quick to be reviewing this, um, especially with the amount of financial material that you receive, but um, that is certainly just a suggestion. For those of you not on the committee or that haven't been on the committee for long, um, we did a very deep dive on the fund balance and the fund balance policy back in 2000, really kind of started in 2018. Um, looked at it again in 20, the pandemic hit, we finally came back in 21 and were able to adjust our fund balance policy or um, board statement number 11 up. Some history on the policy, and this policy was developed by the Oregon State Board of Higher Education back in 2004. I am adopted by the Board of Education for the Oregon University system. Why is that important? Uh, we were a part of the system at that point in time. So it was everyone from the University of Oregon with millions of dollars um, to Eastern Oregon University with the smallest financial um, impact on the system. The Oregon University system had to come up with a way that really allowed for um, apples to apples comparison across the institutions. And this is one of the ways that they did this. At that time, all of our financial statements were done as one component unit, um, and we were just part of that. So I just provide you with that history because it makes a huge difference in where we're at today versus where we were when the fund balance was developed in 2004, which allowed for a minimum of 5% of a fund balance up to a maximum of 15%. Times have certainly changed since then. Uh, 2015, we became an independent institution owning our own finances. Again, it, it's just important to understand where that came from. Acknowledging Dr. Dense's uh, written comments that he submitted about the fund balance policy and that ours is perhaps too high at 20%. Um, that is the low end of our goal level, um, not the high end or the low end um, of our fund balance policy. So my appreciation to Dr. Dentz, um, I would be remiss if I didn't say that for bringing to our attention at the last committee meeting um, that we had not brought this forward for review. So I do appreciate that um, and appreciate his research as well on all of the other institutions that he looked at. This presentation, um, I'm just gonna walk you again through um, how we do reserve planning, um, fund balance planning, what we look at just as an institution. This is one metric of many metrics that we use to look at our finances. If we were only looking at the percentage of the fund balance, um, I would be concerned about my ability to do this job, as well as the institutional leadership. This is just one tiny thing that we consider when we're looking at all of our finances. Over the years, we've tossed around the difference between fund balance and reserve. We use them interchangeably. Uh, it's really just um, unrestricted funds that we have available in the education in general fund to use for our operations, for use for working capital, and to use to bridge when we don't have enough revenue coming in on an annual basis. The fund balance is technically considered the assets minus liabilities when you look at it. Um, it's a percentage with a fund balance as a percent of revenue um, is divided by the net is divided by the revenues um, is how we come up with that percentage. Um, it looks similar to the operating margin ratio, except for the operating margin 
um, ratio looks at all funding sources. So when you're looking at our, our financial statements and you see our ratios in there, or the HEC conditions report, they're looking at all funds available to the institution. This particular statement only um, refers to education and general dollars. The other piece of the fund balance, um, the history is it's based on um, the GASB 54, um, which guides us as far as um, what we needed to do from a governmental stand accounting standards perspective, as well as the Government Finance Officers Association um, were the initial um, places that were looked at for this policy. So what do the experts say? Um, they would tell us that we have to, we should maintain three to six months of operating expenses. Um, we probably will never, um, reach a six month operating level, um, nor probably should we. And um, that would mean that we have assets available that we should be reinvesting in the institution and in our students. I'm um, typically held at that six months for private institutions who have no other resources um, and are really just on their own. And um, for us, a three month uh, budgeted operating expense equates to about $13 million, 25% uh, of our revenues. So right now we're at 20%, just to give you some perspective. Looking uh, across the months, if you were looking from one to six months, you're looking at $4.4 million up to $26.3 million in our fund balance. Fund balance is projected at the end of this year to end right around 10 million. We look at the professional standards. Um, we look at a variety of things. Um, in my uh, bag over there, I have a whole stack of things that I was gonna show you between our financial statements from um, the SHEO organization, NACUBO, the Financial Government Board, um, all kinds of different areas that we look at to make sure that we're hitting the right metrics, that we're using the right metrics for to establish Eastern's um, financial position. But again, I just can't stress it enough. It's not one particular thing that we're gonna look at over the course of a year or long-term planning. Just some things for you to, to think about. Um, what's, the what's the appropriate level of reserves or fund balance we should have? Um, what additional needs for liquidity and future planning, future op financial obligations should we consider? And how are we measuring and evaluating our current reserves and position as we to improve performance? All of these things are interchangeable. Um, they go up and down, reserve planning to liquidity to financial planning and business planning. Um, and those are inverse and we go back right up the chain and look at all those things. It's a continuous cycle um, to ensure that we have financial stability as we move forward. When you look at um, just the reserve planning by itself, um, it's complicated because the reserves are one-time funds. If we use them, we have to replenish them. We don't have a lot of options to replenish uh, tuition and state funding, both of which are very volatile um, and they're not they're not guaranteed. So. You know, oftentimes if you, you know, use your savings account, you know that you're gonna replenish that through extra savings. Um, if we do that, um, we're either investing and saving up what the state has given us for operations or we're using our student tuition to be able to do that. So we have to be cognizant of that and make sure that we're balancing as we move forward. Um, there's very, um, very rarely significant financial issues that will impact only one year. So again, we're looking at multi-year planning as we move forward. It's not just something that happens in one fiscal year. I plan out five to 10 years in advance, depending on where we're at. Um, you know, rarely will something something significant happen like a pandemic in the middle of that, pan, of that planning. Um, but it did, um, and we were lucky to have the reserves that we had during the pandemic, which I will share with you in a minute when you look at the, the chart of what our, our fund balance looks like. We look at our reserves in three primary categories, and this is defined in the board statement, risk mitigation, investment capital, and working capital. And those things are all important as we look at how much money we have available to be used during the year. Primary uh, financial risks on the expenditure side, I'm, 
we don't have a lot of, of costs that we believe would hit in one fiscal year. Um, we talk a lot about what if the boiler breaks? Uh, what if something significant goes out that we have to invest in? It's probably not going to be a significant um, it's not probably not going to draw our fund balance down to zero. Um, we do have insurance to mitigate our risk, so we do use that. Um, just a um, not a fun fact, but a fact. Um, over the last 15 years, we've had 62 claims, um, which cost us $5,000 a claim um, or $310,000. So we rely heavily on our insurance um, policies. But what things on the expenditure side can impact us? I, at the last meeting, we talked about and approved the Loso Hall uh, renovation. $1.7 million um, we'll need to match for that project. That will have an impact on our fund balance. And that would be something that we may strategically budget for in the future, which would mean that we don't have necessarily a balanced budget in that year, but we would intentionally draw down our fund balance to help support that project. I'm not saying that's what we will do, um, or that that's what we plan to do, um, but that's an example of something that could have an impact on the expenditure side of things. Our revenue, again, is our most volatile side of things. Um, we are dependent on enrollment. We're dependent on the students that come here, and we're also dependent on the students that graduate. Um, so those things are all very important. We're also dependent on the state um, and the funding that we receive from the state. So any declines in state funding has a large impact on us. We're always planning ahead for that, hoping that it doesn't happen. Um, but we have seen years where the state has had to disinvest and we have to be prepared for that. We don't have a fallback anymore. We don't have an Oregon University system behind us to bail us out when we have negative cash. Um, so we have to be cognizant and aware of where we are in our financial position at all times. Our capital investments, um, our investment capital that we're using, again, um, talking about the Loso Hall project, the matching dollars just to be able to get bonds, um, that's significant for us. Uh, $1.7 million is a significant impact on us. We're going to spread that over multi, multiple fiscal years, um, but it is an example of where we are investing. New programs, new initiatives, um, infrastructure investments. Um, we don't get enough funding through the state capital side of things to be able to do all of our infrastructure. Um, if we need to invest in our infrastructure outside of something that would be covered through insurance, um, we would have to make that decision internally to use our fund balance to be able to do that. That's going to be outside of our our normal operating dollars. So um, we all know that there's things um, in Badgley that need to be repaired. Um, we have flooring and things that need to be done over there. Those may be things at some point in time that we just have to bite the bullet on and be able to um, use some of our fund balance to, to do some of those infrastructure things. Over the last few years, we've set up several academic programs. We've been able to do that because we did have reserves available um, to be able to stand those programs up and make those investments. So in those cases, we didn't necessarily use tuition dollars of our current students to do that. Um, we used our fund balance to be able to do those programs. Third, third purpose of our reserves is working capital. Um, we still have to pay the bills at the end of the day. Um, our average costs um, increase every year, four to five percent, uh, one to one, almost two million dollars a year. Sometimes more. Just depends on on the year. We have to be able to fund our um, our staffing, our wages, um, things that are unfunded mandates, uh, PERS costs. PEB costs, health care costs, things that come down from the legislature, things that are policy driven that are great ideas, but they come without money. And we have to be able to, to invest in those and to be able to fund those regardless of, of whether or not we receive funds for those. The dreaded slide of our fund balance. Uh, this goes back to 2003. Um, so you can see there's some pretty lean years, uh, 2014, um, that is indeed a negative fund balance. 
Uh, we are still part of the system. Um, we received funds to be able to move forward and the next year uh, we became independent. There were some investments made there with shared services and we switched over to the SSC of a student success and completion model. Um, and you start to see a climb out of there between 2015 to 2022. And in 20, uh, you know, the, the pandemic hits. Um, you would expect to see a little a decline there. Um, however, you all remember that we received a lot of funding from her from the federal government during the pandemic. Eight point two million dollars came into the institution just in that bucket to bridge costs between students and operations. So we were able to offset those costs that we were having um, reinvest in some of our lost revenue during that time. So we were able to push out that drop in our fund balance by a couple of years because we did have soft funding. If we had not had a fund balance um, at the level that we had at that point in time, um, I'm not really sure what we would have done. Uh, and, and if we had not received the funding from the federal government, it would have been very dire for Eastern at that point. Um, in 21, uh, the peak there of our fund balance, we also froze tuition. So we were, we were at the 29% of fund balance at that point and froze tuition. And that's what we were, that's what the policy doesn't require us to do, but it requires us to think in terms of that. And so that we don't just sit with a 29% fund balance and just do nothing about it and continue to raise tuition and continue to raise operations as we move forward. Going out further, you can see that we've stabilized. Uh, we're right in that 20% range, uh, $10 million, uh, and right at that level. Um, where the, the goal level, the bottom of the goal level um, has us sitting. Um, so that's kind of what our target is, is to stay in that goal level with the understanding that we may fall below that. Um, we may rise above it. Um, it just depends on, it depends on the year, it depends on our strategy, it depends on our, our outlook going forward. One of the other things that's important to remember, um, what we like to compare, and we're a highly competitive bunch in finance and administration, um, it's, it's not really worthwhile um, to truly compare fund balances and where we're at with, the, with other institutions. We don't know what they're doing necessarily. We don't know if they move things out of their fund balance into a more restricted fund balance. Uh, we don't know their operations. We know what they tell us. I meet with the budget officers every Friday. Um, so we have a, a good sense of their operations, um, but not necessarily what they're doing with their cash or what their fund balances look up. In Dr. Dense's written uh, remarks, um, he lists out all of the minimum fund balances. Um, and my only discrepancy there is, is they're not truly minimums, they're kind of like goal levels and stuff. So I pulled our, our Oregon Public Trues really. Oregon Tech um, last year ended the year with 24.4% of fund balance. Um, their budget this year is 19.2, forecast 19.4. Their low end is very similar to our policy at a 5% low end, 33% uh, on the high end with a goal level of 10 to 15%. They last looked at their policy, I believe, in 2016. Um, Western hasn't shifted much from the original uh, 5 to 15% that was laid out by the Oregon University system. They did change their goal level to 10 to 10 to 12 percent, um, but you can also see the year, where their year end was last year at 20 percent, um, what their forecast is at 18.5. Southern Oregon University um, has the lowest fund balance at this, this point in time, but they also have a very aggressive sustainability plan on the table in front of their board to talk about rebuilding their fund balance. Um, so, and then ours um, ending the year at 23.9, um, right in that 20% range with our low end of our fund balance at 5% at and our high end at 30% with our goal levels between 20 and 25%. As you can see, there's a, there's a wide range uh, across the institutions. I imagine in the list that Dr. Dentz provided um, as well, there's a wide range between all of those institutions. Um, the, GASB, um, which kind of drives all of this, you know, it's very, very specific when you say minimum and maximums. Um, so we avoid those terminologies because it adds additional auditing requirements. So um, 
more weeds, more weeds than you need to know. Um, I'd not make a recommendation. I mean, you'll see this again next uh, the next meeting on the 30th um, for an action item. Um, but I would just um, make the suggestion that the three components of the reserves of uh, the education and general fund balance um, are adequate. Those are those are things that we should be looking at and we should be considering. Um, the policy should retain regular review, um, but perhaps it could be less frequent than biennial. Um, again, you receive a lot of financial information. Now you're receiving it monthly. Um, so you know, I think from me, um, from Eastern's leadership, from Dr. Ryan, um, from the committee chair, where we sit um, at any point in time as far as our finances. Um, and the policy should remain flexible enough to provide EOU you know, leadership with the ability to grow the university. So that's really that you know, low end of, of 20. At 15, we need to talk about it. At 30, we need to talk about it. Um, but I just feel like we talk about the fund balance a lot, <laughs> which is probably why I didn't bring it forward because I, I think about it all the time. <laughs> Uh, a few additional questions I just added. Um, do you support those? Then these are things to think about for the next the next meeting. Really, do you su do you support these? Do you think the fund balance is in the right range? Is there additional information that you need um, to make an informed decision? Um, and is there anything else that you would like to discuss? So. Thank, well, thank you, you Leanne. That's really very good, and it's a whole lot in it, but. Uh... How about questions or comments? Oh, I'm sorry, George. Yeah. No, I really enjoyed hearing it. Um, great information. Um, and I'll just say philosophically, if any time we're in that 20% range, which it looked like it was, um, that's probably the sweet spot. So everything that you were doing, even the 15% to 30% and kind of the too low, too high made me think of a uh, um, Goldilocks and the three bears, like just right. What is just right? Somewhere in that 20, 25% probably is just right. Um, the other part for me was just as a reminder, I'm just using this as we adopted a, a, a budget that was a deficit model, correct? And we were operating at around 2 million below and that we were already using reserves. Is that, uh, 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 the, uh, the, uh, Leanne, you can back me up on this, but the, the budget was, wasn't, but there's uh, projected savings to uh, take care of that budget. And you might want to mention, Leanne, where we are with that uh, as far as your savings, because you, so with the savings, it won't, won't take it. Yeah, go ahead. Just do the reminder of what we did with the adopted budget. I just recall thinking that we weren't doing a balanced budget. We were doing a deficit budget and we were using reserves or, yeah. correct? Can you remind me of the numbers? Uh, you'll it's okay if you your don't. On. It's okay if you can't remember. I don't know if you. I think it was originally two point five. Am I correct, Leanne? Two point five was was going to yeah. be the use of reserves. That's that's my recollection. Because that was the word. Yes. Really have the right size or. Well. Yeah. I... <laughs> I uh, just want to remind everybody to be thoughtful about using the mics because it's helpful in general that people on the internet, but also people in the room uh, to understand what's being said. Were there bits of that, Leanne, you didn't catch? Correct. Uh, Do you want me to repeat the question? Yes. Just a reminder of the adopted budget. Um, I was thinking that it was a deficit budget that we adopted at around 2.5 million and we were using reserves, correct? Or, or you know, add more if I'm wrong. Yes, you are correct. And um, we were at 3.5 million um, and we have, we projected 2.5 in savings, that is temporary savings during the year. And then we will use off 1.3 million in our fund balance by the end of the year. And that will keep us at the 20%, right? Yeah, yeah 20.1, right? Sorry, Chuck, please. Well, thank you for that very comprehensive review of board statement 11. And I appreciate uh, you emphasizing that this is just one metric. Um, you know, in, in my experience uh, in, in private business and um, in city government and uh, professional organizations, uh, a one and a half month operating reserve is a death spiral. 
So um, going going in half um, to me is just uh, needing to do that is just a sign of, of of us not paying the sort of attention that that um, we need to pay attention to. That for me, you know, yes, we borrowed a million dollars from the reserves in the current year, but it's not like that was the first time. Um, I mean, you know, we have a, a, a history, a, you know, that, that I have learned since coming on the board of doing it time after time after time. So I, you know, I mean, clearly um, it, we, we can't keep doing that. So that's the thing that gets me is that, is that we, we just can't continue to use reserves or because or we'll end up being broke. And that's why I appreciate so much the work that, that, that you and the president and all the faculty and all of the students are doing to, on fiscal year 25. Um, I, I do thank Professor Dents for the work he did. Uh, and I would suggest, Mr. Chair, that, that you send him another letter thanking him for that. Um, I think that's only a, a, appropriate. But the last thing I have is um, you, you missed it this time. And so I'm thinking we ought to keep it at, at biennial review for at least one more time. Just saying. Leanne, if if we were going to increase the fund balance, how how does that happen? And, and is it through investment, or you know, I just I'm not not sure how that would happen. In, increases in the fund balance occur when our revenue over expenditures, um, our revenue is greater than our expenditures in one year. So, two thousand, um, two thousand and. 19, um, I mean, we had $2.5 million that we put towards the fund balance. And so we increased it that year. So you can see on this chart, every time it goes up, we've had more revenue than expenses in that annual year. Is that what you ask? I don't think so. It, it may be what I asked. I don't know that I understand now. It, uh, where does the... I mean, the money comes from, the increase comes from what are we, are we reducing operating costs? It's a combination. Okay. It's either um, in those years when we had additional soft money coming in, like the years of her funds, um, we've had several grants in the last couple of years where we've been able to offset operating costs. Those have saved us money. And so we've been able to put that towards the fund balance. Um, I will say all of that gets invested. Um, what Penny was talking about, that $32 million, all of our fund balances, it gets invested with that piece of it. So it's all part of the cash. Uh, the, one, the one thing that I thought uh, emphasized is the fact that we're not in the Oregon system anymore. And in that system, if we'd gone into negative cash balance, they would have well bailed us out. But my understanding now is if we go down to negative, that's it, we're bankrupt. So uh, we have a whole lot more pressure on us to, to stay where we are, and we're actually doing a good job. I guess I'll, I'll share just just one thing. Um, you know, when I when I entered into this role, I think one of my first meetings was was actually with Brad, and he um, came on very strong about balancing the budget. Um, and I think it's it's based on you know the years of experience um, on the board, and one of the things that I like about our current fund balance statement is that yes, there is a goal, but I I have felt over the course of this year that had I needed to. If we didn't reach the goal that we reached, and good gracious, I'm glad that we got where we are today because I think to Leanne's point, I do think the fund balance is somewhat of a distraction. <laughs> uh, I think balancing our budget is incredibly important for the university. Um, sometimes we're gonna have to invest. Sometimes I'm gonna need to ask for help, you know, to get LOSO done. But what I like about our policy is that there's embedded flexibility into it that allows us to invest in the future, it allows us to take care of, oh my goodness, that's a bad situation. Um, but it also, you know, it, 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 it allows for a measure of safety for the university, of course. And so uh, those are my particular thoughts. I have felt throughout the course of this year, whether or not it's true, 
that if we didn't meet that goal, that you all would understand and that you would allow me to, to go another year. Um, but the scary thing is, uh, you know, and you'll see this in Leanne's later presentation, had we not done the work this year, um, if we didn't raise tuition, we were going to be down to a fund percent of 10%, I'm sorry, fund balance of 10% by the end of the next academic year. And so I just think these conversations, although they're important, they need to be had alongside conversations about balancing the budget, one without the other, um, and, and not thinking about long-term strategy. It, it kind of misses the picture. And again, I have appreciated the flexibility that's inherent in the current policy. Thank you very much. Yeah, maybe sure. this is too simplified, but the state funds that we get, are those all completely earmarked for specifics? Or um, if, if by the grace of God, the state gives the um, university system more funding, does any of that go transfer into our fund balance? Um, so all of our revenue includes the state, what we get through the SSCM. Um, so none of it's specifically earmarked. What we do is we submit a current service level um, to HEC, and then they roll that up through the legislature to determine what our level of expenditures are going to be during the biennium. Um, and then the funding rolls back to us. Now, sometimes there are specific things, like next year, um, $667,000 will come to us, but it's earmarked specifically for behavioral health. So that is, we will only be able to spend it on that. Same thing this year with the Strong Start funds. We were only able to spend it on those specific things. So um, yes and no, but at the end of the day, if our revenue exceeds our expenses, we retain everything. We don't have to send anything back to the state. Um, we're not part of this that, that type of a state agency where if we don't spend it, we lose it. Um, we retain that in, in the institution. Took me a long time to get to that answer. Sorry about that. <laughs> well, thanks, Leanne. This has been a very meaningful discussion. Are there any other questions? I, I have one, and I guess... I don't want to go too far because I know it might be a little too uh, in the weeds, but I kind of think like just, I know that $31 million that we just talked about and how it was invested. Sometimes I still think what proportion of it, I, I knew the $1 million was endowment, but what proportion of it was reserves? What proportion of it was state operating? And my guess is that kind of through hearing everything, listening to everything, there, that probably like, 10 million of it is reserves and the rest was operating revenue and then it comes and goes and comes and goes and comes and goes. But am I accurate in how I interpreted all of it or am I off? Yes, you're you're accurate. The dollars are, you know, interchangeable, but but yeah, I mean, that's essentially how it works at the end of the day. Yeah, um, the agenda was, um, pretty intentional to start with the investment package so we could talk about that. So that was kind of fresh in your mind into this fund balance. And then we're going to, you know, drill down into the, the budget piece of it, but they're all, all going to go together um, throughout the day. Great. Well, thank you all. So time for a break. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we'll be back. It's uh, three. So we're back at three fifteen. Thank you.
Um, the next item on the agenda is another discussion item. It will be presented again by VP Case. She will be providing the committee with the first read of the preliminary preliminary ENG operating budget for fiscal year 25. So Leanne, please proceed. Thank you again. So as mentioned, the agenda was, was pretty intentional in the way that we moved through things. So was, everything was kind of constantly in your mind. Um, this is the first read of the FY25 preliminary ENG operating budget um, for next year, which starts July 1st. Um, you will see this again at the third meeting on the 30th, um, hopefully for recommendation to the board in May. And then a final budget comes back to you um, in October for approval. Started doing this a couple years ago, um, many actually now. Uh, rather than bringing you a final budget in this time of year and then coming back with a new budget in the fall, it's just easier to do a preliminary budget for you now. Um, I should start by saying this budget uh, has been um, both challenging um, and rewarding at the same time, which seems odd as we move through this. And um, it's been challenging because we had a lot of work to do as an institution. Um, these dark circles under my eyes, while I would normally say they're a result of calving season, um, <laughs> this year they may be a result of late nights um, and sleepless nights related to the budget. Um, rewarding, uh, because I have seen this institution come together, leadership, um, our staff, our faculty, um, to present this budget, all working together. Um, not that it's unusual, but it is challenging times, um, and we've not seen the adversary that we may have seen in the past. So kudos to good leadership um, as we move forward and, and work through this budget. Today, um, we're mostly going to look at the budget and how we close a $5.3 million uh, budget gap. Um, and then next steps as we go through the process this spring. Uh, the materials, again, are in your packet. There's more details in there. Uh, feel free to stop me if you have questions. Um, I tend to look at those a lot, so I may gloss over things that are that are far more important than I think. Uh, this particular slide shows you where we ended in FY23 as actuals and where we used 1.1 million of our fund balance, ending the year with almost 12 million in our fund balance. Um, or 23.94% uh, revenue, um, almost three months of operating expense. So again, all those things should tie back to the, the prior presentation. Uh, second column is the approved uh, adopted uh, FY24 budget, where we show the 2.5 million in temporary savings. Those come through salary savings, um, operating expenses that don't that we don't end up using this current year, um, all kinds of things that just reduce that five point that 56 million dollar expenditure budget. Um, but we would still use 1.3 million in our fund balance at the end of the year, bring our fund balance down to 10.6 million or 20%. So still within the goal range, um, but a use of that fund balance there. Um, I will say looking at the year end forecast with three with one quarter left of the year, we're gonna be very close to this FY24, um, possibly a little better. Uh, it just really depends on what spring term looks like for enrollment. The FY25 projection, um, very few changes in the FY25 budget. Um, and I'll explain those uh, in a minute and then they're also in your materials. But here's where you can see, if we do nothing next year, we don't raise um, tuition um, and we don't have any enrollment increases and our expenditures go up as they typically do in a given year, we would spend $5.3 million of our fund balance next year, bringing us down to that 10% range. So as Dr. Ryan referenced earlier, um, that's what we would be looking at. Um, and we have been grappling with um, really all year long. Uh, this, isn't, this isn't new. Um, 
we've known um, coming into this year what, what our budget would look like going into FY25. We have lots of expenses coming on. Changes in our revenue um, over the FY24 budget, these are things that I know today. Um, we're actually gonna see a decrease in our revenue. Um, always kind of shocking, but uh, this year we had a million dollars in our true plus PSU first tranche of money. Um, so that was built into our revenue budget. We obviously will not have that next year. It was one-time funding. And the state uh, allocation out of our public university support funds or SSCM, um, estimated about $666,000. Um, this is based on two things. Um, the state splits our allocation 49% in the first year of the biennium and 51% in the second year of the biennium. So we typically always see more money in the second year of the biennium. And then it also has to do with how we're, how we're funded through the student success and completion model based on a three-year trailing average of student credit hours as well as completion dollars. So both of those things are built in. What is not built in here at this point in time, because we don't have a whole lot of information on it, um, and the number is very confusing because we're also going to get $667,000 for the behavioral health money, um, but that is not built in here in revenue or expenditures. So you will be seeing those changes in the fall as well. Uh, no tuition increases, again, are built in here, um, but we can project based on the um, scenarios, the tuition scenarios that you will see later, anywhere between zero and $1.4 million in revenue um, from tuition. We're estimating flat enrollment for next year, so we're not building in any enrollment increases for FY25. That's intentional. Um, it's not where we hope we will end um, or begin fall of 24 with. Um, but as you've seen from several years, we've built in enrollment projections, added in that revenue, and it's not come to fruition in the fall. I just couldn't sit here again and, and do that. So, um, you know, going on the low end, um, using that conservative piece of me um, and just not adding those in. And we've also projected flat fee and other revenues um, and fee remissions, which are a reduction of revenue are set at 12.5% of gross, re gross tuition. So because we, in this look, there's no tuition built in, those fee remissions don't change either. Uh, looking at the expenditure side of things, um, we have a decrease in expenditures um, we're adding back in that $2.5 million in temporary expenses. We have wage increases, but we also have the million dollars we have built in this year for the True Plus PSU. Um, there's also decreases in our transfers from, from this current year. And then we have the $4.8 million in planned reductions. Um, that's the hard work that's come along in the last um, six months. Again, we knew coming into 24 uh, that we couldn't sustain the trend of using our fund balance. Uh, and as Trustee Hoffman mentioned earlier, it's just not good business. Um, we've done it um, and we had the means to be able to do it, but where we sit with our fund balance now, um, we have to do something with that. Um, we've looked at alternative revenue streams. We've reduced um, expenditures along the way for the last couple of years looking for efficiencies. Um, but with a $5.3 million use of fund balance, we had to do something a little more drastic um, and look at how we can do that prior to adding in any revenue from tuition. We always look at these four things. Um, very high level things when we're looking at closing a budget gap, the use of fund balance, um, not an option this current year. Um, looking at alternative revenue streams, um, we really focused on the operating budget, expense reductions and efficiencies, um, enrollment increases, we're not contemplating this year, and then tuition increases. Tuition increases are the last resort. Again, we didn't build them in prior to making decisions on the expenditure reductions. We went into the expenditure reductions without tuition. We wanted our students to be able 
to trust us that that was the last lever that we would pull, that we would do everything we could as an institution to reduce expenditures before we ask them to increase the cost of their education. You've seen this slide before, but I'm talking about the fund balance again, pros and cons of using the fund balance. It's not something that's, that's on the table for this year, um, but something, whoops, something that we just wanna keep in front of everyone um, as we work through the budget process. We did ask for across the board reductions. We ask every department, every vice president, every director, every budget manager to look at their expenditure budget and come back to us with a 10% reduction. We scaled that from three to 10%, um, but we were really looking for that 10% mark to be able to balance the budget. What we came up with through that exercise was $4.8 million, 8.41% in reductions. Um, that's huge. On, on our expenditure budget, it's a lot. And what it looks like when you look at de department, division, college, however you wanna lay it out, everybody's a little bit different. Um, you can see from the chart on the left, um, every department came up with something. Um, could have been, wasn't some were over 10%, some were under 10%, but this is where the collaboration across the institution really came into play. We looked at $3 million in reductions in compensation. So both salary um, and benefits, what that came out to is 10, <clears throat> we looked first at vacant positions as to not harm individuals. We looked at 10, we eliminated or defunded 10 classified positions three administrative professional positions, and 10 faculty lines. Filled positions, unfortunately, we're not able to get through the whole budget process without impacting people. We did have to look at our position eliminations that impacted one classified staff member and three, prof three administrative professionals. This number is actually four. We do have one person who is on what we would consider soft funding. So four, four administrative professionals, five lives at the institution. $545,000 of services. I just, uh, is that full time? Um, it, it, oh, sorry. Was that full, the, for those positions that were eliminated, were those full time positions or did it vary? Uh, no. Uh, Good, good ask. Um, uh, three are three of the five are full time. One um, actually um, stays employed. Was 0.75 under the um, early college initiatives program, um, and they are going to pick up the other 0.25. Um, so it's 0.25 um, out of this budget, and then 0.175 of another position. So three full-time, two part-time. Thank you. Uh, $395,000 in software, 86,000 in travel, and we are offsetting some of our expenditures to other funding sources of $787,000. The other funding sources are things like um, use of our lottery funds. So you've heard me talk during athletic presentations about the, the lottery funds that are available. Um, Angie and her team will be picking up operational expenses um, to help us during, to bridge this. Um, other areas are housing and residence life. Um, we'll also be picking up some expenditures both in the student health area, um, operations and management out of student affairs, as well as we'll be increasing their overhead um, rate um, at a graduated, graduated level, um, but it is impactful on their budget going forward. So again, just another bridging opportunity um, so that we didn't have to go deeper into people. This chart shows um, the current level, again, the same um, departments, divisions, colleges, what their current level expenditure budget is for this current year, what the reduction is, what that looks like in terms of the percentage of the their budget, um, as well as what their new budget is going to be going into next year. 
this is looking just at the reductions. It doesn't, there'll be salary increases. Uh, there'll be other things that go into this. So when you see this in the fall, if it's the same line, it, it won't be the same $50 million um, dollars it, because things that we know, like the salary changes, um, have not been input in at the department level. They have been baked in at the overall level. Not, in, not anticipating any increases in enrollment. Um, uh, that's probably not a fair statement. We're hoping for enrollment changes for fall. Um, I have not built in any dollars associated with any enrollment changes. Our tuition proposals, and because of where we're at in the time frame, budget and planning will meet this Thursday. Uh, they will submit their recommendation on the tuition increases to the president by April 12th. Uh, you don't have anything specific on tuition built into this current budget. Um, you will see that on the at the April 30th meeting at the second read. Um, but just as a reminder, because you all can do the math, a 1% change in tuition equates to about $300,000. So we're looking at a 5% increase in tuition, we're looking at $1.5 million um, that is added into our budget at that point. A lot of other efforts have been um, in action during the year. Uh, Dr. Ryan, Tim, others, you all, our students spend a lot of time in Salem during short session. I'm trying to get our funding for the True Plus PSU sustainability funding released to us, looking at additional resources for our Strong Start money. And we've continued to look at new degree programs. We'll be looking at the MSW program coming on next year. We've continued to invest in, invest in academic equipment and support. They're really, um, we've really tried over the last several years to not impact our students, um, that we continued to invest, even though we were using our phone balance, even though we weren't, didn't have a budget, a balanced budget, we weren't seeking additional tuition increases to make those things up, um, but we did continue to invest. Uh, we've also continued to look for alternative revenue streams. We still have the Title III funding for a few more years. Uh, uh, Dr. Newman has done a tremendous job of getting education grants to continue to reinforce um, our, our education degrees um, as we go forward. Um, and there's more there's more grant opportunities out there as well that we'll continue to seek um, for a lot of different purposes. So this slide uh, shows what it would look like. Um, our, the FAR column, the FY25 projection, projection, projection. Um, this shows uh, what our budget looks like with the $4.8 million built in. At the end of the day, we'd still burn off $433,000 in our fund balance. So this is really, as we move through the rest of the day, um, this is really where we're going to use the tuition increase to bridge that four hundred and thirty-three thousand dollars. <laughs> Just <laughs> I work on my terminology. <laughs> Hillbilly. Um, so we, you will be seeing in our tuition proposals um, four hundred thirty-three thousand. Um, in a tuition proposal, you're thinking one percent, one and a half percent tuition increase. It's it's not necessarily realistic. We we do need to build some capacity into that um, because we have some other expenses that are come that will no doubt come through. So um, you probably will not see anything that shows us just being at net zero at the end of next year. Again, just on the timeline, um, back in front of you, April thirtieth, um, and then a final the preliminary budget to the board in May, and then coming back in the fall to present the final FY25 budget. Whoa, questions? Questions, please? We did We did have some good questions as we went along there, but certainly, yes. I, I don't have a question, but I just wanna again say this is phenomenal work and and congratulations to everybody involved. Uh, having gone through this um, on multiple occasions, I know how painful it is. So thank you. I mean, it's it's great work you're doing. Terrific work. I, I just want to chime in because I lived through 
this kind of thing in my tenure at EOU. And um, what I'm really impressed by is the collaborative effort of the entire university in um, in uh, helping to um, address the the deficit. And uh, I I don't recall that kind of a collaborative effort to that extent. I think it's really, I know it's really hard, but um, that's important to do for the unity of the university. So I r really appreciate the leadership and Leanna's always excellent work. So thank you. Thank you to Dr. Ryan for leading that. Yeah, data, because I also can speak to that. And there have been times where this budget reduction have been very contentious. Uh, and um, so kudos to, to uh, all of you involved in this process because um, definitely has been a diff, he has had a different spin by far from what I, I mean, I've been here 30 years, so <laughs> I, can, I can tell you that. So uh, well done. And, and I also absolutely uh, appreciate that um, you know, looking at the tuition is the last resort because we are, where we are, a rural access, um, you know, university for the students. So I think that's that's really important to keep it like at the forefront of all, all our decision, budgetary speaking. Well, thank you all. That was that's very good and very positive. Okay. Uh, the 2024-25 room and board rate discussion has been postponed until April 30th uh, meeting. It will be presented at the meeting as an action item at that point. Um, so uh, for our next topic, uh, we will hear from the ASEOU Finance Director, Drew Blusco, regarding the 2024-25 proposed student incidental fee. Drew, please proceed. Thank you for being here. All right, thank you guys for having me and for giving me some of your time here to talk to you about the upcoming year's um, final allocations, assuming you guys approve it, um, for the SIF funded units. Um, so I know this has been shared with you, so I'll keep it short, sweet, and to the point. Um, this is the best budget going into next year. Um, last year, I made the mistake of, we had two deliberations meetings, we had a long appeals process because I hadn't gone into it with a plan. I had gone in, thrown it to the room, and said, hey, what do we do here? So we had a lot of argument, um, which is productive sometimes, but last year it was not. So this year we went into it. Um, we met beforehand. We had an idea of what we wanted to do, and we were able to get this done in one deliberation meeting, and we had zero appeals from units because they recognized that this is the best that we could do for them. Um, and I will tell you um, what I told the other units. This is a $22 a term fee increase for next year. There's no two ways about it without cutting units. This is an example of students on the student fee committee looking at the units and the good they do for campus and saying, we need to pay for this, they are worth it. Um, at $376 a term next year for on-campus students, we are still the cheapest in Oregon. Um, we are now nearer to the pack, um, but that is just what we have to do. So I will say that I am hopeful that whoever replaces me next year, um, assuming you guys approve the $22 a term increase, will not come before you with another $22 term increase. This is made with the future in mind um, to stop the bleeding of the SFC, get us back on track, and as you'll notice, put some into our reserves so that we don't have to do this again. So with that, I'm open to any questions. Tell me you budgeted for paper and ink this time. We did. ASCOU is restructuring a little bit to do more with less. I just wanted to say um, this being, you know, um, what you're presenting us this year, that on the record, I really appreciate Drew stepping into this role. Um, I pulled him on the committee when I was uh, <clears throat> sitting on it, when I was chair, and uh, threw him into a little bit of some of that role. So I'm really excited to see some of the work that he's done and just how far you've come along. And uh, I mean, I've already looked this over. I definitely see exactly why you guys did what you did. Um, but yeah, I really appreciate the work that he's done. Um, you know, couldn't, couldn't have been picked a better person, I don't think. 
Well, I'll, I'll just I'll just take credit that Drew's from John Day. <laughs> so thank you. You're welcome. We send we send only our best to EOU. Um, I, my, I do have a, a question. I don't want to put you on the spot, but of course I'm always thinking of online students. So uh, and I I realize that's really not um, where, where this is centered, but. Um, are there oper and I saw how um, if a student is taking uh, even one class on campus, they would pay this fee, which makes a lot of sense to me. Um, are there any opportunities for online students to take part in some of the programs that are funded by the student in incidental fee? That is a great question, and there's no denying the fact that the majority of these units do the majority of their work for on-campus students. Um, that's part of the deal. That's part of why on-campus students proportionally pay such a higher portion of the fee. Um, I will say um, one easy example is uh, the SEED conference. Um, while SCMA is not the multicultural center, um, SCMA does work to plan the SEED conference. Um, and I know they do other conferences that are available for online students free of charge. Um, so that is definitely something. But it's really hard for these units, a lot of them, to do online things because they're based on campus. All, everyone involved works on campus. There's students on campus doing these things. I do know that there is online student involvement. Um, I know for a fact that trap shooting has uh, an online EOU student from somewhere in the Midwest um, that travels to trap shooting meets with them all over the country and participates in that. So there is online student involvement in these. Well, thank you, Joe. It's certainly impressive to see how many activities the students have here. I think it's really important. So thanks for all you've done. Okay. So uh, next we're going to go, uh, we'll hear about the proposed student health service fee from VP Colleen dunn Casio. Colleen, saying that right? <laughs> Thanks, proceed. It's all right. You said the first name right. It's all right. I just got to get my PowerPoint together, so give me just a second. Yeah, you can start. I can't do it without PowerPoint. Oh, Thank you for your patience. Um, so coming before you today to talk about the student health fee proposal that we have coming forward. How do I forward this? Oh, I see. Okay, thank you. And wanted to share with you some information, um, give you an overview of what we're proposing. Uh, wanted to share with you here the Student Health and Counseling Center staff and just give you an idea of who's work, who works there. Um, on the left is the Student Health Center and all of that staff are from OHSU. Uh, we have Megan Brazine, who is our healthcare provider, Raylene Isley, who is our family nurse practitioner and new clinical director. We have Kathy Patterson, who is the office manager. And then we have Melody Grubb, who is the patient assistant specialist. Again, they are OHSU staff. On the right, uh, is the Counseling Center staff. We have Marianne Weaver, who is our licensed psychologist and director of the Counseling Center, and Missy Brown, who is our new clinical counselor um, last or this fall. Okay, I'll get situated here. So one of the things that I wanted to share is currently EOU students are paying a student health service fee of $230 
per term. This allows students to have access to comprehensive medical services, mental health counseling, access to athletic trainers, and, uh, through a referral through the Student Health Center, as well as uh, referrals to the behavior, uh, behavioral assessment team support. Keeping in mind that while students pay this $230 fee, they are not charged additional fees for appointments, and almost all of the services provided are there are no additional costs, with the exception of maybe a lab fee or something to that effect. It just depends. But majority of there are no additional costs other than the $230 per term. The staff provides comprehensive care, as I've shared, that attends to emotional, mental, and physical well-being of students. And this does align with uh, the Identified Ascent 2029 goals. For 2025, we are uh, proposing an increased rate of $9 per term, which would be a 200 that would leave the service fee of $239 per term, and this would be a 3.9% increase. The students that are impacted by this increase are those students that have at least one on-campus course or are part of athletics or who live on campus or those that opt into the student health fee. The reasoning uh, for the proposal, uh, this increase will assist in covering the new costs of the contract going into fiscal year 25 and some of the costs associated with the transfer out am amounts, which is about three, a 3% increase of EOU staffing. The EOU staffing includes athletic trainers, student affairs office staff, and the counseling center staff. It should be noted that the OHSU contract was reduced by approximately $55,000 last year to better align with the financial sustainability of the budget while still affording care and access to our students. The health center currently operates at a two and a half day work week versus the four and a half days uh, in prior years. This has not impacted the counseling center staff. However, they are still at their four and a half or five day service. Um, it has only uh, affected the OHSU uh, health services. None of the OHSU staff had uh, any reductions in their salaries as a result of this uh, reduction. So if you want more information on that, please uh, do have a look-see the, at the link within the proposal that has been shared. Historical rates, um, this identifies, this uh, graph identifies increases from the budget. There is a 46 point or 45.6% increase in this fees over the last 13 years. This is to uh, meet the growing cost of healthcare, but also to correct the budget from its unsustainable levels at this time. Increased costs, lower revenue, COVID-19, et cetera, all impacted the budget significantly, causing the fees to rise and we are trying to realign. During the 22-23 academic year, an advisory committee comprised of students strongly encouraged the university to take action, such as improving marketing. However, they did not want to see a closure of this, of this structure. They were agreeable to limit the services provided in making it more financially secure. So that's how we came to coming down to two and a half days a week. This slide here, comparative student costs for health fees um, with the other institutions across Oregon, gives the comparison of others 
Um, but it does identify uh, EOU as having the highest rate for a health fee. However, it is not apples to apples comparison because some institutions will bill insurance or charge for individual services, whereas EOU does not charge uh, for most services provided, as I've previously shared, um, if there's a fee for a, a lab work to that effect. Uh, but most of it, um, they do not pay additional fees. The overall budget, or health budget, I should say, um, as we talked about previously, last year, we renegotiated the contract to be for more financially sustainable while also maintaining services. The Student Affairs Office is working with Residence Life on an agreement to support the Student Health Center, which equates to approximately $50,000 annually towards this budget. In addition, we are assessing the possibility of expanding revenue sources, such as allowing in-state residents to pay a specific mental health counseling fee that would promote access to care while supplementing the revenues generated. It is dependent upon the capacity of our counselors, the needs of students, and the development of the fees pro uh, process itself. The OHSU contract will be up for renewal this year. So um, that will mean that we need to evaluate student needs versus financial sustainability, or sustainability. We will need to undergo a similar RFP process that needs to be in alignment with our financial reality and student requested access to care. That's it, $9 increase, $239 a term. That's what we're proposing. All right, yes, a, a few questions, go ahead. Yes. Go ahead, Anna. Oh. I, w I want to understand whether this fee is something that the students choose to pay or is it for everybody, even if they have their own health insurance? Correct. If they have their own health insurance, it doesn't matter. If they are a student that has at least one on-campus course or are part of the athletics or live on campus or opt into the fee, they are required to pay that fee. What do you mean opt into the fee? So if we have an online student that finds they need counseling services and they are within the state of Oregon, because we can only service students in the state of Oregon, they can opt in for that fee and be able to get telehealth counseling um, through the counseling center. And so they would have to opt in for that $239 each term. Thank you. Welcome. I've talked to President Ryan a little bit about this, but, but in no detail. I'm absolutely convinced that this can be more self-sustaining. Um, and one of the advantages is you have a couple of physicians on the board who, who can help with that. Clearly, the decision to um, not bill insurance was explicit and and I get that. Um, I, I wanna make just one analogy. When I was on the OTEC board, um, we had these things called unclaimed capital credits. And what that means is when you um, pay for electricity through OTEC, um, you are a member and then because it's community owned, over time you get a certain um, uh, capital credit back. The, the vast majority of those capital credits are funded by EOU students. And why is that? Because they buy electricity when they're, they're off campus um, and then they leave, OTEC can't find them. And so millions of dollars have built up and that's where the OTEC scholarships come from. Um, so, you know, we had all this money um, built up on the backs of students. And so, as I said, we started doing the, the, the scholarships. Um, 
OTEC now has a foundation to manage those scholarships. I think there's potential grand dollars from OTEC. I don't see any difference between providing an EOU student um, uh, a scholarship and and helping them obtain health services while they're at the university. Another thing is um, a lot of students are eligible for Medicaid for the Oregon Health Plan. And I realize that um, that that you know we're we're not billing Medicaid, but it's really the responsibility of the state of Oregon to provide them health insurance. And since we're very fortunate to have Medicaid services in Oregon provided by community organizations called CCOs, I think there's an opportunity to enlist the support of the CCO, just like for the mental health counseling and medical social work scholarships, to enlist their support in in helping the university bill those students. Um, we actually, I probably shouldn't say this, but we actually bill ourselves for some health services. So, I mean, we, we, we do do that. So anyway, I guess what I'm saying is, you know, you know, I support the 9%, everything goes up, especially healthcare, but I think there's um, uh, maybe some dollars that, uh, that, that can be found that, that will, help make it um, more sustainable, especially since you're going to renegotiate a contract mm -hmm. next year. So to, to the extent that I can be of any assistance in working through that, I'm, I'm more than happy to help. So Great. Thank you. I look forward to conversation because, you know, we want our students to be serviced. We would prefer it to be open four and a half days a week, right? Most often students get hurt later in the week. They're open at the beginning of the week. Um, so, yeah. Uh, open to that very much so. Okay. Uh, I, I would just say we have a lot of challenges, and I certainly think two and a half days a week is not uh, accept, really acceptable. I don't think you know that's people's health don't just do two and a half days a week. So we really need to work on that. I was looking through the financial support you get, and you get uh, forty five thousand to sixty five thousand dollars a year from. Uh, residential life. What is residential life and where is that money coming from? Uh, residence life has a, um, they're an auxiliary fund, funded unit within student affairs. And so their funding, they have reserves um, for within their, their capacity, their savings. And so as, because they are part of student affairs, we are, um, tapping into that to help offset and help us get the student health center back on track. Um, so we're um, bar not borrowing, but we're taking $50,000 a year. Say it again. Yes, because majority of the students do live in the residence halls that are utilizing the service. Okay, well, thank you. I see, I see we have some challenges in the future. Yes. Dr. Hoffman will help us straighten us up. He does. <laughs> uh, any other questions, folks? Well, thank you very much for doing that. Okay, finally, we'll uh, conclude our discussion items uh, by hearing about the tuition setting scenarios uh, from Vice President Leanne Case. And Leanne, please proceed. It's me again. I don't know why I can never find these things. That one? Yeah. The tuition one? Mm -hmm. Tuition? I've completely lost my ability to multitask this last six months. So, sorry about that. Um, I um, 
promise this is the last presentation of mine today. Um, it's that time of year, um, again, built the budget around, um, you know, kind of building up to this moment. Um, optics as well as, as everything else, tuition, the last lever we want to pull. Um, it's important um, that we stay affordable and that we have access to the institution. Um, one of the ways that we do that is by not having substantial increases in our tuition rates year over year over year. Um, we have um, a very, uh, what I would consider a pretty robust uh, tuition setting process here at Eastern Oregon University. And we combined our tuition advisory committee, the TAC that you see in your materials with our budget and planning committee four years ago, I believe, to create one committee. Some of that was because we were seeing the same students in both committees and it was just taxing them um, because they were having to show up at two meetings um, every month. Um, so we just put them all together. And also budget and planning has such a broad uh, spectrum of individuals on the committee. It just gives a better presentation. Um, they can weigh in more. They they represent various areas across the institution. So we, we look at that. Um, they have had, um, they started talking about tuition at their very first a committee meeting last fall. We walked them through, similar to what I'll do today, they walked them through the history of tuition. Uh, we walked them through, you know, affordability for students, what net price looks like for students. I'm um, building up to decision making. They run models. They have the ability to look at different um, enrollment models, different tuition models. I'm, I have done a pre, two presentations with students, two different tuition forums um, for students to talk about you know, what their needs are and their considerations. Through all of this and after the Budget and Planning Tuition Advisory Committee meets on Thursday, um, they are required to present their recommendations, deliberations, and observations to the president for recommendation going forward. That's a requirement of House Bill 4141, as is so much of, of this information um, that gets provided specifically to the students. The Tuition Advisory Committee uh, reaffirmed their guiding principles this year. Um, they've had these for several years for obvious reasons. Um, maintain the best value position relative to other Oregon public universities. Um, continue to build and maintain financial stability um, to improve our mission fulfillment um, and serve our regional access by ensuring affordability. Those are the things that they start with um, and then they drive drill down from there as we start talking about actual dollars. When we try to balance off those, those principles um, with the balanced budget, especially when we're looking at a $5.6 million um, budget deficit, um, the first thing that we take into consideration is how it impacts our students. And what's the financial burden for our students gonna be? Are they still gonna have access to education? Is our education at Eastern a value to them? Will they come out of here with good career choices? How do we best in, utilize our financial aid packages, whether that's federal, state, or the university level of financial aid? Is it, are our fees and our rates transparent to students? Do they know how much they're going to pay when they come to Eastern, when they make that decision? How long does it take for them to get to their degree? What's their student debt going to look like when they get out of, of college, when they're complete? Um, and what are the impacts on equity and diversity? Um, all of those have multiple lever, le levels of things entwined in them that we consider all of the time more sleepless nights for me. Uh, we also take into consideration what the various rates, are, tuition rates are at the, at the Oregon Public Universities. Um, we look at a comparative analysis from Wiley uh, as far as our off-campus tuition um, comparisons. I do that because they have more resources than we do. They can look nationally, regionally, um, locally at all of those areas. So I utilize them as part of our contract um, so that they can provide those things. As you can see, 
Um, they've done this for this current year. This is um, our rates for 23-24. Um, average cost of national programs, and these are all just online um, or off-campus programs. Nationally, the West and then regionally ranked programs. Uh, the FAR column is what our, our current tuition is for in-state um, off-campus programs at $286 this current year. So you can see in all categories, we are currently below um, the average cost and the median cost in all those areas. Um, we consider what our state funding scenarios are gonna look like for this coming year. Um, it's always easier in the second year of the biennium, at least we know um, what the big pot of money is. And um, we know that we'll get 51% of the allocation. And um, what we don't know is student credit hours and degree completion in this current year. So there is some movement that happens when we true up in the fall, but um, that's where you saw that $666,000 um, in the budget presentation coming from. Um, we do consider the net impacts um, of what our financial aid packages look like. In 22-23, um, just again, in fact, so that you have it, a, an average student with family income of around $55,000 paid $19.97 per credit hour out of pocket. Um, that's a freshman um, so we get a lot of aid to our freshmen. Um, we do a separate presentation about the net tuition pieces of it, but a couple of areas that we're gonna have to look at is really our fee remission structure and how we move forward in the next couple of years where we invest in our students, who we be investing more in our sophomore, junior students, um, as opposed to our freshmen, because freshmen come in with so much from local money, Lions Club, all of those areas giving money. So they, you know, you, get them in here and they, the tuition looks low, their costs look low, and then the next year they skyrocket. So just working into our retention areas there, but pretty big lift on our on our fee remission um, look going forward. Um, we obviously uh, refined our expenditure budget um, and focusing on the recruitment, retention, and student success, um, hoping for increases in our enrollment for next year. But of course, um, as mentioned, we built it on flat enrollment. Again, the other action, they talked about this in the budget presentation, so I won't bore you with that, but there's a lot of work going on. Um, we're not just focused on Eastern. I'm um, here in the region. A lot of work is being done at Salem. No increases in enrollment. Uh, just as a reminder, I'm... Um, well, we have in-state rates, resident rates, and um, non-resident rates, out-of-state rates. Um, for our on-campus resident students, um, we still offer a lot of resident rates, even if you don't live in the state of Oregon. So our Compact of Free Association, our COFA students, they pay resident rates rather than non-resident rates. Um, that's good for us. We also get funding through, um, currently through the SSCM to offset those costs. Um, our Washington, Idaho residents um, pay in-state rates. So all of our surrounding areas are paying in-state rates. Armed Forces personnel, um, in-state rates. Veterans, um, most veterans, some veterans. Carrie can correct me if I'm wrong, pay re resident rates. Um, tribal members um, also pay resident rates. So while we publish a non-resident rate, there's not a lot of students that actually end up paying that non-resident rate. This slide was, um, I put this together mostly for our students, um, but I think it's also important for you to recognize as well. Um, current credit hour per credit hour rate for undergraduate on campus is 191.50. We take 12.5% off of the top of that, $23.94, and put that towards our fee remission budget. So the $3 million, the $3.3 .3 million in fee remission, that's where that's coming from. Tuition rate then uh, available to cover our costs of $167. 33% uh, goes to instruction, 25 to academic support, which includes uh, uh, regional outreach and innovation as well as the library. Uh, student services, facilities and maintenance and our institutional management and support. And the good thing here is that instruction um, and academic support are the highest percentages there. That's where we would want our funds to go to. This is based off the natural classifications in our financial statement. 
tuition increases since 25, since 2015 to 16. Um, this is just tuition. So in uh, fiscal year 16 or 2015, 16, 140, 50, 23, 24, 191, 50 is 36.3% or $51 increase. Uh, on average, uh, $5.67. That's our on-campus undergraduate. These are the different rate categories that we have. So you have on-campus versus on-campus, um, WUI students, non-resident, graduate students, um, and all the different classifications. So just a, a brief look at where we were and where we are today. Uh, Colleen shared this with you um, earlier, but this is our twins. This are 23, 24, where we sit with all of the other institutions in Oregon or all the other public institutions in Oregon, on-campus undergraduate um, resident students, um, tuition plus mandatory fees that are required. And the, the thing that I like to point out is where do we sit? So these percentages um, in the middle there, where do we sit in relation to the other public universities? We said 18.5% behind Oregon Tech, um, but we're only 3% behind Western Oregon and 29% behind Oregon State, 4.8% uh, behind Portland State University. This is something, um, as you saw in the guiding principles, this is something that we really, we really focus on because we do want us to be the most affordable school in Oregon. Um, so we're always cognizant of this, uh, but it does include the fees piece of it as well. One of the drivers for how we set tuition, um, the HEC requires us to go before them if our on-campus resident tuition rate plus our mandatory fees exceed 5%. Um, and that's really 4.99 because I had a calculation at one point of 5.01 and they made me change the something. Um, so I'm very, very aware and I make them check it every year to make sure I'm right. Uh, so looking at what could our tuition rate go up to before we had to go before HEC? And I don't, I don't want to just imply that we would not take the risk of going in front of HEC. Um, there may be a, a time where we have to do that. And we actually talked about that this year. You know, was this the year that, you know, we've got a $5.3 million budget deficit. Do, should we go before HEC? Should tuition go up more than that? At the end of the day, um, we rolled that back. Um, good conversations to have all around, um, but that's not where we want to go as far as the optics for our students. So thus, we reduced our expenditures by $4.8 million. This chart represents what our tuition could be if the student health fee goes up by the $9 that you saw in Colleen's presentation. The only thing that counts towards us in this calculation for mandatory fees is the health fee and the building fee. Student incidental fee and the HOKE fee that you saw on the previous slide of all these mandatory fees, they don't count in this calculation because they're owned or there's a referendum that was put forward by the students. So HEC doesn't have us include those, which is, is helpful for us. Uh, we are not changing or proposing to change the building fee rate. So the only thing that's going into this is what our tuition would look like and then the $9 service um, health service increase. So we could go up to 5.2% in tuition um, with the $9 in student health and still stay under the 5%. So, all of these scenarios are built off of that 5.2%, the maximum allowable by heck. It can be anything under that. Theoretically, it could be anything over than that, um, but then we have to go before heck. Several scenarios, A through F, included in your materials. And these, are the, these have all been presented to the Budget and Planning Tuition Advisory Committee. And they, uh, they were sent out a survey of which ones they were leaning towards the most. Unfortunately, out of all the committee members, they pretty much split on all of them. So it wasn't a super helpful survey for me to be able to say, we're gonna pick this one versus this one, but I'll just walk you through the philosophy on these. 
This scenario looks at where we where the tuition rates could be in a relative position to where they are right now. So um, undergraduate non-resident in 23-24 was 259% of undergraduate on-campus resident rates. Holding true going forward, what would those rates look like? So you can see the middle columns there are the ones that are important. And then the far column, is what you're looking at as far as revenue generation. So you generate $1.3 million, almost $1.4 million in all of those various categories. And then you can see the differences in both price and percentages. It depends on how you want to look at it. I like to give you lots of options. Uh, the second option is looking at a flat 5.2%. That taking that undergraduate on campus percentage and just inflating everything across the board. Again, it generates about um, 1.3 or well, $1.4 million, um, but it does change the rates substantially when you do it that way. Uh, the other metric that I looked at was what was the two year average inflation rate? Just to, you know, we're still under, even at raising everything up to 5.2, we're still under um, what inflation was looking like. Same theory in scenario C, I believe, uh, only is $10. So 5.2% equates to $10, increase everything up by $10. The WUI rate goes up by 15 because it's 150% of the undergraduate rate, so it doesn't change the same. Uh, freezing tuition, I, I'm obligated to put this one in there. Uh, this is what frozen tuition looks like. Um, this one, um, this one is the most complicated probably to explain. Um, two years ago, 21, fall of 21, fall of 21, fall of, fall of 21, um, we decided to, to add a non-resident off-campus rate structure um, and We'd always had one rate for off-campus regardless of where you lived. Um, so a few years ago, we decided maybe we should look at that because we don't receive state funding for out-of-state students. So was it fair to just take all of our state funding and spread that across there? Um, we decided no. We implemented a non-resident non rate for off-campus. It's not super popular. Um, not not going to lie. It's kind of hard to explain to students. Um, I hear a lot about it almost daily. And the problems um, come with a lot of our students are hybrid. They take classes on campus and then they take classes off campus. You saw from the chart on who pays resident rates. Those students pay resident rates for on campus, but they pay non-resident rates when they're taking off campus classes. So it's kind of hard to explain. But we're dependent on that revenue. So that revenue for that differential between the non-resident and the resident generates us about $750,000. How do you make that up and still maintain where we need to be as far as our budget? So what that means, um, and this is a very simplified view, it could be you know a thousand different ways. It means increasing the off-campus rate by 11%. Uh, $31 per credit hour. We do away with the non-resident rate. Um, we have one rate, but it's $318 per credit hour. If you go back to the slide that Wiley put together for us as far as rates, we're still under the average. We're still under the median, but we're at $318 per credit hour. So contemplating that, it's very popular. Um, when you talk about the logistics and the explanation and the communication to our students, um, it's not very popular when you talk about raising tuition for that particular group by 11%. So um, that's an option. It does generate us uh, $1.4 million. Uh, the final scenario um, looks at the optics more than anything else. So we talk a lot about the 5% tuition rate. Should we... For optics, uh, for communication with our students, would it be better if we said we're only going to raise our tuition by 4.9 percent? Um, the committee, the Budget and Planning Tuition Advisory Committee, also looked at 
um, staying under 200. So I feel like I was like a little bit at a game show there for a while, you know, should we be like 199.99? And uh, eventually you're going to hit that $200 mark. It's going to happen next year, um, no doubt. So it's really just how you're feeling. Um, is it a better opportunity for marketing to say, you know, we only, we only went up by 4.9 percent and somebody else went up by five percent or you know this our tuition is only two hundred dollars versus someone else's 210 um, and then just some of the other rates that we played around with uh, keeping the non-resident and the graduate in that 1.9 less than two percent increase um, looking at off campus at the three and a half uh, percent increase keeping them under the 300 for the resident um, this one does assume that we're still charging a non-resident off campus rate so um, I, uh, I suspect that the proposal that will come out of budget and planning and the Twitch Advisory Committee, although they didn't signal greatly, um, will probably be somewhere in this range. Um, they were pretty passionate about the, the $200 piece of it. Um, and I don't know, I don't, I think although that they like getting rid of the non-resident uh, off-campus rate, if they have to change that out for a higher rate for off-campus, I'm just not sure that they'll be willing to take that on this current year. Just putting it all together so you had it in, in one spot you can see all the scenarios and the, the revenue generated uh, this is important when you think about that four hundred and thirty three dollar or three three thousand dollar deficit budgetary deficit where do we want to be um, so an eight hundred thousand dollar increase in tuition revenue um, would put us positive about four hundred thousand um, that you can see uh, there's a separate link in your materials, um, but it is this slide that's very hard to read. Um, but it, this puts together the budget with all the tuition scenarios. So you can just see at a glance, you know, what's our fund balance look like? What's our net operating look like? Um, for me, um, I don't have a very good crystal ball. Um, I don't know everything that's coming to us next year as far as increases in expenditures. I think Dr. Ryan said the other day, every time you know you take something away, you add something back. Um, so I, I, I would advocate um, pretty strongly from the where I said that our net operating is obviously positive. Um, that our net operating is positive more than a 1% change in, in, in tuition and enrollment, um, which is around that $300,000 range as well, just to give us some capacity so that if by chance something in that $4.8 million uh, reduction of budget doesn't come to fruition, somebody just simply miscalculated, they didn't take something into consideration, we can't get out of a software contract as quickly as we thought. Um, we have to add something else back um, that we just have that little bit of capacity. And that, that's, a, that's a struggle. It's a, it's a struggle at this point when you're talking about students and you're talking about tuition increases. The rest of this um, is really just informational. This shows you incrementally um, tuition increases by credit hours. The red is only important because it's optically, you can quickly visually see where our increases were by percentage last year. So last year we did raise tuition uh, for undergraduate on campus by 4.9%. Uh, impacts to the students uh, based on a 45 credit hour. What's that going to What's that going to take? At 4.9 percent for an undergraduate on campus, assuming they take everything on campus uh, over the course of the year, it's going to cost them an additional 423 dollars, not counting into any financial aid or anything else that they might receive. But that would be the the gross impact to them. Looking forward into our. Uh, the other Oregon public universities, uh, where do we sit? Well, I've only adjusted Eastern's numbers at this point, going up, um, bringing the health service fee and the incidental fee both up. Um, and then where do we sit? So we get closer to Western, we get closer to Portland State, um, but the assumption is that they will also be raising their fees to some 
their fees and tuition to some level. This chart, um, just as a reminder, only looks at undergraduate on campus resident students. So, um, again, budget and planning meets this Thursday. Um, they'll have a recommendation to the president by the end of next week. Uh, we'll meet again with a full proposal um, for your review on April 30th. Uh, the EOU cabinet is meeting weekly um, discussing this. We also have a financial sustainability team in place that's looking at all of these things and enrollment sustain a enrollment strategy team that's also making proposals for the future. Um, and then the final what your recommendation on the 30th will go forward to the board um, in mid-May. Wow, <laughs> questions. Uh, the only thing I'd say is that we all know our expenses go up about 6% a year. So unfortunately, we need to raise tuition. It's just inflation and everything else. So it would be nice if we didn't really raise inflation, but I have raised tuition. But I just think that that's just part of the financial picture we're in. But, and, uh, um, yeah, I, I agree with you, Brad. Uh, having suffered a near recall because I didn't think water and sewer fees needed to go up for a long time. And then when the state of Oregon told us that our water was no good, having to increase about 15%. Um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a, a big fan of small incremental increases uh, when they need to be done. I guess my question is, you know, and I was teasing Leanne, I don't know why she didn't use the entire alphabet and just give us 26 different scenarios, but um, so I understand the going up to the maximum 5.2 percent, but what I what I didn't see in any of these is something like option B only, you know, a smaller in, increase. So just doing some numbers in my head, if you did 2.6 instead of 5.2 on option B, that would generate seven hundred and eighty thousand um, dollars. If you got the one percent increase, that would be another three hundred k. That would be over a million dollars, and your deficit is going to maybe be around four hundred thousand dollars. So it still would give you that cushion. So I was wondering why there wasn't a, an option B with a, a a smaller straight amount, whether that's been considered or whether they're considering it or or what. Just just wondering. Um, it's a it's a good question. Um, in some respects, I try not to lead the committee too much because that that's their job. I give them, you know, the tools to make those decisions, um, set the platforms, set the bookends for them to be able to do that, with the hopes that they will they will come back and do it as and and make those decisions. At the same time, um, those small increases, we've done some things like that in the past that. Uh, and they've just not worked out and it's cost us more on the back end with what we're doing this current year. I, I don't think we can afford to not go with something that that's pretty concrete as far as revenue generation goes. Um, part of our problem, um, and this is more of a long-term part of the strategy team stuff, part of our problem is the way that we do tuition setting. We're not far enough out in advance of it for our admissions staff and our recruiters to be able to actually use it. So the reality is we should be setting tuition a year in advance. So I should be in front of you today actually asking for tuition rates for 25, 26 versus this fall. Uh, because that would give them a longer runway to actually be able to do that or presenting a two-year tuition rate increase today so that there was a longer runway to be able to do that and then settle up. But um, I'm hopeful that we come back with um, a variety, a, a different look. You probably will not, I almost guarantee you, you will not see A, B, C, D, or F. You're going to see G. Good answer. I guess that that if I looked at option, scenario B as a two-year program, then then I, I think that gets us to the same to the same spot. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I, I just think we can't not raise tuition with the fact that we're cutting out five five million million dollars. I mean, the campus is not going to have a hard time with that. I think we need to do that. Yeah, Chris, I was like, 
Well, um, <clears throat> I don't know when you sleep at all, actually. Um, <laughs> that, that, my, my mind is boggled by the number of meetings and the uh, level of, again, participation and collaboration that is taking place with uh, these very difficult issues. So thank you for that work and thank you to all who are participating in it. Um, nobody ever wants to raise tuition, but the reality is that's, that's where we are uh, in the world. Like you said, 6% inflation. Um, I think that what we what we're known for and what we can continue to do is maintain the competitive edge. And I think we can do that with a, with what what to us would be a significant raise in tuition. But it's still going to be a competitive edge. And I think that's the message that we need to um, continue to broadcast to uh, to our potential students. So thank you, Luanne. I'm, I'm not on the committee, Mr. Chair, but uh, I do have some questions. You know, you just provided some charts up there, and I didn't see any enrollment figures for all the diff different universities and colleges that you had there. Uh, so that, of course, makes a big difference as to how much money is generated by each one of the colleges. Uh, so I'd kind of like to, you know, OSU has, what, maybe 27, 30,000 students, and we have three to four. So, you know, kind of would like to see some of that information and what we pay. You show the um, tuition for each one of the colleges, but again, number of students will help drive whatever revenue. And that brings me to my, my second part. You know, this is my first time sitting in this meeting, and um, I see that there's a lot of opportunity, and I really hope that we don't paint a picture that Eastern Oregon University is going to close its doors in a couple of years. And that's what I thought I heard when you mentioned that, Mr. Chair, when you mentioned the wrestlers saying you can't let them shut down the university. And so I just be really careful about the message that comes out of this committee and, um, and what we're conveying to the public, uh, because I see a real rosy picture here. and. You know, I look at health costs, and I'd love to have those health costs um, being in business and so forth. And for the full year, that's about what individuals pay on a monthly basis uh, where I work. So, uh, so you know, there's a lot of uh, stars, silver lining, so to speak. And, you know, there's opportunities to paint a, a much nicer picture about what the university is doing and where we're going. And that's the message that I think that we should be sending out. Um, so I just wanted to kind of throw that out as a first time participant in this meeting. I really thank you, thank you very much. That's really important. Yeah, I really appreciate that. You know, I had the exact same response actually to to Chair Stevens' comment. Uh, you know, when I'm messaging in the community, I have repeatedly, overwhelmingly said we are not in a crisis. Had we not done something, I think we've seen today we were headed towards one within two years, you know, that would have been a, a, a bad situation. But w the work we've done this year has shored us up for future years, future growth. Um, and, and I want to assure you, and, and Brad and I actually talked about this during the break, I'm going to get a message out to the students because it's unfortunate that that's the message they're hearing. I'm hoping, you know, even though these cuts are difficult and they hurt, I mean, they truly do. Um, when we take money away, people equate that with actual value. Um, and, and we need our folks on this campus to be sending the same message that I, I'm sending, which is that we are not in a crisis. We must always do the work, though. And so um, we will get that message out. And, and I hope that EOU's community will, will do that, too, because we don't need our students feeling that way. We should take pride in the work that we've done here. So thank you. Well, thank you all. A really busy meeting. We got a lot done. Uh, so we take a little break for until the 30th, I guess. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thanks again.